Honourable members, the speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this Parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I understand the Honourable Leader of the Opposition wishes to make a personal explanation. Yes, I want to make a personal explanation. It refers to an article by Kenneth Davidson in today's age, uh, Is Beasley the Great Telstra Pretender, in which uh, Kenneth Davidson repeats, repeats suggestions that I had a conversation at some point of time with Frank Blunt in which uh, I have, uh, I'm alleged to have said to him that I favoured the privatisation of Telstra. I have never had that conversation, uh, suggesting that uh, particular proposition on my part, as I've denied in this chamber, as I've denied out there at any point of time with Frank Blunt. I have never favoured the privatisation of Telstra. Yeah. Yeah. Clark. Government Business, Interstate Road Transport Charge Amendment Bill. Minister for Transport and Regional Development. Mr Speaker, uh, I present the Interstate Road Transport Charge Amendment Bill. Clark. First reading. A bill for an act to amend the Interstate Road Transport Charge Act 1985 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Speaker, uh, today I take pleasure in introducing a package of two bills the Interstate Road Transport Charge Amendment Bill 1998 and the Interstate Road Transport Amendment Bill 1998. The bills amend the legislative framework for the Federal Interstate Registration Scheme, uh, commonly known as FERS, for heavy vehicles engaged in interstate trade and commerce. The amendment proposed by the Interstate Road Transport Charge Amendment Bill 1998 will provide a formula for calculating registration charges for periods of less than one year for heavy vehicles registered under FIRS. The Interstate Road Transport Amendment Bill 1998 takes account of self-government in the Australian Capital Territory and provides for the appointment of additional enforcement officers in the ACT. The Interstate Road Transport Charge Act 1985 provides for registration charges on FERS registered vehicles. All revenue from charges collected by the states and territories acting as agents of the Commonwealth is returned to the states and territories for expenditure on road maintenance. At present, this Act provides only for annual registration charges. The Act needs to provide for less than one-year registration charges to allow charging to reflect the amendments to the Interstate Road Transport Regulations, which permit less than one-year registration of FIRS vehicles. The proposed amendment reflects the charging formula to be used in the Road Transport Reform Heavy Vehicles Registration Regime, which is to be adopted by states and territories. Both the federal and state-based schemes will therefore have the same charging formula. The general provision of registration periods of less than one year is one of the ten priority road transport reform initiatives endorsed by the Ministerial Council for Road Transport at its February 1997 meeting. The package was developed by the National Road Transport Commission NRTC, in conjunction with federal, state and territory governments and the road transport industry. Short-term registration provides flexibility to operators who wish to register their vehicles for periods of less than one year. This flexibility provides reduced costs to the operator. For example, farmers can nominate a period which coincides with when they need to transport crops instead of paying for a full year's registration, and smaller operators may opt to pay registration charges at three monthly intervals, helping to maintain their cash flow. The amendment demonstrates the federal government's commitment to road transport reform and its recognition of the important role the road transport industry plays in Australia's economy. The second bill in the package, uh, Mr Speaker, the Interstate Road Transport Amendment Bill 1998, 
is required to enable the appointment of additional enforcement officers in the Australian Capital Territory. Following self-government in the ACT, the Commonwealth can no longer appoint ACT enforcement officers. The amendment will enable the appointment of inspectors by the ACT government. Other minor amendments to this Act convert the existing monetary penalties to equivalent penalty units and insert appropriate references to provisions of the Crimes Act 1914. The net budgetary impact of the amendments will be nil. Uh, the amendments are to come into force on the day in which they receive royal assent. Uh, Mr Speaker, I present uh, the explanatory memorandum to this bill. The debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member Crow. I move that the uh, debate be adjourned, Mr Speaker. The question is the results of the debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those in favour, please say aye against no. The ayes have it. The Honourable, at least the clerk. Notice number one, Interstate Road Transport Amendment Bill. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I present the Interstate Road Transport Amendment Bill. Clark. First reading. A bill for an act to amend the Interstate Road Transport Act 1985 and for related purposes. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. You don't intend to no. speak to it. The debate should be now adjourned. I move that the debate be adjourned, Mr the Speaker. The Honourable Member for the Crime. You've got an explanatory memorandum yes. you've got to present to you. And present the explanatory memorandum to the bill, Mr Speaker. Okay. I will accept that and will take the motion moved by the Honourable Member Garayo as having concluded the explanatory memorandum. In those circumstances, the question is the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those in favour, please say aye against no. I think the ayes have it. The uh, Honourable, at least the clerk. Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1. The Honourable Minister for Customs and Consumer Affairs. Mr Speaker, I present the Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1, 1998. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I move that the bill be now read a second time. The Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1, 1998, which is now before the House, contains a number of amendments to the Customs Tariff Act 1995. Most of the amendments have been previously tabled in this House as customs tariff proposals. I will briefly outline the amendments of substance. Schedule 2 of this bill commenced on 3 July 1997. The customs duty on aviation gasoline Avgas, contains a component to recover the costs of aviation terminal and en route navigational services provided to the general aviation sector by Air Services Australia. In reviewing the costs of providing these services for 1997-98, Air Services Australia proposed a reduction in the duty of 0.6 cents per litre on Avgas, which represents a 5 per cent decrease in real terms. This reduction in costs to aircraft operators follows the implementation of an election commitment by this government. This commitment was to freeze the airways component of Avgas duty in 1996-97 except for movements in the Consumer Price Index, while working towards the implementation of a fairer system of funding for the general aviation sector's contribution to Air Services Australia. The component of duty on Avgas payable to the Civil Aviation Safety Authority for the costs of aviation safety regulation remains unchanged. Mr Speaker, the amendments contained in Schedule 3 of the bill came into effect on 31 January 1998. The reduction in duty rates on Avgas in Schedule 2 of this bill would have been superseded by the commencement of the Customs Tariff Fuel Rates Amendment Act 1997 on that date. By Customs Tariff Notice published in the Commonwealth Gazette of 18 February 1998, the reduced customs rate of Avgas on uh, uh, sorry, the reduced customs rate of duty on Avgas was reinstated. The other amendment contained in this schedule is of an administrative nature and results again from amendments contained in the Customs Tariffs Fuel Rates Amendments Act 1997. Section 19 of the Customs Tariff Act 1995 contains a table of paired customs subheadings and excise items. This section provides the duty nexus between customable and excisable revenue goods by allowing customs rates of duty to be adjusted in line with movements in the excise rate of duty. The amendment amalgamates the table existing prior to 31 January 1998 with the new aspects introduced by the customs fuel rates legislation. 
Schedule 4 is operative from 1 March 1998 and creates a new item 64 in Schedule 4 to the Customs Tariff Act 1995. At its meeting on 27 August 1997, the Ministerial Committee on the Sydney 2000 Olympic Games agreed to introduce certain import concessions for the 2000 Olympic and Paralympic Games and associated test events. As a result, amendments to the temporary import provisions have been finalised and a new passenger concession bylaw for unaccompanied baggage for Olympic family members has been implemented by the Australian Customs Service. This amendment creates a new item in Schedule 4 to allow non-personal and non-commercial goods to be imported into Australia duty-free by Olympic Games family members. The reality of the Olympics and associated events is that members of the Olympic family will bring with them a variety of goods which are to be used in a non-commercial manner. These will include giveaways, hospitality samples and other consumables that will be used for team promotion and for cultural and hospitality activities. It is intended that the concession will not apply to tobacco and alcoholic products or extended to any importations of a commercial nature. Similar concessions were offered at Nagano Winter Olympics and by host countries at previous Summer and Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games. The amendments contained in the other schedules of this bill are, are of an administrative or technical nature and will have no impact on the importing public. Mr Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and present the explanatory memorandum. The bill should now be adjourned, or the debate must be now adjourned. I so move, uh, Mr Speaker. The uh, question is the resumption of the debate be made at order of the day for the next day of sitting. Clerk. Notice, notice number two, Veterans Entitlements Amendment Male Total Average Weekly Earnings Benchmark Bill. The Minister. Speaker, I present the, uh, the <coughs> Veterans Entitlement Amendment Male Total Average Weekly Earnings Benchmark Bill of 1998 and present a signed copy of the bill. Clerk. First reading. A bill for an act to amend section 198 of the Veterans Entitlements Act 1986 to allow increases in the rate of pension payable under paragraph 31A of that act to the widow or widower of a deceased veteran to take account of male total average weekly earnings. Mr. For Veterans Affairs. Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Speaker, Australia sent its young servicemen and women overseas on service with the solemn undertaking that, in the event of the war causing their death, their widow or widower would be cared for. Since 1914, that undertaking has been honoured by the payment of a war widow's pension as special compensation for the loss of the family breadwinner. It is neither taxed nor means tested, and until now it has been indexed according only to the Consumer Price Index. This bill links the war widow's pension and the basic war widower's pension to 25 per cent of male total average weekly earnings whenever this measure exceeds the growth in the consumer price index. This will ensure the basic war widow's pension and the war widower's pension continue at the same level as the service and age pensions as they have done since 1964. This bill expands on the government's 1996 election commitment to, to deliver a pension benchmark of at least 25 per cent of male total average weekly earnings. Mr Speaker, the government has already delivered on this promise for service and age pensioners. Now approximately 100,000 war widows and war widowers will also share in the improvement in community living standards. The immediate effect of this bill will be an increase of $6.80 bringing the total of the war widows and war widows pension to $378.60 per fortnight. Over the next four years, the cost of this new indexation arrangement for, wid for war widows is expected to be approximately $164 million. Mr Speaker, this bill demonstrates the government's commitment to protecting their living standards and financial security of older Australians. I commend this bill to the House 
and present the explanatory memorandum. The debate should now be adjourned. The Honourable Member Carrillo. I move that the debate be adjourned, Mr Speaker. The question is the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those in favour, please say aye against no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Taxation Laws Amendment Bill No. 4. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And I present the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill No. 4. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation. Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister and to the Treasurer. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I move that the bill be now read a second time. The bill gives effect to some of the measures announced in the 97-98 budget and in other government statements. The bill also contains other amendments to the income tax assessment and the rewritten income tax law. Fringe benefits tax. The bill will implement changes to the fringe benefits tax law relating to record keeping exemption arrangements and provide an exemption from fringe benefits tax for benefits arising from the employer's participation in certain student exchange programs. The record keeping exemption completes the FBT measures proposed by the government in response to the recommendations made by the Small Business Deregulation Task Force. Legislation has already been introduced to deal with taxi travel, car parking and a range of provisions. All these measures will reduce compliance costs for most employers and particular for small businesses. The record keeping measure introduced in this bill is specifically targeted to those employers whose fringe benefits in a base year do not exceed an index threshold amount and who do not significantly alter the fringe benefits provided in later years. The benefit threshold will commence at $5,000 for the 96-97 FBT year. Having established a base year, employers will not be required to keep FBT records and will have their FBT liability in future years determined from the base year taxable benefits. This measure will apply to the benefits provided from the date of royal assent and to the FBT liabilities from the 98-99 year. The FBT exemption for benefits arising from an employer's participation in an approved student exchange program will apply from the FBT year commencing 1 April 1996. This exemption demonstrates the government's commitment to reducing compliance costs. Depreciation of plant previously owned by exempt entities. The Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 is being amended to set a common base for the depreciation deductions for plant that can be claimed by exempt entities which first become taxable on or after August the 1st, 1st, August the 4th. Uh, 97, in relation to plant they already own, and by taxable entities which purchase plant from an exempt entity in connection with the acquisition of a business on or after the 4th of August 97. The depreciation deductions available to such entities will be limited to a choice between the notional written down value of the plant at the time it enters the tax net and its undeducted pre-existing audited book value at the time. Arrangements treated as a sale and loan and limited recourse debt. The bill will implement a measure announced in the 97-98 budget to prevent taxpayers obtaining deductions for capital expenditures in excess of their actual outlays. Mm. The measure will apply where their expenditure has been financed by higher purchase or limited recourse finance and the debtor does not fully pay out the capital amounts owing. In those circumstances, an amount will be included in the debtor's accessible income to compensate for any excessive deductions that were allowed to the taxpayer. The adjustment to taxable income will reflect amounts that remain unpaid when the higher purchase or limited recourse debt arrangement is terminated. This amendment applies to debts that are terminated after 27 February 1998. An associated amendment will treat taxpayers who finance assets by hire purchase as the owners of those assets for purposes of applying the various capital allowance deductions. Hire purchase and instalment sales transactions will be treated as the equivalent of the sale. Loan and debt transactions in assessing the taxation liability of the financier and the hire purchaser respectively. This amendment applies to arrangements entered into after 27 February 1998. Franking credit and dividend streaming. The bill will implement one of the measures announced by the government in the 97-98 budget to prevent 
franking credit trading and dividend streaming, namely the introduction of a rule to limit the source of franking credits available for trading. Subject to transitional measures explained in the bill, these amendments apply from 7.30 Australian and Eastern Standard Time, the 13th of May 1997. Sales Tax Exemption and Classification Act 1992. The bill amends the sales tax law to correct a deficiency in the sales tax law to the exemption for goods incorporated into property owned by or leased to always exempt persons or the government of a foreign country. Access to the exemption will now be available only where the property is occupied principally by an always exempt person or the government or of a foreign country or where the property is used principally for the provision of services to an always exempt person or government of a foreign company, country. Commercial debt for forgiveness. Uh, this bill contains a consequential amendments arising from changes to the Capital Loss Rules and Taxation Laws Amendment No. 2, 1997. The technical amendments will not affect the practical effect of the debt forgiveness provisions. These amendments apply to debts forgiven after the date of introduction of this bill. New South Wales Police Integrity Commission. This bill amends the Taxation Administration Act 1953 to enable the Commissioner to disclose information acquired under a taxation law to the New South Wales Police Integrity Commission. Deductions for gifts. On October 10, 1996, the Treasurer announced in Press Release No. 102 the introduction of a tax deduction of gifts of $2 or more to the Menzies Research Centre Public Fund. As announced at the time, this is consistent with the arrangements as applied to the Evett Foundation, which has had tax deductibility status since 1981. The bill will give effect to the Treasurer's announcement to amend the Income Tax Assessment Act 97 to allow income tax deductions for gifts of $2 or more to the public fund. Income tax deductions will be available for donations made to the fund from today. Technical amendments. Schedules 6, 7 and 8 contain a range of technical amendments to the rewritten income tax law to correct minor errors in translating the fine detail of the 1936 Act. Schedule 9 includes in the 97 Act the rewritten education and training payments provisions of the 1936 Act as amended by Taxation Laws Amendment Act No. 1, 1997 and the proposed amendments contained in the Social Security, Youth Allowance, Consequential and Related Measures Bill 1998. It also closes off the 1936 Act provisions. Full details of the measures in this bill are contained in the explanatory memorandum circulated to honourable members, and I commend the bill to the House and provide the explanatory memorandum. The bill should now be adjourned. I move that the debate be adjourned, Mr Speaker. The question is the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Those in favour, please say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Report from the uh, Joint Committee on Native Title and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land Fund. The Honourable Member for Leichhardt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land Fund, I present the Committee's report entitled Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 11th Report, together with evidence received by the Committee and I move that the report be printed. The question is the report be printed. Those in favour, please say aye against no. Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection to the report. Leave granted. Leave is granted. The honourable member may proceed. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Because, of indigenous, uh, because indigenous people identify with their areas, their sites and their objects of significance, uh, indigenous heritage is intrinsically precious. Indigenous heritage is also highly valued by non-Indigenous people who recognise such heritage both for its importance to Indigenous people and for its own sake. For these reasons, the Joint Committee on Native Title has been pleased to conduct an inquiry into the Commonwealth statute that has attempted to provide legislation of last resort for Indigenous heritage. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984 uh, this matter was referred to the committee by the Senate on the 26th of March 1997, prior to the third reading of the Hindmarsh Island Bridge Bill 1996. Government members took a strong interest in the committee's inquiry and attended conscientiously. However, as chair, I should, re uh, I should record 
the interest that was taken in this inquiry by non-government members of the committee. I regret to note that despite their uh, protestations of concern about Indigenous issues, not once did a Democrat member of the committee attend a public hearing for this inquiry, and one of those hearings was in the Parliament House here in Canberra. The Democrat members were in turn former Sh uh, Senator Cheryl Kernow and Senator John Woodley. For the Labor Committee, uh, for Labor committee members, it, and in regard to eight days of public hearings, four members attended only one, uh, on one day. Not one Labor member attended for more than one public hearing, and the shadow person, Darrell Mellum, did not attend once. It is remarkable that in these circumstances all of the non-government members, and in particular both Mr Mallam and Senator Woodley, considered that they were in a position to sign a dissenting report. Perhaps they, should, they can plead uh, in mitigation that, being only three pages in length, the dissent can uh, be read by anyone with three minutes to spare. This appears to be about all of the time that they have devoted to this matter where the recommendations of the dissent uh, diverge from the committee's recommendations, they are trite or they lack any supporting argument. Indigenous Australians should examine these facts before accepting protestations to support, uh, of support from Labor and the Democrats. Turn the Honourable Member for Leichhardt will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Speaker, this is an outrageous abuse of leave that was given in speaking to this report. It's a misrepresentation, and I'd ask that if he continues down this road, that, and I say that leave will be with, we would seek to withdraw leave given to this you member. You can't speak. withdraw leave, but I suggest that the Honourable Member for Leichhardt identifies the Honourable Member for Banks by his proper title and has in mind that. This is a parliamentary report, and I'd suggest to him that it is better that he does not attack people individually. If he wishes to attack them by virtue of their policies or views, it is one thing, and I'm concerned that, to a degree, in the remarks he has made, you are identifying the member personally as distinct from any policies or programs he might advance. The Honourable Member for Leichhardt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We'll now turn to, uh, to the issues. The Commonwealth Statute uh, has attracted considerable comment, in particular concerning the Hindmarsh Islands Bridge matter. For instance, of the 131 applicants lodged under the Act, only 16 resulted in protection declarations. Of the four Section 10 declarations, which provide protection for extended periods of time, the only one that has not been exposed, only one has not been exposed to uh, judicial review. The junction waterhole near Alice Springs is protected for 20 years from May 1992. Importantly, the three other Section 10 declarations, including the concerning, uh, that concerning the Hindmarsh Island Bridge area, did not survive legal challenge. In summary, where Section 10 declarations have been opposed at law, they have not survived. Only one continues. This situation was reviewed by the Hon. Uh, Elizabeth Everett AC who was t uh, tasked by the Hon. Robert Tickner, Minister for the, in the Keating Government, on the 22nd of August 1996. She reported to Senator Heron, the Minister for, uh, in the Howard Government. With the benefit of uh, Ms Everett's report, the Joint Committee has conducted an extensive inquiry into the Act. Following careful consideration of 35 submissions and evidence received over eight days of public hearings, the Committee agreed that there continues to be a need for Commonwealth legislation concerning Indigenous heritage protection, and such legislation should be provided as a statute of last resort. Two functions are envisaged for this statute. The establishment of a minimum standards for accreditation of states and territory legislation and the application-based system for managing cases where the state or territory legislation has not been applied correctly. In this 11th report of the committee, it is noticed that blanket or presumptive uh, protection of heritage is provided by most states and territories. The committee supports blanket protection and considers that it should be a requirement for state and territory accreditation under the Commonwealth's last resort legislation. Further, there needs to be clear provision in the Federal Act for the process of interaction between the Commonwealth and the states. Of course, one of the major issues that has emerged 
from the Hindmast Island Bridge matter is the protection of culturally restricted information relevant to heritage protection. Indigenous people are those best placed to make an assessment of, significant, uh, of significance under Indigenous tradition. However, they may be reluctant to divulge such information because disclosure, disclosure itself can amount to a desecration of culture. This was a major problem in Hindmarsh. The committee uh, has concluded that in order to establish that a site is significant, disclosure of sensitive information need not be required. Further, the issue of determining whether a site is considered significant must be separated from the question whether or not the land should be used in a particular matter. Nevertheless, and in the interests of procedural fairness, the needs of all parties must be balanced when development proposals are being considered. This is possible under guidelines already articulated by the Federal Court in the, in the now well-known ward cases. Importantly, the committee heard in evidence that this uh, view is accepted by Indigenous leaders. And the report notes that Ms Everett's approach to the question has been overtaken by developments in the Federal Court. The committee would emphasise that one of the most promising ways in which to protect sensitive Indigenous information while allowing for development proposals to proceed is the establishment of site registers. It is understood that such registers are already in operation in the shires of Broome, the shire of Cardwell and in the Whitsundays. In each case, the relevant Indigenous people have been fully involved in the development of the registers, including the establishment of protocols for their use. Together with the availability of guidelines from the Federal Court for access to culturally sensitive information, the establishment and proper employment of site registers offers a solution to a, the kind of difficulties experienced in the Hindmarsh Island Bridge situation. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to uh, thank the Committee Secretariat, with special mention for the uh, Secretary, Committee Secretary Peter Grundy. I can assure you, without the uh, commitment and dedication of Peter and the uh, whole Secretariat, we would have great difficulty in achieving any outcomes. I'd also like to uh, thank the committee and, in particular, my co uh, coalition colleagues for a very stimulating inquiry into Indigenous heritage protection. I trust that the committee's report contains much of it, uh, much uh, that is enlightening and that uh, it points the way forward to acknowledgement and protection of the precious Indigenous heritage that is present in this country. And I commend the report to the House. Order the Honourable Member for Banks. Mr Deputy Speaker, I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to the tabling of the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, in light of the earlier comments that were made by the Chair of the Committee, I think it is important to put on record that, uh, that uh, opposition members and the Democrat member of the Committee um, cannot be in two places at one time. Um, a perusal of the record will show that uh, Senator Balkus, myself and Senator Woodley have been actively engaged in the Native Title Amendment Bill, um, as have other members, and consideration of that bill. There were attempts uh, made by us to, in effect, the further tabling of this report so that it might be possible um, that we might come to a united view in relation to this. Uh, the government felt, the government members, in fairness to them, felt that uh, the need for extension had uh, far outlived an extension and wanted to table the report this week, so be it. Can I just say that I think it is unfortunate that this report uh, was formulated and tabled before uh, the decision yesterday delivered in the High Court case uh, known as the Hindmarsh Island Bridge uh, case, because I think that has relevance as to how we, as a parliament, deal with heritage protection. And in light of that report, uh, uh, so, in light of that judgment, uh, the opposition will be considering its position in relation to the Heritage Protection Act. Um, but it is appropriate that at this stage uh, I point out that there is a dissenting report by the minority signed by Senator Balkus, Senator Evans, uh, and Senator Woodley, and uh, Mr. Quick, the member for Franklin, and myself. Um, and I, it's only a short minority report, and I intend to read it onto the record. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it is in the following terms. The Australian Labor Party and Democrat members of the committee 
are unable to support the general thrust of the recommendations made by the majority coalition members. It is neither possible nor desirable to approach a review of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1985 without considering the political, social and legislative context of the review. The committee has approached its task at the same time as the parliament engages in a lengthy and divisive debate on amendment to the Native Title Act 1993. The Northern Territory Government is reviewing the Aboriginal land rights, Northern Territory Act 1976, and community debate continues on the issues raised by the Hindmarsh Island Bridge Act. The signatories to this dissenting report see the majority recommendations as substantially weakening protection for Indigenous heritage and reflecting insensitivities insensitivity to the laws, culture and beliefs of Australia's Indigenous peoples. It is unacceptable to propose procedures and substantive provisions to supposedly protect Aboriginal cultural heritage when those provisions and mechanisms are inconsistent with or even hostile to Indigenous laws and customs. In concert with the extinguishment of Native Title and the erosion of Indigenous rights central to the Native Title Amendment Bill, the majority recommendations represent a retrograde step in reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Furthermore, the recommendations of the majority are inconsistent with the motion passed by the Senate when it referred review of the Act to the Committee. The Senate acknowledged, and I quote, the urgent need for amendments to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act 1984, consistent with the report of the review of that Act by Justice Elizabeth Evatt, in order to avoid or minimise the repetition of any further incidents, such as the Hindmarsh Island Bridge situation in which the cultural and spiritual beliefs of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are not able to be properly considered under the existing legislative arrangements. The recommendations of the majority ignore the most significant of Justice Evatt's recommendations and have the net effect of reducing legislative and administrative protection and respect for the cultural and spiritual beliefs of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In short, the recommendations in question represent an abrogation of the responsibility granted into the Commonwealth in the 1967 referendum to legislate for the benefit of our Indigenous peoples. Consequently, the minority proposes the following recommendations. One, that the Commonwealth should retain a direct role in ensuring the ongoing protection of Indigenous heritage under this Act. Two, that insofar as individual states continue to fail to meet acceptable minimum standards of provisions and procedures for Indigenous heritage protection, Commonwealth legislation should continue to make specific provisions for those states. That mint three, that minimum national standards for both substantive and procedural Indigenous heritage protection be prerequisite under this Act for the accreditation of state and territory protective regimes. Four, that this Act should provide no presumption of ongoing accreditation for state regimes, in that any amendments made from time to time by the states should be the subject of review and that any consequent decision by the Commonwealth Minister to accredit such amendment should be a disallowable instrument. Five, that an Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Advisory Council, as recommended in the Evatt report, be established under the Act. Six, that minimum national standards for substantive and procedural protection for Indigenous cultural heritage be drawn up under the supervision of an independent Aboriginal Heritage Protection Agency. Seven, that the Aboriginal Heritage Protection Agency should be empowered to administer the Act in those matters leading to the exercise of discretion by the Minister. Eight, that procedures and other measures for Indigenous heritage protection set out in this Act should at all times be sensitive to and not inconsistent with Indigenous laws and customs. And nine, that any provision to the Minister to intervene in the national interest must be so framed as to, the, as to clearly define the protection of Indigenous cultural heritage as being within the meaning of the national interest. Mr Deputy Speaker, there should be national uniform standards um, in a whole range of areas, in the criminal code, in the corporations sector, in a whole range of areas. We're getting together with the states and territories to set up national uniform standards so that the borders within this nation don't represent different treatment to different people. We should have uniform standards. I think it can be done in a cooperative fashion. It should be done in a non-partisan fashion. The performance by the chairman in trying to politicise this earlier really speaks for itself. Order the honourable member for oh, no, not this matter. Sir. The honourable member for Leichhardt. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move that the House take note of the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The honourable member for Leichhardt. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the House take note of the report and seek leave to continue my remarks when the debate is resumed. 
Let's leave granted. Leave us granted. The question is that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business order of the day number one. Taxation laws amendment bill number seven, 1997. Resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by the deputy leader of the opposition. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the honourable the deputy leader of the opposition has moved this amendment that all words after that be omitted with a view to substituting other words. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'll get there in the end. Um, I probably needed the exercise. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, whilst this is a, a series of amendments to a previous piece of very important legislation uh, that was um, uh, introduced as part of its election policy. Uh, I think the issues, both current and past, uh, need to be further addressed, and it's for this reason I take part in this particular debate. Basically, these amendments set out uh, to address issues that have arisen since the introduction of the original legislation and, most importantly, of course, uh, to consider uh, the decisions of the Senate Sex, uh, Select Committee on Superannuation, which handed down its report uh, recently. The number of amendments are, are fairly simple in many regards, uh, in regards to exempt employers, in respect of employees who have had reached their ma uh, maximum benefit accrual, and in respect of defined benefit schemes which are in surplus as of 1 July 2000 for the period of the scheme remains in, sur uh, in surplus. These amendments ensure that the choice does not increase superannuation costs for employers, which is not the government's intention. And quite clearly, in all of this, it is important that we consider the employers. However, I, I do want to make the point at, th at this time that when my parties went to the people, we made an offer to employees not employers, that uh, they would have choice in where they went to have their superannuation matters considered. And I think that uh, that particular issue is of great importance. It is just simply too simple for an employer to say, on the basis of efficiency, on the basis of maintaining the lowest possible cost for my organisation and out of the back of his mouth or hand saying, and so I don't have any blues with the BLF or the CMFEU, um, I'm going to stick with bus. Now, that was never the intention of our policy, and I'm disappointed that uh, in arriving at a proposition for or implementing our policy, the accent has shifted from employees' rights to employers' rights. I am very sympathetic to employers, but on the other hand, unless employees are able to be removed from, for instance, state government awards that uh, oblige their employer one by one to commit funds, superannuation contributions to a variety of funds because of state award situations or because the employer thinks it's much more simple and convenient to stay, for instance, with a union fund, then in fact we perpetuate this situation which I raised in this parliament probably six years ago of small amounts going to different funds on behalf of the same individual and then being eroded by administration and other fees, uh, in fact, into the negative in some occasions. Quite clearly, employment in Australia and probably the world is going to become more itinerant, more of a casual nature. The concept of joining someone after school and being there at retirement is unfortunately for a lot of employees no longer possible. People will more and more have to seek alternative employment 
with a range of employees just simply because of the way business will be done. Superannuation, therefore, should be, for most people, something where they personally should be able to negotiate their own superannuation arrangements with a supplier of those services, a fund manager, the AMPs and others of this world, and be able to have that fully portable from job to job. And they should be able to enter the employment with another employer and say, look, here is my policy. I mean, this is possible today, but it, it's, it's not exactly a right of the employee. And the, the fundamental issue is they should be able to go from employer to employer as they are required to do with the same piece of paper, with the same policy, and that employer makes contributions accordingly. It uh, then means that, firstly, they know where their money is, and I suggest to a great degree today no one knows where half their superannuation entitlement is, and secondly, that it's accumulating at the best possible rate, and they have some say over that. And by this I mean that uh, if they get dissatisfied with the performance of the fund they have chosen, then they have the right to move to another which is offering them a better deal and, and better returns for their retirement. And of course, and without doubt, the Commonwealth uh, should have that as a, a substantial um, uh, target as well. The more that people can obtain from these superannuation arrangements on retirement, the less has to be provided by the taxpayer. So I just think this is a fundamental issue. It's addressed in the amendments. We have an amendment that seeks to make sure that uh, the choice does not increase superannuation costs for employers. Well, unfortunately, I think it's got to, but I'm also of the view that it's all too simple uh, for an employer who, for industrial or other reasons, finds it convenient to uh, have all their employers uh, being represented by a union scheme, um, which may otherwise not be to their benefit, it can, depending on their circumstances. It may have nothing to do with the financial returns. Uh, I find that that is unsatisfactory. It wasn't resolved in the original legislation. It's not resolved in these amendments. However, there are other amendments uh, that deal with, with matters con concerning this thing. And I think you know, many of those are quite, quite practical. Um, as the bill is currently drafted, an employee could make an informal agreement with his or her employer and unilaterally make another choice within 12 months. This amendment ensures that an employer does not have to ha act on a nomination within 12 months of the previous choice, regardless of the mechanism through which that choice was made. I, I find that quite reasonable, uh, notwithstanding my previous remarks. We have um, another need, of course, to ensure that contributions made in accordance with certain Victorian state and individual agreements will satisfy the choice of fund requirements. And although Victoria has referred industrial relations powers to the Commonwealth, in the absence of this amendment, certain Victorian agreements would not be held to satisfy the Commonwealth's choice requirements. That is, is a matter which I think is, is quite appropriate. Where we've still got uh, problems, nevertheless, is in the um, inflexibility of how employers uh, make payment and if, for whatever reason, those employers have uh, been, quote, late in, in making contributions. The reasons for this are numerous and they don't frequently arise from an employer who has um, uh, deliberately intended to make a late payment uh, or, in fact, uh, was just trying to save a bit of money by making a late payment. There are many other reasons that arise, and more particularly in the itinerant sector, such instances as the shearing industry in my electorate, where people are moving around, that the teams that, and the employees are often hard to contact if they are employed for a short period, but if there is any difficulty arising, and a, a more recent example brought to my attention was where, in fact, a short-term period of employment was involved. The employer had a contract with this person, did not deem it 
re required a superannuation contribution. The employee, as we will call them, this person or the subcontractor, uh, did not make any request for that, did not provide a number, did not do anything to suggest so. And 18 months, this fellow's accountant rings up and says, Oh, I'm now doing this fellow's tax return, obviously late. And uh, could you please tell me what the superannuation uh, contributions were made during that period? Well, the employer didn't make them. He's not objecting to making them now, but he's going to be charged double because of, of an issue of confusion. And I think that's silly. And I think it's time that some flexibility was available there. There's no dispute. There was a, a misunderstanding in, in, on an issue, and uh, in fact, I think probably the employee did not believe at the time they had a right until they were lodging a tax return, and their accountant said, "Well, you probably do." Uh, fair enough. There's not a dispute about that, except that the employer is a bit upset as the fact that because this has all arised so late, that they can't um, uh, that th they're going to be treated as though they. Uh, were almost a criminal, and I think that's silly. The other issue in this regard, which is not addressed by these amendments, is in my mind uh, also of concern, and uh, this arises from a personal experience. Uh, unfortunately for our family, my younger brother died a year or so ago. I am the um, trustee for his estate, and uh, I had to communicate with an insurance company uh, for the purpose of uh, getting for his estate certain funds arising from the superannuation contributions and death cover uh, that his employer had. Originally I thought the amount of money was about $800. It's since uh, I've been advised is substantially more. But along arrives a, a form of, of some pages and included in it a request that I get statutory declarations from his three children who are dispersed around Western Australia. And when I looked at the form, I just thought to myself, well, OK, I'm a member of parliament. I've got some skills and an understanding of filling in forms. But just how would, for instance, a wife, having lost her husband, deal with this matter? And I thought the complexity and the requirements associated with that form and the sort of information required was excessive. And if they had to consult somebody else to do it, would have been quite expensive. And uh, I just happened to get the feeling that whilst the amount was some $800, that a lot of people would find that they could not, it would not pay them to get that money. And I think the government needs to look at the requirements. I mean, you can't just wait have someone write in and say, I'm uh, the, the wife or children of, um, of the late Bill Smith and therefore send me the money. Quite clearly the funds have a higher responsibility than that. But I just got the funny feeling that these forms have gone to a point where on, on smaller amounts many people would say, well, it's just simply not worth it, and of course that goes to the profit of the fund. And uh, that is something that should be looked at. People should, ordinary people should not uh, have to go off to advisers or people who would as we well know, charge them 500 bucks to walk through the door, and, and, and in fact the amount to be settled could be less than $1,000. And it's just a matter that I wanted to raise in the context of this debate. I've already made the point about the, the fact that people should have single policies, and it's interesting that, of course, another amendment in this particular legislation is um, to address the circumstances where um, there are compulsory local government schemes and to uh, ensure that an employer didn't have to make payments to two, i.e. the state local government scheme and a private scheme or another business scheme that uh, an uh, employee might have involved themselves in. And, and that's common sense and it was never the intention that that should happen. But it also reminds me, in terms of my uh, uh, experience in local government, whereas the president of the Country Shires Association in WA, I was actively involved in the creation of the local government scheme in WA. Previously there hadn't been one, and uh, of course local government is an area where 
employment and promotion in particular is something that is achieved by changing jobs. You just keep applying for a higher job in another local authority and uh, that's accepted and understood within the industry. And that had created grave difficulties for people in terms of long service leave and superannuation. And, uh, we were supportive of a portable scheme for both. And of course, involved in the considerations and the negotiations were representatives of the um, local government employees involved. And I said to them at the time, why do you want a government scheme? You know, uh, why don't you ask for a scheme that in at least includes the right to have your own cover with AMP or someone else, and uh, when you shift jobs, you just simply negotiate the contributions that your new employer might make to that scheme. Um, and uh, they all said, oh, no, 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 that wouldn't be secure enough for us. The government's got to be involved. Well, of course, they took that option and uh, the, their superannuation scheme got dragged into WA Inc. And at one stage, they looked like having no money in it at all. <laughs> and it was pretty bloody horrible. And uh, I used to, you know, chide a few of those that we had this very cooperative arrangement with. That was what they wanted. That's what they got. But it's it's recovered, and I think they're now performing quite well. But uh, it, it goes to show that uh, what appeared to be the most secure line is not necessarily also always the case. And uh, an employee who'd have made their own choice might have been better off. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, they um, are the uh, the major matters I wish to address today. There are other amendments there that I think are imminently sensible. I support them all, and uh, I hope that uh, over time the government can further revisit compulsory superannuation and address some of the other issues I've raised, particularly uh, the flexibility where there's a, you know, some determination can be made that an employer, in uh, not returning the funds on time, has a genuine excuse, and more importantly, to ensure that employees. Uh, not subjugated to uh, the needs of employers necessarily uh, when it comes to this choice project. I think it's uh, undoubtedly a very good policy that employees should have choice and particularly to avoid the situation that arises with multiple cover uh, uh, because of change of job and, and the erosion of those funds when they um, uh, are small amounts in a variety of funds instead of a larger amount in a single fund. Thank you. Order. The question is that the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Wills. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I want to speak on one specific aspect of this bill. That's Schedule 5 of the bill, which deals with choice of superannuation fund. And I want to cover the problems that Labor believes are inherent in the government's choice of fund model, and I want to outline Labor's proposed alternative choice of fund model which we believe will offer genuine employee choice while avoiding the risks of the government's deeply flawed model. And I want to, with the uh, prior agreement of the member for Holt, move an amendment to the member for Holt's second reading amendment asking the government to reconsider its choice of superannuation fund model and adopt the model that we propose. Now, this model is receiving a growing level of support from the superannuation industry. And just a couple of days ago, I addressed the conference of major superannuation funds in Brisbane and outlined my model, Labor's model. And uh, at the close of that, one of the, uh, the members at that conference said, I want all those in this audience who think that Labor has got it right and the government's got it wrong to stand up. And over 80 per cent of a, of a 500 strong audience stood up and said, and said the, government, the government's got it, wrong in relation to, got it wrong in relation to choice of fund and in particular has got it wrong with its indecent haste to try and introduce this model by the 1st of July this year. Now, it's with some pride that I say that Australia's retirement income system, particularly our superannuation system, is highly regarded throughout the world. Many other countries, including the United States, including the United Kingdom, consider Australia's three, three pillars superannuation model to be world's best practice. Our superannuation system was praised in a 1994 World Bank report, and more recently there was praise for Australia's retirement income system in a Wall Street Journal article by 
Daniel Mitchell and Robert O'Quinn, who are members of the United States think tank the Heritage Foundation, which is not particularly well known for harbouring left-wing opinions. In their article, Mr Mitchell and Mr O'Quinn advised United States government policymakers to look closely at Australia's retirement income system as an example of how to get it right. Regrettably, since Labor lost office in March of 1996, many changes have occurred to retirement incomes and to superannuation which have had a detrimental effect on superannuation. They include the decision to abandon Labor's 3 plus 3 per cent co-contribution and pay part of it in the form of a savings rebate, which will do nothing to increase savings at either a public or private level. The other part of Labor's co-contribution is, of course, contained in the government's Federation slush fund, which we're sure to hear more about in the coming months as the election draws nearer. We've seen the introduction of retirement savings accounts, low return products, which will result in lower retirement incomes for those who use them. We've seen the introduction of the superannuation surcharge tax, which has been about as successful as the Prime Ministerial Guidelines on Ministerial Code of Conduct. We've seen the inclusion of superannuation assets in the means test for over 55s, which will see many low- and middle-income uh, earning Australians, older Australians, having to line up for the aged pension after having run down their hard-earned retirement nest eggs. And yesterday <coughs> we've commenced a uh, debate on removal of superannuation from awards, in direct contradiction of the Prime Minister's promise that no workers will be worse off under his government. And Murray Wyatt of the Australian Society of CPAs was reported as saying in the Sydney Morning Herald recently that these changes, particularly the surcharge tax, have had the effect of undermining public confidence in superannuation. And this bill makes the latest change, the requirement for employers to force employees to make a choice of superannuation fund. I should add that the government has circulated, and I've just uh, received them in the last few minutes, uh, some 83 amendments that it wants to move on this bill. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is unreasonably short notice to be moving 83 complex amendments, giving the opportunity uh, to, uh, to, without giving the opportunity to the parliament to appropriately consider these things. Labor opposition won't be able to consider these things at the caucus. The Senate Collect Select Committee on Superannuation, which has looked at the choice of fund model, won't have the opportunity to consider these amendments. The government is proposing to introduce choice of fund on 1 July this year, and yet the superannuation funds and the employers and the employees who will have to respond to these changes haven't even seen these changes up until now. Now, this is reason enough that this matter should go back to the government. It should revisit the issue from scratch, listening to the people who it ought to be listening to, the superannuation funds, the, the employers, the employees with superannuation accounts who all the evidence suggests uh, don't require choice of fund. Now, the requirement for choice of superannuation fund is without doubt one of the most significant changes to superannuation since the introduction of the superannuation guarantee. The House ought to be aware that in other countries which have endeavoured to introduce this kind of model, particularly in the United Kingdom and Chile, there have been unsatisfactory experiences. And those experiences of workers uh, <coughs> being beguiled into taking out second-rate or third-rate products and therefore losing their uh, retirement incomes, those experiences suggest that any choice of fund proposal needs to be carefully scrutinised before it's introduced. Labor is supportive of the principle of employee choice of fund, provided that any choice model meets certain principles, which are that employees should benefit from choice, that employers should not be disadvantaged by choice, that choice should be consistent with broader retirement incomes policy, that individuals must be able to make an informed choice, one where a worker thoroughly understands all of the factors and the impact that his or her choice of superannuation fund will have on their retirement income. Choice of fund ought to be based on true employee choice and not driven by ideology or vested interests. It shouldn't be forced on employers or employees. It should be simple to understand, administer and not place onerous compliance burdens on either employers or employees. 
And finally, an independent arbitrator should be able to resolve choice of fund disputes between employers and employees. Now, if the government's model had observed these principles, then choice could be a success in the Australian superannuation system. We could avoid the disasters which have befallen other countries. But the government's choice of fund model doesn't meet those principles. Now, the government claims that its choice model will benefit consumers through increased competition in the superannuation industry, leading to lower fees and charges and resulting in better retirement incomes. But the evidence suggests otherwise. <coughs> a recent survey of 354 superannuation funds by Sedgwick Noble Lowndes reported that the government's choice of fund model will lead to increased costs for fund members. That survey stated that, 70, uh, that 87 per cent of funds believe that choice of fund will increase fund in administration costs, with the cost, the cost increasing by some 10 per cent. Alarmingly, around 10 per cent of the funds surveyed believe that costs could increase by up to 50 per cent. And that view was confirmed by witnesses to the recent Senate Select Committee on Superannuation inquiry into choice of superannuation, from witnesses from Towers Perrin, from the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees and from the CBUS Industry Fund, who all argued that superannuation fund costs would increase dramatically after the introduction of choice, particularly in areas such as marketing, administration, legal costs. In addition, the government's choice of fund proposal is certain to disadvantage employers through increased administrative costs, which even the government acknowledges in the explanatory memorandum to the bill that introduces its choice model. Now, <coughs> this comes from the government, which has promised small business a 50 per cent reduction in red tape. There is also a strong likelihood that employers may be legally liable under its choice model in a number of ways, despite attempts to legislate away employers' potential liability through clause 32U of this bill. The Senate committee received evidence suggesting that it is impossible to legislate away the common law duty of care which employers owe to their workers. Nor is the government's choice of fund model consistent with broader retirement income policy. And the Senate committee was told by Jock Rankin from the Institute of Actuaries that, and I quote, if choice is not properly exercised, there will be no net benefit to the, the individuals trying to accumulate savings for their retirement and no net benefit to the nation. Labor is also concerned about the government's intention to implement choice of fund by 1 July for new employees in the face of overwhelming industry calls to delay that start-up date. Uninformed consumers who are rushed into choosing a fund which is unsuitable for their investment risk return profile could end up with significantly lower retirement incomes. The government's choice of fund model is supposed to be based on deregulation and open competition, yet it doesn't offer true employee choice. What it does is to force choice on both employers and employees. So from the 1st of July, employers will be required to offer new employees choice of fund, regardless of whether the employees want it or not, and the employees will be forced to make that choice. And that same compulsory choice with a gun at your head model will apply to existing employees from the 1st of July 2000. <laughs> now, Mr Peter Kell from the Australian Consumers Association told the Senate committee that under the government's choice model, it is effectively the employer's decision over the type of choice offered or whether there will be any choice at all. The balance between employer cost and employee choice has shifted too far away from fund members. It is not employee choice of fund. And Mr Kell is absolutely right. It is abundantly clear from the government's choice that the choice model is not driven by employee demand, which the evidence suggests is not particularly high. Rather, it is clear that the government is driving choice of fund for ideological reasons, not from any genuine desire to provide employees with a real choice about where their contributions should go. The government's distaste for industry-based superannuation funds is well known and was recently acknowledged in an editorial in the Australian newspaper which discussed the government's desire to press ahead with the 1st of July start update in the face of uh, industry and indeed employer opposition. And the Australian said, if the government remains set on its course, 
it would provide ammunition for critics who believe the member choice initiatives are motivated more by a desire to water down union affiliated industry fund involvement in superannuation than by a genuine wish to empower individual savers and said that on the 2nd of march now if the government were serious about employee choice of superannuation fund it could have chosen from a range of other choice models some of which already operate in state jurisdictions, which would have delivered true employee choice. The government's model is complicated. It places onerous compliance burdens on both employees and employers and fails the test of being simple to understand or administer. It will create enormous confusion for employers who have workers employed under both state and federal industrial arrangements and where employees move from one industrial jurisdiction to another. And there is abundant evidence to suggest that many employers, particularly those in small businesses, are blissfully ignorant, unaware of their choice obligations. If they were aware of their obligations, they'd probably be in revolt about why this government, which has promised to cut red tape for small business by 50 per cent, is implementing a superannuation policy which mummifies them in packing tape instead. The government's choice of fund model when combined with the, the bill we debated yesterday, which will remove superannuation from industrial awards, is going to remove the capacity of an independent arbitrator to resolve industrial disputes between employers and workers about where superannuation funds should go. That will remove an essential and well-established protection for both employers and employees. And as I said yesterday, it will take us back to the kind of disputes we saw in the 80s between, for example, the Stormont and Packers and Woolworths over where superannuation money should go without any effective way of resolving those disputes. Now, what model does Labor believe will meet choice of fund principles? I believe we need a phased, two-stage model. The features of such a model would be stage one, all superannuation funds with more than 50 fund members be required to offer investment choice options to all fund members, and stage two, after an extensive education and consumer protection campaign, to implement a genuine employee choice superannuation model where employees can nominate and, if employers agree, have superannuation contributions paid into a fund other than that set out in an industrial agreement. Now, stage one, choice within superannuation funds. The key features of that would be funds would be required to offer all fund members a minimum of three choice of investment options, but it wouldn't be compulsory for members in a fund to exercise an investment choice if they choose not to do so. We recommend this as a first step forward for several reasons. First, the option for funds to offer choice of investment already exists. It's set out in section 52, subsection 4 of the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act. Secondly, investment choice within funds is a good way to begin to educate fund members about their retirement income options and control of their superannuation savings. And we had evidence to the, the uh, Senate committee suggesting that members of existing funds do actively exercise a choice if it's accompanied by an adequate e education campaign. Third, Investment choice provides real options for choice, as opposed to the government's model, which could see consumers faced with identical investment options. And we had Steve Gibbs from the Australian Institute of Superannuation Trustees supporting this view in evidence. And he said, if choice is going to be introduced, real options ought to be available to people so they can choose a low-risk fund or a high-risk fund, and there might be one or two in the middle so that at least they can make up their own mind about what it is rather than having all the choices look alike. And I suggest there's a real risk under the government's model that that is exactly what is going to happen and we won't see employees being offered feed income choices. Finally, an added feature of investment choice could be a default investment option based on age risk profiles. This would ensure that fund members don't find themselves in inappropriate investment profiles which are not suitable to maximising fund members' final retirement income. Stage two, genuine employee choice of superannuation fund. Now, the key features of that model would be if an industrial award requires an employer to pay superannuation contributions to a specified superannuation fund on behalf of an employee, 
the employee may nominate to have superannuation contributions paid to a complying superannuation fund. The nomination would be made in writing, signed by the employee. Employers must give the employee a copy of the nomination and written notice of their approval. Employers and employees who negotiate a certified agreement or an Australian workplace agreement would be taken to have exercised choice, and regulations would be drafted governing standard disclosure provisions applying to key feature statements offered by funds directly to employees, particularly to enable simple comparison of fees, charges and fund earnings, a most important issue. In the event of dispute, the Industrial Relations Commission would act as the independent arbitrator. And where a workplace is not covered by an industrial award or agreement, the default fund would be that to which the majority of employees at that workplace belong. So, in the event of a new business uh, not covered by an industrial award or agreement, the fund specified in the designated award would apply. So, this offers genuine choice of fund to employees. It would more accurately reflect the demand for choice of superannuation fund from workers rather than choice driven by government or by vested interests. It would be simple to administer and avoid the complications of the government's model. It's broadly consistent with the choice of fund models which presently operate in the New South Wales and Queensland state uh, jurisdiction, therefore less confusion and creating greater national consistency between state and federal choice of fund models. Employers and employees would have the protection of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission in settling disputes. It would limit employer liability compared with what the government's putting forward. We'd avoid the default fund problems that the government's model has, and we would also avoid some of the transitional problems uh, <coughs> with the two models that the government's bill has. In addition to that second reading am amendment, we want to amend the government's bill at the uh, consideration in detail stage in a number of ways. We want to delay the start, start date for choice until 1 July 2000 to bring it into line for both <coughs> new and existing employees, and we want to take uh, action in relation to the definition of industry funds and a number of matters which I will uh, raise when we get into the consideration in detail stage in committee. So, <coughs> in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I believe that our model will provide genuine employee choice, not the present flawed, forced employer cho choice model. And having said that, I want to seek leave to move the amendment circulated in my name, uh, I might add with the uh, uh, consent and support of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. So if I have leave, I'll... Uh... Order is leave granted to add the words to the amendment moved by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Wills. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. That the following words be added to the words proposed to be substituted. Uh, three, put forward proposals for the choice of fund superannuation funds uh, which are both impractical and inequitable and should be replaced by a model which, one, allows for the provisions of industrial awards and agreements to be recognised, two, provides for more practical choices for employees and employers, three, provides greater protection for employees and employers, four, allows the Industrial Relations Commission to act as an independent arbitrator, and five, is accompanied by a government-funded education program. Order. The Honourable Member's time has expired. Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Member, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, has moved as an amendment that all words after that be omitted, with a view to substituting other words, which have been supplemented by leave by the Honourable Member for Wills. The question now is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Forrest. Mr uh, <coughs> Deputy Leader, the current uh, RPS, PAY and PPS tax arrangements impact on most Australian business. They are resource intensive, time consuming, and they lack the flexibility to uh, cater for the increasing demand of electronic uh, commerce. In addition, some 10 per cent of businesses have obligations in more than one withholding uh, arrangement. The Taxation Laws amend <coughs> Amendment Bill is aimed at relieving the burden that these arrangements place on business and bringing the method of tax payment by large withholders into line with modern business practices. These, cha these changes represent an important step towards reducing the range of withholding tax systems imposed on business with a view to establishing an efficient interface between the Australian Taxation Office and the business taxpaying community. 
Under this bill, <coughs> remittance obligations of withholders under the RPS, PPS and PAY systems are being rationalised by combining them under one set of arrangements. While these new arrangements are based on the existing PAY obligations, there are some important differences introduced by this bill. For large remitters, the bill requires that they remit on average every seven days instead of the uh, 14 days at present. Large remitters will also be required to remit electronically, a major step in modernising the tax payment system. In addition to improving the, tax, the security of tax payments, the cost of paying electronically is less than the tra transaction charge for cheque payments, illustrated by an estimated 95 per cent of large remitters who currently pay salary, salaries electronically. In terms of compliance cost, 5 per cent of large remitters will incur an initial, an initial cost acquiring the software to facilitate electronic payments. This cost has been estimated to large remitters of between $75 and $440, depending on the financial institution. For approximately 311,000 small remitters, the bill provides for them to remit on a quarterly basis rather than once a month, increasing their cash flow benefits. The small remitter threshold has also been increased from $10,000 to $25,000. The net effect of these changes on small remitters is an estimated saving of some $18 million per year. The bill removes the requirements for a person to apply for small remitter status, deeming that all remitters to be small remitters unless they are required to remit as a medium or large remitter. More than 80 per cent of all remitters fall into this uh, small remitter category. For small business, this represents a significant reduction in compliance costs and reduces the frequency of their transactions with the Australian Taxation Office. For medium remitters, <coughs> those whose total deductions under the three systems is more than $25,000 and less than $1 million per annum, the bill aligns the remittance dates for uh, RPS and, and PPS to the same monthly date for PAY remittance. The administrative savings for these uh, measures is estimated uh, at $9 million next year and $11 million in subsequent years for the ATO. Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill also simplifies the capital gains tax payment system through the introduction of an assets reg register. This bill allows taxpayers to transfer some or all of the information contained in the records they must keep for CGT purposes to an asset register. The asset register will greatly reduce the burden on capital gains tax payers by giving them greater flexibility as to how they keep their records. The asset register allows taxpayers to transfer information contained in records required under current law to, to dispose of those documents five years after the, uh, that entry is certified by a third party. Mr <coughs> Deputy Speaker, the bill is aimed at increasing efficiency of the, of the Australian taxation system and reducing the compliance cost to Australian taxpayers. While these amendments are welcomed by taxpayers, the pace of tax reform has the potential to, be, uh, to increase uh, further still. This is particularly true in the area of capital gains tax. A considerable body of evidence suggests that lowering the rate of capital gains tax would stimulate economic growth, improving the fairness of the taxation system and increasing tax revenues by encouraging individuals to unlock gains that they have been unwilling to, real to realise due to the high, rate, uh, of, uh, high rates of uh, CGT. Uh, William uh, Beach, a visiting fellow in tax analysis at the Heritage Foundation, said <clears throat> the following in a paper entitled How a Capital Gains Tax Cut would boost state revenues, and I quote, reducing the tax rate for capital gains actually increases tax revenues from taxpayers who own appreciated assets. The change in capital gains tax rates strongly indicate that, the, uh, that rate decreases produce more declarations of capital gains and more capital gains taxes. Owners of appreciated assets who face high tax rates generally hold on to or lock up their assets, end quote. That is, capital gains declarations increase when the rate of CGT decreases. Mr Deputy Speaker, 
the potential increase in revenue caused by the freeing up of capital assets and the corresponding increase in tax uh, payments is staggering. In the, in the United States, <clears throat> economists estimate that trillions of dollars in unrealised or locked up capital gains exist in the portfolios of American taxpayers, perhaps as high as $7.5 trillion. Two leading tax economists at the US Conga uh, Congressional Budget Office estimate the taxpayer response to capital gains ra rate reductions as being in the order of 6 to 1. In other words, for every 1 per cent drop in the rate of capital gains tax, capital gains realisations would rise by 6 per cent. On March the 17th this year, Britain's Chancellor of the Exchequer announced a comprehensive package of measures designed to promote enterprise and, in, and encourage investment in Britain. Among these changes were reforms to capital gains tax designed to encourage longer-term investment. Britain has, has introduced uh, capital gains tax taper aimed, uh, aimed at reducing the capital gains tax charge on the, on the, dispose of, on the disposal I'm sorry, of long-held business assets. These and other reforms are a response to what Britain has identified as a key economic challenge for the 21st century, responding to globalisation and increasing global competition. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are many benefits to be gained by tax reform, including uh, lowering the rate of CGT. The current unwillingness to realise capital gains distorts the market and inhibits growth and employment in Australia. Businesses are being distracted from pursuing investment opportunities by the desire to reduce their capital gains tax liabilities. Australia's high rate of CGT taxes economic activity. A high rate of CGT distorts normal business practices, inhibits the rationalisation of capital holdings, delays a firm's removal of non-core assets and alters the correct response to, uh, to outgrowing a firm's property all by the desire to avoid paying the higher rate of CGT. When the United States introduced a luxury tax in 1990, it was targeted towards, amongst other things, <coughs> the wealthy yacht buyer. Yet the burden of this tax fell on the yacht builders, who went bankrupt and their employees who went out of work. The wealthy yacht buyers either curtail the purchase of yachts or purchase them overseas, something similar occurs, of course, with the capital gains tax. A higher rate of CGT restricts capital formation, hurting the, greater, the greatest job creator in the economy, new business. In the United States between 1982 and 1988, when the capital gains tax rate was 20 per cent, new business incorporations rose by 4.4 per cent a year. Between 1987 and 1993, with a capital gains tax rate of 28 per cent, new business incorporations rose by less than 0.1 per cent annually. In other words, Mr Deputy Speaker, when the rate of CGT was increased by 8 per cent, America's new business incorporations dropped from 4.4 per cent per year to less than 0.1 per cent per year. This is, a significant, this is significant because most new businesses are small business. Last September, the, a the ABS Business Longitudinal Survey revealed that 65 per cent of the 211,000 jobs created during 1995-6 came from the small business sector. That's 137,000 jobs created by small business. The government has responded to problems facing, this, uh, facing small business with the introduction of a capital gains tax rollover relief. This tax reform package provided small business with relief from CGT where a taxpayer realised a capital gain on the disposal of an asset, then reinvested the proceeds in the same or another business. This capital gains tax rollover relief was an important step in removing some of the barriers to investment. Australia's modern, modern economy demands that we look at dismantling other barriers to investment, such as uh, <clears throat> implementing further re reforms to the, of, uh, to the disposal of appreciated assets for medium and larger businesses. A reduction <coughs> in CGT is not a tax break for the rich because 
the target of a tax and the burden of the tax are not necessarily the same as in the case of the wealthy yacht buyer. A high rate of CGT prevents the economy from operating at its optimum level, discouraging investment and hampering the creation of new jobs. A more competitive rate of CGT would make the allocation of capital more efficient, enabling investors to make decisions based on the opportunity rather than the tax liabilities. Furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, a more acceptable, <coughs> more acceptable rate or rates of CGT, owners of appreciated assets would be more likely to realise their capital gain through the sale of those assets, thereby increasing CGT revenues. Removing the barriers to the sale of frozen assets would provide the incentive to invest in new ventures and also result in a higher level of capital formation. This would be an important element in stimulating new investment, improving productivity, enhancing Australia's competitive competitiveness and job creation. At the global level, Australia's high rate of CGT makes Australia a less attractive home for venture capital. Firms in a competitive trading environment are more likely to invest their capital in countries where CGT rates are globally competitive. The Mortimer, the Mortimer Report of July 1997 made particular references to the impact of Australia's capital gains tax on attracting venture capital. The reference to the merits of lowering the CGT rate on venture capital investment as a step towards increasing Australia's level of venture capital. The report said as follows, and I quote, differential tax treatment is likely to cause venture capital to flow to low tax countries in America and Asia at the expense of Australia, end quote. Foreign pension funds, particularly those in the United States, are the main exporters of, of venture capital. This venture capital goes to countries where the taxation system offers simpler, uh, similar or better tax concessions than those in the United States. Exemption <coughs> from capital gains tax is the main attraction for pension funds investing in venture capital. As these investments are generally long term, the income foregone during the early years of investment is usually compensated by high capital gains realised in the later years when the investment returns a profit. Accordingly, these venture capital funds search for tax regimes where the capital gains on the disposal of venture capital investments is exempt from capital gains tax. Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia could attract a greater volume of venture capital funds if further CGT reform was undertaken. The irony is that the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936 realised the benefits of attracting venture capital uh, and exempted uh, interest and dividends received by for foreign superannuation uh, funds from, from income tax. However, US pension funds, a major source of venture capital, for commercial reasons choose either a limited partnership or a unit trust for investing in venture capital projects. When resulting dividends and interest are taxed through the limited partnership, capital gains tax liabilities occur. The Income Tax Assessment Act 1936 failed to recognise <coughs> that a limited partnership was merely a conduit for investment uh, made by foreign superannuation funds. When the Taxation Law, Laws Amendment Bill No. 6 was introduced in 1992, it taxed limited partnerships as companies. So instead of the partnerships being taxed on the partnership profit or loss, limited partnerships became taxable entities in their own right. This does not encourage the inflow of venture capital to Australia. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, the Taxation Laws Am uh, Amendment Bill is one element of the government's plan to reduce the burden of excessive taxation compliance and is doing, uh, and, and is doing so. Dismantling some of the barriers and, uh, and, uh, to uh, conducting uh, business. The introduction of the CGT Assets Register and the simplification of remittance obligations are part of the government's commitment to tax reform aimed at easing the burden of record keeping on business, simplifying existing taxation laws and establishing a modern interface between the ATO and Australian taxpayers.
The question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The Honourable Member for Jellybrand. Uh, Mr <coughs> Deputy Speaker, I rise to uh, speak in support of the second reading amendment moved by the Leader of the Opposition and the Member for Wills. And in doing so, I want to address my uh, remarks uh, to the, uh, that aspect of, or those aspects of the bill which relate to savings. And there is no doubt, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, improving savings in this nation is an important policy issue. We all know that the deficiency of savings uh, lies behind our relatively high balance of payments current account deficit. And what is perhaps not so well recognised is that our savings deficiency is not in the public sector but in the private sector. In the public sector, when uh, the Labor government left office, our budget deficit uh, was uh, about one of the lowest in the OECD, well below the OECD average, and uh, with only about four out of 22 OECD countries having a lower budget deficit. Our savings problem is not in the public sector but in the private sector. And the Labor government sought to address that firstly by uh, spreading superannuation across the whole of the workforce instead of the less than half of it, which was the case when we came into office, uh, doing that through award uh, superannuation firstly and then uh, spreading it further through the superannuation guarantee charge, and, uh, which provided not only for a wider coverage still of superannuation but also for a progressive increase in the employer contribution from 3%. Uh, which was initially established under the award superannuation of an employee's uh, uh, pay to 9 per cent by early next century. And that, of course, was seen as uh, giving a considerable booster to uh, national savings. The Retirement Incomes Modelling Task Force of Treasury estimated that that would increase uh, savings by some 2.3 per cent of GDP uh, eventually, which is a very substantial boost indeed. Then in the 1995 budget, uh, we proposed to extend that uh, dramatically further uh, by using the second leg of the uh, tax cuts to uh, in introduce a co-contribution for employee contributions, making employee contributions to superannuation compulsory and then matching that with a matching grant on a means-tested basis uh, from the government, uh, the combined effect of which would have been to considerably enhance savings further by another 1.7% of uh, GDP making a 4 per cent boost to, uh, uh, in savings as a proportion of GDP, taking it up by another 4 per cent eventually. A very considerable change to savings behaviour in this country. Now, of course, it would also greatly improve retirement incomes uh, of ordinary workers. In fact, for many of them, it meant they would have retired eventually on 100 per cent of their pre-retirement income. A tremendous economic and social reform. And what's this government done after promising at the last election to implement Labor's policy announced in the 95 budget that they would introduce the co-contributions for employee uh, contributions, that they, they said that they would do that at a cost eventually to the budget of some $4 billion, but all going into savings, so no savings lost. Having promised to do that, they now have welched on that promise. And of course, uh, having welched on that promise, they're saying, well, we're doing other things uh, which will rectify that. And, they, and the major thing that they are doing is in, in this bill. I'll come to talk about that. But uh, let me say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that um, what the government has done in breaking that fundamental promise to the Australian people, a $4 billion promise to the Australian people, is scandalous. But it's also, of course, very damaging in terms of uh, its impact on national savings. This government has acted in a very retrograde way by undertaking that uh, step and also, of course, through its actions in relation to the superannuation contributions tax, which is scaring higher income people out of superannuation by allowing low income people and casual employees to opt out of super and by its precipitate introduction of choice of fund for superannuation, which is in this legislation now before the House. All of those actions are tending to undermine private uh, savings in this country. Let me refer then in more detail to the savings rebate, which is part of the legislation now before us. There are two key weaknesses in this proposed tax concession. Firstly, it will do nothing to improve national saving. In fact, it will have a negative impact on national saving, and the way it is proposed to operate it is quite inequitable. In regard to the impact on national saving, let me say that as a measure to promote national savings, this proposal is a sick joke. It will not improve national savings. Firstly, because when it was fully introduced, when it is fully introduced, it will cost the budget over $2 billion, which is a reduction for national savings. 
There would only be a plus to national savings if the additional private sector savings were, in, were induced by more than $2 billion. But there are no indications that this will happen. In the Senate estimates after last year's budget, when Treasury officials were asked for their estimate of the impact of the rebate on promoting private savings, they were completely unable to give any figure at all. They said it was all just a matter of judgment and they couldn't say what the impact would be. So this government is introducing this measure, supposedly so it will improve national savings, without any official advice that it would have such an effect. Well, in quite an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary situation. In fact, more than likely they've been told by Treasury, if truth be known, it will have a negative impact on savings. But Treasury officials uh, refrained from saying that in the Senate committee. But certainly they would not say it would have a positive effect. And so, Mr Speaker, I'm Deputy Speaker, I would say that this is an utterly irresponsible piece of behaviour by this government, especially as it has abandoned its promise to introduce Labor's co-contribution policy, which would certainly have boosted national saving. And it's not hard to see why Treasury wasn't willing to say that this would do anything to promote national saving, because it's so easy to obtain the rebate without undertaking any additional saving. And if you already make personal superannuation contributions, you can get the rebate without making any, any further increase in your personal contributions at all. If people have substantial income already from other savings, such as interest income, dividends, rental income, capital gains, income from trusts, etc., they can obtain the rebate without any increase in their savings at all. So it's just a handout. There's no incentive to people who already have sufficient savings to get the maximum rebate to increase their savings at all. And in fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, people who reduce savings in a year can obtain the rebate. So long as they still have sufficient savings to claim the rebate, they can actually reduce their savings considerably in a year but still claim the full rebate, which is an utterly perverse and ludicrous result. That is, you can get the full benefits that this uh, legislation gives, uh, the full savings rebate, for doing the exact opposite of what the legislation is supposed to produce, that is an increase in savings. You reduce your savings to the exact opposite of the intention of the legislation and get the full benefit. I mean, what a perverse and ridiculous piece of legislation. Oh, it's no wonder the Treasury refused to state that this measure will have any positive effect on national savings. And furthermore, Mr Deputy Speaker, this measure is also a further encouragement to people to split their income through devices such as trusts, because if they do so, not only can they reduce their personal income tax by income streaming in the conventional way, income will go to one person, get split amongst several people, they all get the uh, tax-free uh, minimum uh, area and then uh, lower marginal taxes after that, but they also now have available a further $450 rebate for each trust beneficiary, so long as the trust income is over $3,000 for each person. So it's a major further incentive for people to avoid tax by splitting their income through trusts. That is, to follow the example of the 19 ministers in this government who have family trusts, to do what they're doing, to, to use trusts to reduce uh, their income tax. This is, a much, this is a real substantial incentive to go down that path. There's not only no gain to national savings in this case, there's a loss to national savings, because people access the rebate without saving any more, and insofar as it induces more people to utilise trust to reduce income tax, it further reduces national savings. So as a measure to improve national savings, this savings rebate is a complete and utter disaster. And no wonder that there are reports in yesterday's Financial Review that business and industry groups are discussing with the government, and apparently quite intensively so, the scrapping of the savings rebate. That is the legislation that's just coming through the House now. The government's talking with business about scrapping it and utilising the $2 billion uh, to go towards uh, reducing marginal taxes as part of their tax reform. No wonder they're doing that, because everyone recognises, business and industry groups will recognise that this savings rebate is a joke. And everyone recognises that, except apparently this government, and maybe it even does now, following those sort of discussions. Also, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is quite clear that uh, this um, savings rebate is utterly inequitable. I won't go through the detail of that to save time, <coughs> but uh, because there is no means test on it, uh, it is utterly inequitable, and that point has been made by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and will be made by other speakers on this side. 
I turn now to uh, the choice of superannuation fund, which is a, another major piece in relation to pri private savings in the legislation now before us. Now, the government claims that this provision of choice for new employees from the 1st of July this year and for existing employees from the 1st of July 2000 will be beneficial because through competition it will reduce costs and it will increase investment returns. Now, in fact, there is no certainty at all that such benefits will result. Indeed, especially given the way that choice is being implemented in this bill, there is a strong reason to believe that the opposite will result. And this is because the costs may well be increased by choice. And this in turn follows from the fact, firstly, that there will be increased marketing costs and administrative costs for funds resulting from choice. Marketing costs will increase because funds will be forced to sell their wares, to market themselves to employees and employers, so they'll be the fund of choice. It's not something that uh, the funds generally have had to do before. Now, these costs could be very considerable indeed because you've got banks, life officers and various other public offer uh, bodies out there, other financial institutions, who will be anxious to attract most of the super, more of the superannuation business so that the industry funds and others will have to uh, defend their territory. and That means uh, considerable additional marketing expenditure. There will also be the cost of people switching funds. Choice will mean more movement between funds. So there's more administrative costs of taking on new people and having people leave. Now these costs can be very, very considerable, as shown in the evidence of the Senate Select Committee on Superannuation in regard to Chile, which gives, where evidence was given that in Chile, which has a compulsory superannuation scheme and a vigorous uh, choice regime, that uh, costs of uh, switching funds account for an extraordinary 38% of the entire cost of managing the superannuation system. Cost of switching funds, 38 per cent of the entire cost of managing the superannuation system. So additional costs through people switching funds may be very substantial indeed. The question is therefore whether the certainty, the, the absolute certainty of substantial additional costs for the industry through increased marketing costs and administrative and legal costs will be offset by possible inducements to efficiency and improvement through competition. The government's advisers clearly don't have any idea what the outcome will be. In evidence to the Senate Select Committee, the Assistant Commissioner Policy of the Insurance and Superannuation Commission told the Senate Select Committee, and I quote, we have not undertaken any specific research on the impact on industry compliance costs in terms of marketing the choice of fund, end of quote. So if the specialist regulator body doesn't know what will happen to costs, how can the government simply assume the costs overall will be reduced? Also, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have to take into account costs for employers following from the choice regime being implemented. Now, the re there will in fact be considerable additional costs for employers. Uh, the reason why the Labor government uh, provided little in the way of choice in the past was in large part to keep costs to employers as low as possible. But employers will now face the cost of having to give each employee a choice once a year. They'll face costs of deciding what choice to offer and trying to ensure that they are offering appropriate funds. They'll face costs of ensuring that employees receive sufficient information on which to make an informed choice. Costs of notifying each employee of the choice available. <coughs> costs of ensuring that employees' choice in an unlimited choice offer is in fact a, a complying fund for the purposes of the Act, and costs of having to make payments to a whole host of different funds instead of just one fund as generally applies at present. Now, all these are additional costs on employers, and they are certain therefore to, to face uh, additional costs as well as the strong likelihood that costs will be considerably higher for the funds. Now, apart from higher costs, there are other factors that mean members may well receive lower returns than they currently do. And one of these factors is that people may well be induced by slick sales agents acting on a commission basis to make bad choices. And there is a great example of this happening in the United Kingdom. Evidence given to the Senate committee showed that when the Thatcher government in the United Kingdom allowed member choice of fund in the late 1980s, the result was about half a million people were duped into making extremely bad choices, especially and almost incomprehensibly leaving employer-assisted def defined benefit schemes 
for personal superannuation schemes that relied entirely on the employee's own contributions. Now, to be induced into a, to go into a scheme where they left behind the employer contributions relied entirely on their own and on accumulation basis against some defined benefit is almost unbelievable. But half a million people were in large part, um, well, a large part of that half a million people who uh, made the choice were to, to move were, and, and, and were worse off did made the choice in that way. Now it seems uh, extraordinary, Mr Deputy Speaker, but the fact is that to rectify the mess in the United Kingdom has cost something in the order of $10 billion. And after such a disaster, one would think that the Australian government would have learned from this experience. But the government seems to be relying on appropriate disclosure statements being available to employers to enable them to make an informed choice. But this is no guarantee at all. For instance, Professor Good, the Oxford University professor who chaired the United Kingdom inquiry into the pension fiasco, <coughs> said in Australia last October, as reported in The Age of the 13th of October 1997, and I quote, the more bits of paper, the more information people are given, the more confused they become. All this volume of disclosure is counterproductive because it gets to the stage where nobody reads anything. End of quote. So that's the British experience. In the light of that, clearly we should be very, very cautious about moving to choice and certainly not doing it until there has been a large, intensive and effective education program to alert people to the dangers of choice and to understand what is involved as well as possible. But that's not happening. We're rushing to introduction for new employees by 1st of July this year, that is just three months away, with no education program in place. The tax office has uh, only recently completed tendering for the conduct of such an education campaign by an advertising agency, which has yet to come into place. And the funds available for education are not large. The government has allocated only $12 million over four years to deal with the administration of uh, introducing choice of fund, including an education campaign. So it will be a lot less than $12 million for education, and in 97-8 the amount is only $2 million for all administrative costs for choice. So much less than $2 million on, to be spent on education in 97-8. And goodness knows uh, what's going to be spent this year, since I understand there's no specific allocation for a campaign in the rest of this financial year. Potentially all this is quite disastrous, especially as some two million people change their jobs each year, as well as a couple of hundred uh, thousand additional entrants uh, to the workforce. So well over two million people will qualify for choice in 97-8, but there will be no adequate education um, in place uh, for them. And also evidence to the Senate uh, committee you made it clear that the employers were not ready for this change. For instance, Coles Meyer, one of the largest employers in the country, said that they weren't ready uh, for, for this change, wouldn't have their administration ready in time for a July 1 start. A uh, survey published in the Financial Review on the December 22nd of last year showed 42 per cent of employers weren't aware at all about the choice of fund regime to be implemented by the 1st of July this year. And so clearly, Mr Deputy Speaker, as well as employers not being ready, the superannuation industry itself is not ready. For example, where an employer offers a limited choice of four funds to an employee, they'll be required to provide the employee with a key feature statement for each of the offered funds. But details of these key feature statements are not yet known and won't be known until regulations are issued after this legislation is passed by the parliament later this month, presumably. So again, or maybe longer, so again it's uh, simply no time for all this to be decided, conveyed uh, to funds and employers for them to and for them to understand it, for employees to be educated as to what it all means for them. It was the overwhelming view of the evidence to the Senate uh, Select Committee that the timetable is too tight. Even David Connolly, the former Liberal MP and, and Coalition spokesman on superannuation, the author of their policy, said he was concerned about the lack of time and suggested either that they be, uh, uh, be, optional for, be put off for six months or it be optional for the first six months. And so too said the Institute of Actuaries and various others. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's also the case that uh, this, uh, this uh, choice regime will mean reduced uh, outcomes for people in other respects, particularly in relation to insurance, uh, which the, uh, David Connolly again said was uh, a cause of great concern to him that there was not a compulsory insurance provision in this legislation and people could lose their insurance cover. 
and uh, also in relation to a default fund uh, where it's, uh, there is uh, grave danger that people will be worse off by going, being put by employers into default funds where they don't make a choice, as will happen in many cases, and that that fund will be utterly Order, inadequate because no standards will apply for time it. Time has expired. <coughs> the question is that the words proposed to be omitted stand part of the question. The honourable member for Macpherson. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I was interested to listen to the member for Jerry Brand as a former treasurer um, to get uh, the benefit of his uh, wisdom on some of these subjects. But unfortunately, I think all we got was a tirade of criticism of what the government is intending to do in this legislation and very little credit. And of course, uh, in his criticism of the government's uh, saving measures, which are announced in this legislation, um, there is only all of the negative side and the downside, and of course the question uh, being posed is, well, uh, will it work? Won't it work? Well, the point is that something had to be done to address the, uh, the levels of savings in Australia. And the question I might well ask the member for Jerry Brown is, what did you do? I mean, you were 13 years in government. You were a former treasurer, and it's due under your regime. That Australians, uh, and uh, well, I've listened to what you t tried to tell us you did, and, and there weren't any answers there. But if you look at the facts, if you look at the figures, you'll find that Australia's uh, savings rates during the years that you were in government hovered at extremely low levels. In fact, they trended down. I'm looking here at household savings rates, and these are OECD figures from 6.8 in 1983 um, down uh, to uh, below 5 uh, through the uh, 94 90 Five ninety-six years, um, and so Australia has a very serious problem. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, when you actually look at these figures and put them in the OECD context, um, the picture is pretty bleak when you compare Australia's savings performance, say, with Japan or Germany uh, or France or even Italy or the United Kingdom and uh, or South Korea. Um, of course, um, prior to the, uh, the, the, the economic problems it's experienced at the moment. But in, in comparison with those countries and others indeed in the OECD, Australia has performed very poorly indeed um, in respect of its savings rates. So um, I don't think the member from Jellybrand ha for Jellybrand has a great deal of credibility in, in, uh, in uh, being entirely negative about the government's proposal. Something had to well the truth hurts, I'm sure, but something had to be done. Something is being done. And and I think that, that most people applaud these particular measures. And um, not not only did we hear criticism of what we are doing, but I don't think we got much of an indication of what you would actually do to address the problem. I mean you've acknowledged I'm sure you've acknowledged there is a problem with Australia's savings rates, but we didn't hear, and, and, we, and we don't hear much about Labor Party policies. There's a lot of criticism, and maybe that's the way you see opposition, and I suppose in opposition uh, it's an easy trap to fall into, to constantly criticise what the government's doing, and up to a point that's legitimate. But uh, acknowledging there is a problem with Australia's savings rates, let's hear a little bit more policy from the Labor Party. Let's hear what they would do. Um, to address a particular problem rather than coming in here and trying to tell us what the government is doing to address the problem, uh, trying to tell us why it won't work. Um, so I applaud what the government is doing in this legislation to encourage people to save, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because that's obviously something that's desperately needed. The other uh, issue that the member for Jellybrand uh, concentrated on uh, at some length in his contribution, again, was criticism of the government's uh, proposal to introduce a choice of superannuation fund um, for employees. Now, again, I think he was slightly disingenuous in his criticism of that proposal, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, whilst we acknowledge on this side and we understand the complexities of those arrangements and the difficulties that they may create for employers, are of course up and out in our minds. And it will, in, in fact, introduce some difficulties for employers. Um, but what we need to really look at here what the, is what the intention of these proposals are in terms of creating competition, in terms ultimately of providing a better deal for employees. 
That's the priority, and the member for Jelly Brand can talk all he likes about shonky insurance salesmen, I think, as he described them. Um, but of course, we're all subject to the risk of dealing, I suppose, with shonky salespeople, and uh, and people, of course, need to be educated, need to be aware of the opportunities. But but let me let me put. Uh, to, to bed the suggestion that they are concerned about freedom of choice for those reasons. Mr Deputy Speaker, the reason that they are concerned about freedom of choice is that it simply is going to break down the very cosy arrangements that they put in place in respect of superannuation contributions, whereby all of their union mates were the benefactors of the systems that they put in place. And of course, why wouldn't they have put those systems in place? It meant that millions, well, maybe even billions of dollars, was going to flow uh, directly or indirectly um, into uh, into union coffers or the, or, or into, into funds that were controlled uh, to a large extent by the trade unions. Now we uh, we are not uh, introducing this system uh, necessarily for only to break that cosy arrangement down, but of course it does quite correctly have that effect, and it will give employees. Um, the sort of choice that I believe people can come at, ought to have, and in fact, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's actually quite patronising uh, of the Labor Party to talk uh, in the terms that they do. Almost that the, the people, that, that individual Australians, employees, uh, aren't capable of making choices. In other words, that their attitude to so many things, that the Labor Party's attitude to so many things, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that the government can actually do things better for us than we can do them for ourselves, and uh, that, of course, really just shows, I, I guess, the extent of the of the ideological divide which exists still um, between uh, those of us on this side of the house and and those who sit in the opposition, and it is a huge divide. And we simply um, do not want to patronise people. We want to give them choice, and certainly they have to understand that those choices need to be educated uh, and informed choices. And, and we simply take the view that people are capable of making those choices. In fact, that they ought to make those choices, um, and, and that when they do make them, they'll make them uh, consistent with their own objectives, their own uh, own personal. Uh, ideas about where they should put their money, which after all is also what we're talking about in this context. So I really, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, get quite uh, excited when I hear the Labor Party talking about some of these things because it's not never too difficult to read between the lines and see what the real agenda is. And as I said earlier, for them to come in here, speaker after speaker, and criticise the government without giving us the benefit of what their alternatives are to solving some of these problems, I think is uh, really a little bit rich. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'll turn just briefly to a number of elements of this, uh, this uh, legislation that I wanted to speak specifically about. And uh, the first uh, matter that I just wanted to touch on briefly, because people listening to this debate probably uh, get the impression that it's all uh, terribly technical, uh, and in fact, in this legislation, people ought to know um, that the government is doing some very simple things, and yet some things which will be enormously worthwhile and welcomed by all Australians. Could I mention just briefly that this legislation provides for uh, the introduction of tax deductibility for the Australian Nurses National Memorial on Anzac Parade in Canberra. Now, I think that's something that I particularly uh, welcome, and I know that all members of this House and all Australians will be pleased to know it's a very worthwhile project. Um, it is, of course, uh, in place at the moment in a temporary sense, um, but I'm very pleased to be able to tell people, if they're not aware, that tax deductibility for that trust will be in place from the 3rd of September 1997. Um, through until the 4th of September 1999, and hopefully people encouraged by the, by the tax deductibility element for donations to that trust will be encouraged um, to actually donate to it um, to enable it uh, to proceed and to be completed on schedule. And uh, as I say, that's something that I know that will be strongly supported. One other uh, me measure that is uh, covered in this leg legislation, and there are a large number, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, of uh, fairly minor or technical matters, but nevertheless people I'm sure will be interested to know about them, um, relates to the, um, 
to the issue of the uh, capital gains tax register. There are a number of um, parts of this uh, legislation which uh, uh, the government is bringing forward in response to the uh, work that was done by the Small Business Deregulation Task Force. And, uh, this is just another uh, concession to small business. It may be minor uh, it, of itself, but I think it adds to the very correct perception that people ought to have, and that, that is that this government is concerned uh, to assist the small business community wherever possible. And uh, this particular measure was one that was uh, highlighted in that particular inquiry by the Small Business Deregulation Task Force, and it brought forward a number of recommendations, uh, some of which are implemented in this legislation. But this particular one means that taxpayers should no longer have to keep source documents uh, for unreasonable periods of time, but will instead only need to retain source documents for five years after the details have been extended into the asset register and certified by a registered tax agent or other person approved by the Commissioner. Um, and the proposal was announced in the government's response to that original task force, and the response at the time was entitled More Time for Business, and appropriately entitled, because uh, whilst these sort of uh, requirements that have been imposed on small businesses over the years uh, are not uh, great in isolation, uh, when they are uh, looked at in a cumulative sense, then they probably add up to some hours uh, of work for the small business uh, person each week. And the government has been, uh, I think, uh, quite correctly at great pains to reduce that workload as far as it uh, requires record keeping and a range of other uh, impositions. But that's what they are on small business. And this uh, particular legislation, as I said, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, uh, brings into effect a number of the recommendations of that small business deregulation task force. I welcome them. I have a constituency with many small businesses, mainly, of course, focused on the tourism industry. And as I visit them, uh, as I do uh, whenever I have a chance, uh, they never fail to raise with me um, the issue of the, of the sort of record keeping requirements and complexity of taxation laws and, and other uh, uh, laws that are placed upon them. And, 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 and inevitably, complying with regulations takes time. And for small business, and we're talking small, medium to micro businesses here, time is money. And any time that's required to fill out forms for government or to keep records involves uh, either employing someone to do it, which of course very small businesses can afford to do these days, or else of course uh, working long hours, as every small business person virtually has to do these days, um, to, uh, to uh, meet the requirements of the law. So, I welcome, and uh, my constituents will, and I suspect most people in this place will welcome those changes which respond to the concerns of small um, business. Now, I mentioned um, uh, earlier on the savings rebate, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and, uh, and already made a few comments in response to what the uh, member for Jellybrand had said in his contribution. Um, but uh, I refute strongly his contention that this is uh, not a good measure. Uh, I think he quoted the figure, and I accept that this is a very expensive measure. In fact, it will cost the revenue $350 million in 1998-99, $1.370 million in 1999-2000, and over $2 billion in the year 2000-2001. So it is a very expensive measure. It's, in that respect, I suppose, a very generous measure. And frankly, it remains to be seen whether it will work. Um, but the bottom line most of us recognise is that Australians save too little and need to be encouraged to save. And many people in my community for years have been saying to me, well, if you want to encourage people to save, then you have to have tax incentives in place through the tax system which will, will, will in fact achieve that objective. And that is what this legislation does. Uh, you can argue that it doesn't go far enough and, of course, it, it may in time be able to go further. But it is a start and, uh, and it will encourage savings and it will hopefully have the effect of reversing the trend that I referred to earlier in, the, in those OECD figures, uh, which shows the very concerning and consistent over many years low rates of, uh, of saving um, which is, exist in Australia compared to those uh, which exist in many of the other OECD countries. 
Uh, what uh, the problem we have in Australia, Mr Deputy Speaker, of course, is not only low savings but debt, uh, which is too high as well. Uh, and I suppose one, in a sense, is the corollary of the other. Um, but uh, whether you look at it on a national level or a household level, uh, we as Australians are heavily in debt. And uh, that uh, not only, of course, presents us with problems at a household level, but it also presents us with problems uh, as a national economy. And of course, uh, much of the government's uh, good work that has been done since it was elected has been aiming at, uh, at fixing the latter. That is, uh, making sure that Australia's debt levels are brought under control. Certainly, our public debt levels and private levels debt levels are brought under control. Uh, on a household level, we all know. Um, that people uh, uh, use credit cards extensively these days. In fact, there's a whole different uh, almost uh, um, approach now to the use of credit. Uh, my parents uh, grew up and saved for things that they wanted. Uh, I guess it was my generation that uh, suffered that bank card in the mail um, that, that occurred at one stage. And, and, from, and from then on, of course, we thought we didn't need to save for anything, and we didn't. And of course now today we have these horrific levels of debt, both personally and nationally, and it's quite correct that the government should do, as it has done, everything within its power to reduce debt levels. And of course this savings rebate, um, which applies at a uh, rate of 15 per cent, except in the 98-99 year where it will be 7.5 per cent, um, will <coughs> apply to a, a wide range of savings vehicles, which I won't go into now up to an annual cap of $3,000, and the rebate will be available for earnings from a wide range of those savings and investments vehicles. The measure is intended to provide an incentive to save, which is fair, allowing individuals to choose the form most suited to their needs, recognising that individuals need to save for lifestyles needs as well as retirement. Now, I'd like to say, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in the, in the context of saving for retirement, because my electorate is dominated by uh, retired people, um, that I have a great concern uh, about this particular issue. There's an urgent need for people to be encouraged to save for their retirement in order to achieve a higher standard of living than they will otherwise enjoy if they don't. We have, of course, an ageing population and a shrinking tax base, and it doesn't take uh, much to realise, of course, that those, those two competing ends um, create a serious problem for the government and this government, and to its credit, to some extent, the previous government saw the problem and worked towards a whole range of policies uh, which would encourage people to save for their retirement. Um, and, uh, and, of course, that's the, the main point of this particular piece of legislation. You know, the irony, Mr Deputy Speaker, though, I find in talking to many people in my electorate, my so-called self-funded retirees or members of the Association of Independent Retirees with whom I meet in my office uh, regularly, um, the irony for them is that, having saved for their retirement, they actually end up being worse off um, than they would have been if they hadn't saved for their retirement. And I've uh, put a lot of effort into my work here in this place over the last eight years to redress some of that imbalance, and the government, to its credit, has recognised that, of course, in a number of ways, with increasing uh, the effective tax-free threshold for low-income self-funded retirees and with the health care rebates uh, as inadequate and ineffective as they appear to have been, but a whole range of issues um, to assist uh, particularly low-income self-retirees. But as I say, many of them are able to demonstrate that they actually, having done the right thing all their lives, uh, end up being worse off than they might otherwise have been um, if they had not saved for their retirement. And I believe the government has a responsibility, a primary responsibility, um, to provide a situation where people are secure in their retirement. And I think it's uh, often uh, very sad to me to meet people, as I frequently do, who have saved and who are now very insecure in their retirement and, and finding great difficulty meeting ends meet. And so there needs to be more done, I believe, to, uh, to give those people that security uh, for future generations, the savings uh, rebates and to some extent for existing retirees uh, will, will have some effect. But more must be done. And in the reform of the tax system, uh, which the government is embarking on, again much to its credit, 
um, because the former government, of course, uh, found that much, much too hard. Um, it's imperative that the needs of independent retirees be addressed, and I, mean, I, uh, I support a number of the recommendations they've made as an association to the tax consultative tax force, things like increasing the effective tax-free threshold to at least $10,000. In 1987, the tax-free threshold was 4,890. It's only moved up to 5,400 at this stage. It's not moved anywhere near at the same rate as average weekly earnings. So I could go on at length about the, about my concern for particularly for independent retirees, and I did want to uh, say one or two other things. My time will shortly expire. I just wanted finally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to congratulate the Prime Minister for his announcement today of support for carers within Australian society and note that, he's to, that the government will spend $270 million over the next four years to assist the age achieve, uh, achieve uh, some of the desire, their the desires to, to be Paul secure McPherson's in their retirement and to remain in their own homes. Has expired. Thank you. I call the honourable member for Lowe. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, this change to the superannuation industry through the uh, workplace agreements will allow employers to meet their choice obligation obligations through the use of both formal agreements, that is the Australian workplace agreements and certified agreements, or informal agreements where an employee is able to individually nominate the choice of their fund and giving the employer the chance to agree to that nomination. The current system rarely allows employees the choice of which super fund their employer's compulsory superannuation contribution are, uh, contributions are distributed to. The proposal to enable employee choice of funds was announced in the 1997-98 budget and the introduction of, a, of choice of superannuation funds um, provides employees with greater control and greater flexibility. And this also requires greater, greater personal and self-responsibility. Employees will need to be able to assess which funds are most appropriate and best suited to their requirements and will need to recognise distinguish and differentiate marketing and sales pitches that will undoubtedly become common once this choice is made formal. The, this bill will be one of great uh, benefit to people who have had to move from one place of employment to another. And uh, as we all know, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Australians are changing jobs at a rate uh, never seen before and, uh, of course, also changing from cities to cities uh, at a rate never seen before. There are many people, as I said, in that position who consequently have employee contributions held in many and various accounts, and since their superannuation contributions are managed by different funds, the employee incurs losses in their retirement funds as a result of the varying fees and charges associated with the management of the different funds. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, allowing employees to nominate their choice of funds is but one step to enabling them to manage their own resources as they see fit. No doubt they will seek to maximise their retirement income and may well decide to do this by consolidated, consolidating all their contributions towards their retirement into one fund, and that's, that's an absolutely vital and necessary initiative um, that uh, is incorporated in the bill. Whilst the government is hailing this initiative as a benefit for small businesses, Mr, De uh, Mr. Acting Speaker, many employers have indicated that they are uneasy about this change and how it will affect them, and, it, and they fear that it could lead to increased management and administration costs. Um, I've had uh, several visits uh, to my office from uh, the uh, managers of small businesses, proprietors of small businesses especially, and they, they're very, very concerned at, uh, at uh, the greater uh, involvement this will mean for their staff in advising uh, their, their employee, employees and uh, the bookwork involved uh, with this whole procedure. There are three basic uh, options that employers will be in a position to offer the employees under this bill. A limited choice offer. Secondly, employers will negotiate the superannuation fund issue via workplace agreements. Or thirdly, an unlimited choice. I uh, want to draw to, to the attention of the House, uh, Mr Acting Speaker, an article which uh, appeared in the Financial Review late uh, December last year, which uh, reported that, uh, and I quote, a survey of 100 employers found that most small firms were concerned that the federal government's members' choice policy could lead to a blowout in business costs. According to the survey, this meant restricting the choices offered to employees to a fund nominated in a workplace agreement or to a menu of four funds. Employers said that simplicity of administration, management costs and services, service support were the most important factors to determine the types of fund they would offer employees." End of quote. Um, 
Mr Acting Speaker, another survey conduct conducted in January this year highlighted some concerns from Australian companies regarding the introduction of this bill, with most companies believing that choice would necessarily and no doubt involve more administration costs and fewer benefits for employees. The Executive Chairman of Industry Funds Services, Mr Gary Weaven, believes, and I quote, there is not a ghost of a chance of more than 10 per cent of employers complying with the, with the legislation. He says that it involves an outrageous, and I quote again, an outrageous amount of red tape on questions such as when is a default fund not a default fund, as well as an oner uh, onerous level of record keeping by employers. This bill, Mr Acting Speaker, as it stands, without an, 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 an analysis of the effects of the change and without a well-constructed fair education campaign, may prove to be the cause of unnecessary uncertainty and confusion for all parties involved, employees and employers. The opportunity to shop around for the appropriate superannuation fund, the decision as to which retirement uh, savings account or fund to choose, will no doubt prove to be a lot more difficult than anticipated by the government. Most employees now have almost no say over the fund into which their superannuation is paid. In fact, the greatest proportion of people have the compulsory super paid into their employer's fund or into an, an industry fund. If the performance or investment strategy adopted by that fund are not suitable to the employee's individual preferences, then there is usually nothing the employee can do about it. Surveys indicate that most members would opt not to change superannuation funds if given the opportunity, but that they would, however, like to have this option available to, to them. Many small business employees are unsure and uneasy uh, of the proposed expansion of member choice, and many have suggested to me that its introduction may be fraught with, uh, with problems. Not many employees, Mr Acting Speaker, are fully aware of the benefits, the entitlements and the risks associated with investing in funds. The member choice policy can be considered a good step in the freedom of the individual. However, some industry sources have expressed, as I said earlier, concern that members might not make wise choices through lack of understanding or through lack of sufficient information. A recent uh, UK Office of Fair Trading Pensions inquiry determined approximately 570,000 cases of mis-selling mis in, uh, in the UK, and uh, a great deal of money was, uh, was then had to, was had to be found in compensation. Employees, Mr Acting Speaker, were enticed and persuaded to move to personal pension schemes that were often against their own interests through lack of understanding. The federal government's form of choice can be improved, I believe, to prevent such an outcome by the establishment of a proper default fund, real employee choice and effective con consumer protection. Concern has also been expressed by members of the superannuation industry who fear that this new deal will result in an increase of costs and that the individual members of funds would not receive any net benefit. It has also been suggested that this uh, change could uh, transform superannuation into a user pay system with the added fees and charges not unlike, unlike those adopted and used by the banking sector quite extensively. Member choice will take, into, uh, take access to bulk membership from uh, employers away from super funds. This could leave employers with two choices, employees rather, with two choices. Number one, a no frills super fund which does not provide insurance, quarterly reporting, access to investor helplines or a choice of investor options or, secondly, a fund with those added benefits at an obviously added cost. Funds would no doubt increase costs to make up for revenue lost as a result of the new system of administration procedures, increased marketing expense and the costs associated with investors switching funds. Employees need to be targeted as part of a major education campaign to inform about superannuation and associated investment matters. It is fair to say, Mr Acting Speaker, that uh, even those who are well educated and erudite will no doubt find the superannuation process a little too confusing to fully grasp and comprehend. I would suggest that we should spare a thought for the nearly 50 per cent of employees with lower literacy and numeracy skills who will undoubtedly get lost in the process. I am particularly uh, and especially concerned, Mr Acting Speaker, about the hundreds of thousands of people who are of non-English speaking background who have difficulty conversing in English and or reading in English who may make some major miscalculations through misunderstanding the options. And I'm pleased to see, Mr Acting Speaker, that uh, the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs is at, uh, at the table and uh, I'm sure that he will uh, no doubt uh, press for there to be uh, the most possible, that the greatest possible uh, information uh, put through the ethnic media, whether it be uh, ra newspapers, radio and, and, and television, 
it needs it needs uh, to be well well sourced because I fear very very much for those people of non English speaking background who have uh, problems uh, conversing in English and uh, and problems in reading in English. And I note the government wants to implement the bill on the first of July, nineteen. Uh, 98. Uh, I just fear that uh, there may not be enough time. However, uh, I would uh, urge the government to ensure that everything possible is done, especially and in particular for those people of, uh, of non-English speaking background, to fully comprehend what this means and how this will impact on them. Mr uh, uh, Acting Speaker, I, I will not vote against the bill. However, as I said earlier, I would urge the government to ensure that all that uh, can be done is done to ensure that red tape is reduced to the minimum possible and that a widespread educational and information program be undertaken as soon as possible to guarantee employees are well informed about the procedures and the options so that no one is disadvantaged. I call the honourable member for Boothby. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In speaking to the uh, Tax Laws Amendment Bill No. 7, I'd like to touch on uh, three of the areas that the bill covers, and they are the choice of superannuation funds, uh, the distribution of uh, income to uh, shareholders of private companies, and also uh, the government's savings rebate. Um, firstly, regarding the choice of super fund, uh, the choice of super fund was an election uh, commitment by the coalition before the 1996 election, and it was an also a recommendation of the Wallace Committee into the financial services um, system, and into the financial system. And uh, the recommendation was that employees should be provided with a choice of fund, subject to the constraints about administrative costs and fund liquidity that you can get um, with, uh, with being able to change too easily. Members should also have the right to transfer the amounts to any fund. Um, the, uh, the committee, the Wallace Committee, actually reported that most members now do not have a choice of superannuation funds and are unable to transfer their benefits between the funds, and that's reduced the competition in superannuation. Um, for example, some industrial awards name the funds where the compulsory superannuation guarantee funds must be paid. So employees um, under some of those awards have no choice of which super fund they can be in. And more than half of the superannuation accounts are in funds where members do not have full choice. The uh, Insurance and Superannuation Commission estimates that 24 per cent of superannuation members have no choice of fund at all. The benefits of allowing choice of a fund in superannuation is to increase the competition between the funds and, uh, and therefore increase the efficiency uh, between the funds. Um, as the financial systems inquiry highlighted, with, uh, if you do have free choice between the funds, you need to address the problems of administration costs with uh, transferring between the funds and, uh, and also fund liquidity. However, in the United States, where they've had a greater choice of uh, superannuation funds, they have not had any problems with uh, fund liquidity. Um, and also that competition will only ensue if you have um, informed consumers, if you actually have uh, education on the choice of funds, on the risk, on the return, and also on the rights of consumers. And uh, that's the responsibility of both uh, the industry and also the regulators. But the principle behind having a choice of superannuation funds is that with information, choice and control, consumers will take a sense of ownership of their superannuation funds, of their savings vehicles, and actually take an interest in saving for retirement. As the previous member mentioned, um, on 1 July 1998, um, the uh, legislation will come into uh, will will um, take effect, and uh, from then on, new employees will have a choice where their compulsory superannuation guarantee is paid. First of July 2000, it will also be available to existing employees to have a choice of funds. And what employers will have to do is offer a choice of four complying funds or retirement savings accounts, or Secondly, to offer the employee unlimited choice of superannuation funds, or thirdly, to specify a fund through either formal or informal workplace agreements. And if they don't do that, they'll have to pay an extra 25% uh, on the superannuation guarantee charge. Now, what may happen, as uh, as was indicated in the Senate Select Committee on Superannuation, 
Um, many employees are perhaps likely, even if offered a complete choice, uh, to go with the default. But what you might see is that the level of competition might occur at the level of, uh, of the company or employer in that, um, in that they will be, um, be looking at four funds or, or retirement savings accounts and be trying to pick what they consider uh, are the four best funds. And the previous member and other speakers in this debate have mentioned a very important point, and that is that, that the consumers really do need to be given um, adequate information. It's only through um, informed choice um, that the principle will actually work to deliver competition, thereby improve uh, efficiency in superannuation. Um, but the Senate uh, Select Committee on Superannuation in their public hearings in the bill found considerable support for the broad concept of, ch of the choice of fund. Moving on to the savings rebate. The savings rebate had its origins in the LAW tax cuts which were legislated by Paul Keating in 1992 and which were never delivered. In the 1995 budget, the LAW tax cuts became the superannuation co-contribution. Last year in the budget, the government announced that it would offer a maximum of $225 in a savings rebate from this year onwards, and then a maximum of $450 in future years. And that would be offered as a 15 per cent rebate on savings from whatever uh, means, either through super contributions or from uh, dividend and investment income, um, interest income from savings. Um, and, uh, this, um, this benefit is, is actually available to uh, all those people who are either saving or who have saved in the past. It is, an incentive, it is an incentive for saving, but it's also a reward for those who are living on their investment income at the moment. Now, the Australian Council of Social Services has argued that the benefits will not be available to those on lower, lower incomes, but I mean, that's wrong. The, a Bankers Trust study released in May 97 and reported in the Financial Review on 22nd of May 97 showed that 79 per cent of all eligible savings income for this rebate is actually held by people earning less than $40,000 a year. And the study also showed that for the, the very lowest income earners, the rebate was worth between 5 and 10 per cent of the tax they paid. For those earning greater than 70,000, they only held 5.5 per cent of the eligible savings, and the rebate was only 0.3 to 0.5 per cent of the tax they paid. So what that means, I mean, uh, the ALP has argued that this is an inequitable measure, but by capping the rebate at $3,000, what that actually does is handicap the affluent who have more eligible savings and make it more generous for those who are on lower incomes. Uh, for example, the same Bankers Trust study showed that those on incomes between $5,400 and, uh, and $20,000, in other words, those who are paying tax but at the lowest level, they will be the largest beneficiaries under this savings rebate. So we need to um, hit on the head this notion from the Labor Party that this is somehow inequitable. What it, what it is is trying to encourage people on, on lower incomes to, actu to actually save. And as most studies have shown, uh, people on about the lower 40 per cent of income, it's often very hard for them to save. So this gives them an added incentive and actually can quite significantly uh, reduce their tax by 5 or 10 per cent of the tax they pay if they take up the savings rebate. Uh, the last issue I'd like to touch on is uh, distributions by private companies. Uh, this was another announcement in the 1997 budget which aimed to deal with loans to shareholders which were not at arm's length, which could be used to avoid income tax. And it also um, considered um, loan guarantees, uh, superannuation and so on as dividend. This was an anti-avoidance measure which was des designed to impact on high wealth individuals who were trying to minimise their tax. But it did apply um, to uh, guarantees of loans and also superannuation payments. Now, the unintended consequence of this measure was that uh, superannuation payments, um, while superannuation payments made by a company to an employee, potentially the employee would pay 15% uh, on the contribution, and that was debited to the member. If they were on an income between over 70,000, 
they would have a additional super surcharge on that and on incomes above 85,000 that, that super surcharge could be as high as 15%. And then if the employee was a, uh, was a, was a shareholder then the amount that the company paid as super would also have to be declared as a dividend. Now, um, the government has recognised this. This was an unintended consequence of the drafting of the legislation, and uh, the announcements that were made by the Assistant Treasurer on the 9th of March were very sensible announcements that still keep in mind the anti-avoidance provisions of this, of this legislation, but have removed some of the unintended consequences. Um, for example, another one uh, that came up in the legislation was that shareholders who borrow from the banks and have a loan guaranteed by the company had to declare the loan as taxable income. Now that's been amended now so that the guarantee, it's only if the shareholder defaults will the guarantee uh, be considered as a dividend. Um, it, it won't apply to superannuation. In fact, the government amendment says that payments made to shareholders or associates in their capacity as employees will not be treated as dividends under the new Division uh, 7A. So in the area of choice of superannuation funding, uh, the coalition is offering employees a true choice of whatever superannuation fund they would like. The savings rebate, it is not inequitable. It is rewarding those who are saving and who have saved in the past. And in the area of uh, distributions by private companies, uh, the government has this was an anti avoidance measure, and I support the anti avoidance measure, but the government has also recognized that in the drafting of the legislation there was an unintended consequence in that it picked up um, a much wider net of employees than was initially intended, and the government amendments are quite sensible. Uh, I commend the bill to the House. Call the honourable member for Reed. Uh, I wish to briefly uh, deal with two aspects of uh, the legislation. The first one uh, relates to the savings rebate. And, uh, the previous speaker, uh, I, I, I guess I was rushing out the door, I caught some uh, reference to figures uh, saying essentially that 79 per cent of those uh, affected from recollection uh, were amongst uh, uh, either low, previously low income earners or people on benefits. Now, I mean, the, fact of, the fact of life in statistics, you can try and uh, manipulate them in any fashion. It's not a question of whether 79 per cent of the money involved comes from that field. It is a question of how many of them throughout Australia are helped. So obviously, given their numbers, the vast majority of the amounts involved will be related to those people. So the figure that nearly 80 per cent of the money involved uh, that is covered by this rebate comes from that, that sector of the population really has to be interrelated with the number of people that uh, uh, theoretically could benefit throughout the whole country. And similarly, the other figures uh, that were cited uh, really have to be looked at in that context as well. The uh, savings rebate, of course, uh, is essentially uh, um, a very firm repudiation of the government's commitment, a commitment on the 2nd of November when uh, the Treasurer stated, we reserve the, he said that basically they were going to continue to implement the co-contribution. And the biggest kind of let out clause he gave himself, the, the, if, you, if you were extremely kind to him, you'd see a very broad possibility, perhaps, that he might be trying to basically diminish the commitment when he said, we reserve the right to vary the me mechanism to provide the most effective and equ equitable delivery. Now, that's what he said. You know, he, said, he said they reserve the right to bring it in in a different fashion, to do it in a different style, to do it in a different manner. That's the, you know, if you're very kind to him, you can see that he might have been saying uh, that there was going to be a different mechanism. But as we all know, uh, in retrospect, uh, they basically threw it out the back door, uh, abolished it totally. And uh, that, of course, uh, was uh, for all the talk about LAW, etc., etc., back in ancient history, uh, in the here and now, in the reality of who is in government in this country, uh, in the uh, observance of what is going on today in Australia, the clear reality is that this government has broken a very firm con uh, commitment in regards to that co-contribution. Uh, this um, essentially will do uh, very little for uh, savings in Australia, and I think we all know that it is a long-term problem uh, over a variety of governments over many decades that uh, the level of national savings has been low. This is going to make no effort, no contribution towards it whatsoever. And as previous speakers have alluded, when we've got a situation in this country it's virtually become a requirement for the office 
basically a, a stipulation you have to, to have to have before you can enter the cabinet of this country and the ministry of this country that you have to actually be involved in trusts. It's very interesting that this measure, this savings rebate, is essentially going to help those people involved in family trusts. Uh, when the government uh, uh, speculates about the fact that they uh, speculate, sorry, about the possibility they might do something about these family trusts, one has to have grave doubts about whether they really have any attention to anything about these kind of loopholes. When we could see in this uh, legislation, as many, as many as 10 people involved in these family trusts could all benefit uh, by as much as $450 a year by the fact that this 15 per cent of the tax that would uh, normally have been payable uh, up, up to $3,000 will go to those people. So the savings uh, rebate is essentially uh, a very firm indication that the government hasn't kept the commitments. It is a measure that's not going to do anything for national savings. It's not going to help us basically reduce the dividend payments, interest payments we have to make overseas. It's not going to allow us to marshal significant amounts of money for national infrastructure projects to do the things that this country needs to do is essentially uh, basically going to help those people on unearned incomes benefit uh, at the expense of those people who up to now were receiving uh, a co-contribution towards superannuation and their uh, retirement uh, uh, income. The other aspect of the legislation I deal with is this uh, uh, measure to supposedly widen choice in this country. And the member for Low, I heard him speak a few moments ago. If there's any person uh, who's been on the other side of politics here, uh, who's had a long-term interest in small business, uh, it's been that uh, member. And I think uh, anyone, even his uh, greatest detractors, would say that uh, he has had the ear, ear of the, sorry, the ear of uh, small business. That he's always uh, raised a significant number of measures in regards to taxation, uh, labour market issues that have come from that sector. And you've heard what he what he said. He's actually got small business in his electorate, and I guess he's a bit of a—he's basically a conduit for a whole lot of other people outside his electorate uh, in regards to these measures. He's saying that small business don't think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. They actually do question whether it's worthwhile. They are saying that essentially, when we have a government that talks about reducing red tape, helping small business, uh, that we have a government that keeps uh, harping about uh, the fact that uh, uh, they are the uh, major source of jobs in this country which alleges that we've got to make sure we can sack people a lot more easily and give them no chance of having a day in court when they're sacked by employers. We've got to do all these things because small business is so desperate. Small business is going to supposedly hire hundreds of thousands of people if they have the right to sack people more easily and to deprive people of the right to try and get their job back. This same government, with all this rhetoric, all these polemics about how they're trying to help small business, is in this measure bringing forward a number of restrictions on small business by making it more difficult for them to operate, by bringing in more red tape. So uh, it really has to be questioned uh, what this is all about. It is not about choice. And uh, I, I again refer the member for Lowe's contribution as an independent member of this House who has not got an axe to grind on behalf of the government or opposition, but who, like myself, represents an electorate with a very significant NESB population. And the point he makes is quite true, that uh, many people in this country uh, have uh, difficulties reading the newspapers, let alone uh, trying to basically uh, have an informed choice in regards to superannuation, in regards to their long-term uh, inc long in income interests. And to basically say, with a very minimal education campaign, uh, I think the figure was uh, 12 million over the next four years for both administration and education, not just for education, 12 million for the entire administration of this, this scheme, this process, and in 1997-98, only $2 million to, to do both of those aims, to accomplish both. That is, less than $2 million is going to be spent in the next year in regards to this education campaign. People are being hit with a new uh, problem. They haven't had previous experience in it, most of them. They don't know much about it. Quite frankly, three-quarters of the House of uh, the Federal Parliament might, would, know, would know very little about uh, the, the intricacies of superannuation uh, that are going to confront these people. There's not only those people with NESB background who are affected by this government's attack on the adult migrant English service and the basic, uh, uh, the basic attempt by this government to deprive people of English uh, uh, instruction and English education. It's not only those people. It's the people who have worked for generations, for, for decades in this country in a period when they didn't require English to be uh, factory hands and uh, to dig roads and to work at James Hardy in the asbestos industry. It's those people as well, but it's also Anglo-Saxon Australians who don't have skills in regards to literacy and numeracy. So what they're saying uh, in July 
uh, that uh, one group of people and uh, uh, a year or two later another group of people are going to be basically uh, confronted with this requirement that they make a choice. And what we're saying is that it's quite evident that there's very little preparation, there's very, real, very little real interest by this government in, in ensuring that uh, choice will be based on information, that choice will be based on knowledge. The uh, previous uh, speakers and, uh, have quite correctly made the point that um, there's also a very grave concern that we'll have a repetition of what did occur in the United Kingdom where the Thatcher government, uh, uh, <coughs> once again by, di driven by ideological needs rather than analysis of what happens and what's, what's beneficial, uh, decide to uh, basically facilitate supposed competition. But what they really did is essentially uh, uh, develop a situation where people selling on commission went out in the marketplace, exploited people who had no knowledge or little knowledge, basically uh, persuade them against their very obvious interests to go into schemes and as many as half a million people uh, uh, changed over and, ma and many of those people made very dubious choices. And you can read British newspapers even last week, uh, uh, The Guardian, references to the huge amounts, billions of dollars uh, involved in that and uh, the losses that people made. The uh, uh, other measures, of course, are the question of, uh, we don't, as I said, we don't only have the question of the information people have. It's, it, the kind of parallel here is basically in areas like the doctor versus the patient, uh, the uh, migrant agent versus the per person who's uh, uh, fearful of being uh, kicked out of Australia and goes to that person for advice in regards to migration uh, matters. That's the kind of parallel we've got here. That's the inequity uh, between the two parties. Uh, an employer uh, essentially putting up this proposition. Uh, to the employee uh, and uh, that employee having uh, very little uh, knowledge of, of the alternatives and having very little real uh, uh, choice. What this is about is clearly an attempt to reduce the uh, power in the marketplace, to reduce the uh, presence of uh, industry funds which have a connection with the trade union movement. Uh, and, uh, they would hope that uh, they would be essentially undermined by people uh, withdrawing from them over the next few years, uh, and uh, that is clearly what's driving this. It is not going to do any, anything for the people that uh, it uh, supposedly uh, seeks to help. Uh, and uh, as uh, we noted, it was quite interesting here. We had uh, the member for Wills uh, cited uh, uh, views by the Heritage Foundation uh, in the United States, a well-known arch-conservative uh, uh, brains trust which said that the current Australian scheme has a lot to uh, basically say for itself and that it should be looked at by the United States and other system. It's quite interesting. Uh, he, he said in the way through that uh, it's not really a, a, an organisation that would uh, tend to be associated with the Labor Party side of politics. It's quite uh, fascinating that in the course of this debate we actually had a, uh, a Conservative member come into the uh, debate and actually cite the Heritage Foundation on other fronts. So it's, that's indicative if they're kind of saying that uh, there are real problems with, uh, uh, well, sorry, that there are very major beneficial aspects of the Australian system, then perhaps we should uh, sit up and listen. So uh, Labor, of course, uh, is saying that there should be a, a, a lot firmer uh, education process, that the start of the date of choice should not be until uh, July 1st, 2000, for both new and existing employees, ensuring that default funds contain specific investment choice and insurance cover features to protect those employees who do not make an active choice from winding up in an inappropriate fund. Labor also says that there should be the outlawing of commission-based sales of products. And as I say, we've cited the phenomenon of the United Kingdom, what's happened there. It, Labor also says that, uh, uh, that there should be a removal of Clause 32V, which overrides industrial awards, uh, the redefinition of the definition of industry-based fund to include a requisite that such funds operate on a not-for-profit basis. Once again, uh, that we are opposed to this government's intention to, in another way, undermine industry funds by widening uh, the definition so that uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry can get in the operation. And that, in regards to superannuation, we've seen that this is part of a wider pattern. In the last uh, day or so, the government's put legislation through this field to take an independent arbiter, to take an independent umpire out of uh, superannuation matters. And once again, in this field, that's something that's needed someone that can come in and basically decide when there are disputes, and in a very unequal uh, contest, of course, between employers and employees. What uh, that other measure in superannuation is going to do is to deprive 
a large number of people, casuals, people earning uh, uh, less than uh, $450 a week of uh, any superannuation contribution whatsoever. So this legislation, as I say in summing up, it's not about choice, it's not about uh, helping employees, it's not about uh, doing anything for, for, for Australian savings, it's not about helping the person in the street. It is essentially driven by a determination to make sure that there aren't industry funds, there aren't funds in this country which might, uh, hopefully, be more inclined to do things of national requirement, to do things in regards to national infrastructure, than funds driven by other concepts. What this is about is, is about ideology, about a determination to essentially replace those funds. It is going to increase cost to the uh, funds themselves in regards to advertising, getting out in the marketplace, competing, keeping a hold of their, of their section of the market from predatory moves by other uh, funds. It's going to increase the administration costs. It's going to essentially make that small businesses going to have a lot larger costs in uh, basically transferring people every, every which way. Uh, people, as people have said earlier, um, people in this country uh, change their jobs more often now. Uh, the career path of people staying in jobs 20 to 30 years is no longer there. And this government, I've got to con concede, has played a very decisive role in increasing insecurity in industry in this country, mm -hmm. making it easier for employers to facilitate terminations, making it easier for people to be retrenched. So we've got a situation where more and more people are going to be looking at the possibility and having the need to change funds. The average Australian these days, the figure is they move house 17 times. Once again, that is going to have an impact. So this. Uh, uh, legislation should be condemned and the Labor amendments do go towards making sure that people have a real choice in regards to what they do, not a fake choice based on ideology. I call the honourable member for Blacksland. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I concur with um, the member for Reid in his criticisms of this bill before us today and with the support that he gave to the opposition amendments in relation to this. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to start today with one aspect of this bill, which covers a range of areas in relation to the savings rebate, and then continue to look in, choice, uh, in turn at the question of superannuation and choice. In regard to the savings rebate, I have a substantial concern in terms of where this is going to in terms of who will really benefit in relation to the measures provided regarding the savings rebate and what the real intention of the government is in relation to this. The savings rebate is in fact a device which lowers the tax for all types of unearned income. That's interest, dividends, trust and partnership distributions, rent and so on, and superannuation pensions and eligible termination payments. So this savings rebate scheme, which is proposed in this bill by the government, where it's put into place here in this amendment bill, has a specific operation on unearned income. So we're not dealing here with people working hard, putting in their eight hours a day, and then dealing with their situation and proving that. This goes to unearned income, including interest, dividends, trust and partnership distributions. We know there's a significant problem in that trust area with income splitting and so on. This exacerbates that problem in terms of the budget. Less money will be coming back to the budget because of what's provided in relation to the savings rebate in this bill. It won't ameliorate the problem of national savings. National savings will not be increased by these proposals, but they'll in fact be decreased. It will be a move from national savings to private savings. Now that, of course, lies in conjunction with most of the moves by this coalition government to move from national benefit to private benefit. The reward here is for those who are living off savings rather than rewarding for people in engaging in savings, except for those that relate to superannuation contributions. The thrust of these measures is not to fix the problems we have with a key area that was addressed by the former Labor government, how to increase national savings. And I want to look at this particular measure, where there's an increase in private savings but a diminution of national savings, because it forms a part of peace with the question of superannuation 
and the superannuation schemes that were operated and extended during the Labor period of government and what has happened since then in regard to superannuation <coughs> based on what this federal government has done. The Labor <coughs> model in terms of superannuation was extended over a long period of time. The former Treasurer took a number of decisions which fundamentally changed the impact, import and extent of superannuation provision in this country. When we came to office in March of 1983, the extent of coverage was largely limited to government employees and those in management positions in the private sector, together with those in the small business sector. Through a series of reforms, Labor brought superannuation coverage to a large part of the workforce which had never had that coverage previously. And they did so through the superannuation guarantee and through award superannuation. It was, in fact, the intention of the government to continue that expansion and to move to greater percentages, uh, both from employees and also from industry, in terms of putting into superannuation savings for employees. So it was a drive towards increasing national savings <coughs> through superannuation and a drive to increase that through expanding the coverage to most of the workforce and increasing the percentage of coverage for those people in the workforce by their own contributions and contributions from employers. Now, in that situation, we had a number of, um, <coughs> through the awards, operation of the award system, we had a number of industry superannuation bodies which developed over more than a decade during Labor's period of office. And this bill seeks to diminish the value and extent and the work of those industry superannuation bodies. Because where this bill talks about choice in relation to superannuation funds and employees can put their superannuation into, a direct target is the existing industry funds. This goes to a question of how those funds are seen by members of the coalition and essentially they're seen ideologically. The fact that because of award conditions, those major funds are supported by uh, the unions. There's representation on the management of those funds from the unions as well as the employers. And there are many billions of dollars in superannuation being covered by those funds, where the unions are directly part of the supervision of that. Ideologically, a coalition is against that. Now, in fact, there have been a number of decisions taken by the government that have attempted to completely redraw the superannuation system that existed under Labor. One of those decisions was to abandon Labor's 3 plus 3 per cent co-contribution and pay part of it in the form of a savings rebate, which, as I said at the outset, will do nothing to increase overall public or private savings levels. Secondly, the introduction of retirement savings accounts, which are low return products which result in lower retirement incomes for many of the people who use them. And in the first iteration of what the Treasurer intended in regard to this, where he had five choices of fund and retirement savings accounts were one of those choices, the probability was a great number of people would be enforced into those low return funds. Now, on the 25th of November 1997, from memory, the Treasurer put out a statement which he indicated that that provision would be taken out. So we're, on, we're from a choice of five down to a choice of four different types of funds that employers could put their money into. That, I would think, is a bonus because the probability that people would be driven into those low income funds is now that much less. Thirdly, another major change was made by this government in terms of the introduction of the superannuation surcharge tax, which uh, the um, member for Wills has indicated previously in a speech that he gave on the 25th of March, could be likened to being as successful as the Prime Minister's guidelines and the Ministerial Code of Conduct. A direct result of bringing in that surcharge is that a lot of people on <coughs> incomes higher than $70,000 have chosen to go out of superannuation coverage 
and to provide for themselves in other ways. The fourth major change is the inclusion of superannuation assets in the means test for over 55s. That will see many low and middle income earners, income older Australians, having to line up for the age pension after they've run down their hard-earned retirement savings. So in all of those four areas, the coalition has made major changes. Here, directly in terms of the bill before us, they seek to change the emphasis that there's been on industry or award superannuation funds and substitute choice. Now, choice is a key and central word for the coalition, and it has been throughout the time the Liberal and National parties have been in existence. The Senate Select Committee on Superannuation brought down a report in March of this year called Choice of Fund. And a number of the provisions um, that the senators spoke about are contained directly within this bill. The Labor senators had a different view than the government senators. And the Labor senators can be joined by the member for Wills, our spokesman in regard to this, to say that we think an alternative model should be put in place and our amendments go to that. Labor's convinced, based on the experience of our time in government, that superannuation is an extraordinarily important vehicle for increasing national savings and increasing the capacity that individual employees have to live a better retirement than would otherwise be the case before our schemes came into place. So Labor's laid down a series of principles in terms of choice of fund and those principles I'll go to now. Labor supportive of the principle of employee choice of fund, provided that any model meets certain underlying principles. One, employees should benefit from choice. Two, employers should not be disadvantaged by it. Three, choice should be consistent with broader retirement incomes policy. And four, individuals must be able to make an informed choice. Fifthly, the choice of funds should be based on true employee choice and not driven either by ideology or vested interest. Sixthly, choice should not be forced on either employees or employers. Seventhly, choice should be simple to understand, administer and should not place onerous compliance burdens on employer or employees. And lastly, an independent arbitrator should be able to resolve choice of fund disputes between employers and employees. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, Labor in fact believes that if these fundamental principles in regard to choice were fully in place, and they're not in place in relation to this amendment bill that we see before us, then choice could be successful in the Australian superannuation system as we know it now and it would avoid the disasters that have occurred in other countries, in particular in Chile and the United Kingdom, where provisions such as are contained in this amendment bill were put into place in those countries. And those provisions meant that people had much lower retirement incomes than would otherwise have been the case. Now, in terms of alternative models, there was a former member of this parliament, the former member for Bradfield, who, prior to his exiting the parliament, was a coalition spokesman in relation to retirement and superannuation matters. Mr David Connolly, the former member for Bradfield, did speak about a choice of fund model. and He spoke about that widely within the community. And When he spoke in relation to that, he put up another alternative. That alternative has not been followed by this coalition government. because When Mr Connolly was speaking about it, he envisaged that super funds should be made to offer mandatory investment choice options from within the fund, so that where you have an existing industry superannuation fund, instead of the fund managers determining how they would mix the investment in property, in bonds, interest um, gaining uh, investments and also in the share market, it should be open to any individual employee to determine on the basis of the advice that he got from uh, a finance advisor 
that he could have a different mix. Now, in the private sector and in funds such as the 23, uh, 23FB funds, which are available with the GIO and which were available previously under the Members of Parliament Staff Act, an employee can determine what the mix will be. So they can make an assessment in terms of whether they want to have more in the share market, more in the property market, whether they want to change and mix the balance, or whether they chose to have that entirely managed by the Government Insurance Office of New South Wales. BT and a number of other funds offer just that flexibility. Most people uh, continue to choose a, man a fully managed aspect because they don't have a lot of background in this area. However, Mr Connolly suggested that, that approach should be taken. Instead of that, the government has chosen choice of different funds. And primarily, it's been a question of the employer's choice and not the employee's choice. Now, the great change we saw in terms of what the Treasurer proposed previously and what he proposed on 25 November 1997 is not just the cut of five choices down to four, but because of the pressure that was put on him by employers, it is a change in terms of question of onus. Employers were concerned that they could be liable if they made the wrong determinations in relation to which fund an employer should go into, and then employees could in fact take action against them for them being not careful enough in terms of choice of funds. That was one of the reasons the RSAs went out, but secondly, it's a reason for a major change. The onus in this bill is on the employee and not the employer. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, that change from David Connolly's model to the model of choice we see as before us in this bill, Labor argues that there is a much simpler and more effective way of doing it. The Labor choice model provides something that is direct, open, simple and easy. And if I can go specifically to what Labor argues for here in terms of our amendment. That better choice model could be in fact as one in existence. The New South Wales Industrial Relations Act of 1991 allows employees to have superannuation contributions paid into the fund of their choice, approved by the employer, despite any award or agreement. So if we were to adopt this model, whereas currently primarily the industry superannuation funds are at the behest of the employer and also in certain cases the majority of of employees. Under this model successfully operating in New South Wales, there would be a choice of fund for employees and they would be able to choose their own fund whether there's an award or an agreement in place. What simple steps have been outlined for the member for, by the member for Wills in relation to signing up to this? The first proposition is that the employee makes a nomination in writing and signs it. Second, that the fund is a complying fund. The third, the employer provides written approval of the nomination. And fourthly, the employer retains a copy of the nominations. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is an entirely simple and straightforward process. So simple, so straightforward, so practical and working so well in New South Wales that it should be adopted here and the government should withdraw the proposals they have in relation to choice of fund and accept the amendment that Labor has put forward today. It's simple and it works. The provisions that the government has within this bill, where they say that there should be choice of fund, in fact still go to choices for employers and not choices for the employees. So I would argue here that we could substitute complexity, uncertainty, we could substitute a dramatic onus on the employee who is not in a position to make an educated, discerning choice about what fund he, might, he or she may choose to put their superannuation savings into. And he's not in that position in particular because the funds simply aren't available to run an adequate education campaign 
in conjunction with the provisions of this bill. And that's already been indicated by a number of speakers in the past. It is a very real problem. So, In regard to the two matters that I've been dealing with in relation to this bill, and the bill covers a large number of provisions, first in regard to the savings rebate. The savings rebate concentrates on unearned income. It concentrates effectively on moving from national savings to private savings. In regard to superannuation choice, because our preferred model, the one existing in New South Wales, isn't acceptable to the government, that simple, straightforward New South Wales model, choice for employees is very limited. And it's limited even though they have four major choices placed before them because they're not in a position, given the complexity of what they're asked to look at, to make a readily informed choice. There is here another agenda, and that agenda relates directly to the move from ensuring national savings and ensuring the future of people providing funds to their superannuation future. That move means that people will have less attachment to saving for their future through superannuation. Mr Deputy Speaker, if the government was to rethink their position, if they were to adopt the alternative model provided by Labor, a simple, straightforward, balanced and sensible model, it would provide true freedom of choice for employees and true guarantees that they would be able to put their savings aside for themselves in the future either in an industry fund or in any other fund and be absolutely and completely certain that those funds would be run well and properly and that their choice Order. could be entirely the satisfied. The honourable member for Black's Land time has expired. I call the honourable member for Curtin. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, before uh, getting into the nitty-gritty of this legislation, I, I must confer my backhanded uh, congratulations on the government for its success in cramming into one bill so many substantial and complex changes to the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936. In doing so, uh, in my doing so, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I offer the opinion that the government has set a new standard in the hijacking of, uh, of parliamentary debate in the House of Representatives because the breadth of the changes that deserve thorough, uh, thorough scrutiny simply can't be adequately dealt with in the time allotted for the second reading. I'm certain that this is no accident on the part of those who drafted the bill and others who pressed for the inclusion of some of its provisions. Add to that, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, the uh, fact that the minister at the table does not have carriage of this legislation, so won't be summing up the second reading debate. The, the gentleman responsible presumably will do so without the benefit of listening to the debate of myself and my colleagues on all sides of the House. There have been no advisers in the box for much of this debate, so they won't be able to bring the absent minister with carriage up to date. And I suggest to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that, that is disdain bordering on contempt for this parliament. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am particularly concerned about the provisions of Schedule 8. The contents of this bill were not made public until more than six months after the initial announcement in the 97-98 budget papers. The uncertainty that that delay caused was compounded by the fact that there were other measures announced about franking credits uh, on budget night that are yet to be put into any form of legislation. The Taxation Institute of Australia, the TIA, has, has called on the government to remove Schedule 8 from this bill and to draft new legislation that deals with the proposed changes to franking credits in their entirety so that the matter can be dealt with in a sensible, in, to use their words, sensible, coordinated and cohesive fashion. Just this morning, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've seen another bill which includes uh, amendments to franking credits brought into the House. The view of the TIA uh, seems to contain a perfectly rational recommendation, Mr Deputy Speaker, and the government stands condemned for, condemned for its failure to act on it. So there are 
four schedules out of a total of ten that I intend to speak to today, and they are schedules four, five, eight and nine. Schedule 9 seeks to incorporate new Division 7A into the 1936 Act. This division is being introduced in an effort to ensure that all credits, loans and advances by private companies to shareholders are deemed to be assessable in dividends to the extent that they are realised or unrealised company profits. There are both strengths and weaknesses inherent in this proposal, uh, but before I elaborate on the specifics. I wish to make an observation about the general nature of change proposed in Schedule 9. Less than 12 months ago, the Tax Law Improvement Team, uh, that's the TLIP team, finalised the new and arguably improved version of parts of the 1936 Act. Members uh, may recall that the purpose behind this 1997 revision was to produce tax legislation that was more streamlined and simple to understand than the original and therefore more user-friendly for tax experts and the general public. One has to wonder then why the amendments in Schedule 9 proposed in this bill have not been made to the 1997 Income Tax Assessment Act but rather only to the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936. As Mr Colin Munro, partner with Dakin's Gra uh, Graham and James law firm in Western Australia stated in a recent address, quote, it is a pity that this legislation matrix has been used, unquote. Mr Munro pointed out that while section 108 will not be repealed by these amendments, it's no longer relevant to tax law if new division 7A applies to private company distri distributions. Why not get rid of it? This is also the position of the TIA. Madam Deputy Speaker, which argues for the termination of section 108 on the grounds that if there is residual operation other than for uh, December 1997 events, quote, taxpayers will be left in confusion and there will be no certainty, unquote. Despite the, fa uh, the fact that it is section 108 that is most familiar to the tax fraternity, those bureaucrats responsible for the drafting of this legislation chose to ignore them and have proceeded to implement change that undermines the impetus of the tax simplification project. That is plainly ridiculous, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker. There are three outcomes of this schedule that warrant closer attention by the government. Those outcomes are the potential for a double taxation effect in the debiting of franking accounts an increase in company compliance costs and the reduced tax effectiveness of corporate, uh, corporate trusts. Let me first uh, address the issue of a more costly compliance regime for Australian business. While the government would have us believe that any increase in compliance costs will be minimal, the explanatory memorandum predicts an increase of around $2 million in the 1997-98 financial year that is disputed by industry. At present, section 108 provides for the Commissioner of Taxation to use his or her discretion on the tax treatment of loans to shareholders during an audit. In contrast, this bill will automatically treat the above-mentioned distribution as a dividend. While increased certainty in a tax ruling is desirable, Madam Deputy Speaker, Mr Munro points out that the new requirements for loan formality will also, quote, undoubtedly lead to increased compliance costs for taxpayers, unquote. He disputes the government's claim that it's high wealth individuals intent on minimising their tax obligations who will be hit hardest by this measure, but rather suggests that, and I'm quoting him, it is small business who generally have a need to access funds from private companies for private purposes, unquote, and who will therefore bear the brunt of compliance. The introduction of, a, of new Division 7A will bring a greater degree of certainty and objectivity in the definition of when, a company, when company payments to shareholders are deemed to be dividends and when they are not. That's to be commended. However, the redefining of many key words and phrases will mean that Taxpayers will have to reflect changes in the value of assets and liabilities by adjustments to their accounting records and systems. 
Mr Munro also noted, this may be simple enough to do in the case of easily comparable assets, such as marketable securities, but what about real estate? He also asks whether shares in other private companies will also present valuation di difficulties as this will certainly see an increase in compliance costs. It's a bit rich for the government, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is yet to fulfil its commitment to a 50 per cent reduction in the compliance burden on businesses to actually be exacerbating that same burden by successive taxation legislation. The issue of double taxation or the doubling up effect that Mr Munro referred to in his address on 29 January 1998 is also rele relevant to Schedule 8. Under the amendments in this section, all amounts treated as dividends will not be frankable dividends. Further, the deemed amount will create a franking debit, a franking debit to a private company. According to Mr Munro, quote, this is another example of doubling up, which again evidences the attitude of officialdom to taxation, unquote. The government's proposed changes to uh, the distributions from private companies is also rising, uh, raising eyebrows among some members of the elite team of, uh, of tax experts who are providing feedback to the government on the tax law in improvement project. One uh, member of that team, Mr John Kirkwood, a senior partner in taxation at Ernst Young, has labelled this a schedule of overkill, this schedule an overkill. Mr Kirkwood observed that while it's one thing to treat an amount as if it is a dividend, it is quite another to deny the recipient the benefits of the formal payment of a dividend. On the one hand, we have the very logical argument put by Mr Kirkwood suggesting that, quote, if the payment should be treated as a dividend, then it should also be a dividend for all purposes, including the utilisation of frankable credits, unquote. On the other hand, we have uh, Treasury and the Australian Taxation Office, the ATO, wanting to bob either way. The summation that this legislation is just another example of the ATO dominating the legislative process with its blunderbuss approach, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, is right on the mark. It was the case with trust losses, with the superannuation surcharge, with the R&D syndication, and now the ATO is at it again. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear the coalition's position on this issue and whether it now acknowledges that this legislation could see the doubling up effect of the debiting of franking accounts. I also ask that the government come clean on the proposed application of this provision to benefits that would ordinarily be subject to fringe benefits tax and to superannuation contributions. Does the coalition really expect to be able to tax these benefits as if they were dividends? Rather than working in tandem with uh, the FBT rules, uh, this legislation will supersede them, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, and creates an untenable situation, one that must be corrected. As for the impact of uh, new Division 7A on trusts, one Western Australian legal uh, practitioner has this to say. All in all, this line of approach tends very substantially to atrophy the discretionary trust and indeed make it unworkable. It's clear that uh, the amendments proposed here are consistent with the ongoing attack by Treasury and the ATO on perfectly legitimate tax structures, uh, trust structures. Owing to time restrictions, of course, I don't intend to dwell on this point, except to restate my long-held position that until Australians embrace a thorough overhaul of our tax system and until there's greater parity between the top marginal personal income tax rate and the company tax rate, vehicles like trusts will always pose a potential threat to revenue. Another alarming aspect of the proposed changes to the franking of dividends and other distributions is the fact that the content of this legislation goes way beyond what was first foreshadowed at the time of the 1997-98 budget. Section 8.1 of the explanatory memorandum tells us that the threshold for the new general anti-avoidance provision will employ an quote, other than incidental purpose unquote, test, which will have a much broader application than the current dominant 
purpose minimum. As Mr Gordon Thring, a member of the Australian Society of Certified Practicing Accountants, claims, the ATO is going to have a big stick to apply against a transaction which may be a quite normal tra uh, commercial transaction. The upshot of that is, is that it's not just those who might, and I stress the word might, be abusing the current streaming provisions or be caught by these changes. Legitimate commercial transactions, including every distribution to shareholders other than a straight cash dividend, could be hit under the proposed wide-ranging powers. One tax manager has labelled uh, this move a quote, tightening of Part 4A of the 1936 Tax Act by stealth, unquote, and went on to observe that sound commercial transactions that satisfy prescriptive areas of the law can now be subject to a new veto power of the Commissioner. Mr Bob Bryant, Executive Director of the Corporate Tax Association, says that the new general anti-avoidance measures are, quote, much wider than is necessary to address the perceived abuses. The Tax Institution of Australia accords with that position and submits that these rules should be redrafted in a fashion that addresses a mischief perceived by the government and ATO, but not in such a way as to effectively stifle normal everyday transactions. The tax community is understandably uncomfortable with the trust us uh, the trust us style of approach, Madam Deputy Speaker, that characterises this proposed new provision. It's not acceptable that the Commissioner should have such widespread discretionary powers to decide if and when the anti-avoidance provision will be applied. The government should be averse, should be averse to delegating legislative power to the Tax Commissioner, and that yet this is essentially what's being sanctioned in this bill. One doesn't have to improve the certainty of the Tax Act by increasing the opportunity for the Tax Commissioner to form subjective determinations rather than working within set parameters. Mr Munro is also reported as having said in a recent statement to the Western Australian newspaper that the example set out in the explanatory memorandum of how the new provisions will apply to trusts is quite frightening. He notes that uh, because the extensive new powers will affect any person with an interest in a share, an interest in a share, this could be adverse. Uh, this could adversely impact on anyone who's a trust beneficiary. Under the government's plan, trust beneficiaries will not be able to utilise franking credits of shares owned by the trust unless they have an underlying interest. Importantly, discretionary trust, trust beneficiaries can get the benefit of franking credits on the condition that the trust nominates to revert to a family trust. Now that's an interesting proposition because if unit trust beneficiaries do adopt the family trust structure, they may well benefit in the case of retaining franking credit, but they will play right into the hands of the tax office in another respect. Anyone who's taken an interest in the coalition's attempts to stop the so-called rorting of trust losses will recall that many tax experts are con concerned about the restrictive definition of family as described in the Taxation Laws Amendment Trust Losses and Other Deductions Bill of 1997. Specifically, individuals who are dependents for superannuation purposes and who could have responsibilities under the Child Support Assessment Act and may benefit from an inheritance from a deceased estate will be deemed to be not members of a family trust, according to the government's definition of family. The government's treatment of trust losses will see small businesses being obliged to decide whether to remove key family members from having stakes in the beneficial ownership of businesses or lose potential tax losses incurred during downturns in business, periods of downturn in their business. In allowing discretionary trusts to continue to benefit from franking credits if they adopt the more restrictive family trust structure, the government appears to be making a concession to small business. The reality is that the clear winners here will not be small business proprietors, but rather the Treasury and the ATO. As one leading adviser suggested, quote, many companies are frustrated that the likely outcome of any short-sighted legislation will only be a large legal bill in restructuring the group with no lasting benefit to the shareholders. In an article in the Australian Financial Review, uh, Review edition of 30 July, 1997. 
Mr Neil Wilson, a tax partner at Cooper's Library, and outlined yet another consequence of this measure. He noted that shareholders of public companies using dividend access shares for legitimate purposes would be caught up in the terms of Schedule 8. Mr Wilson is reported to have said that most companies were, quote, actually moving tax within a group to the holding company, not trying to differentially stream credits to shareholders. Mr Wilson went on to write that unless a distinction is made for access shares within wholly owned company groups, perfectly legitimate transactions would be denied the tax benefit of franking dividends. While it's anticipated that ordinary share purchase won't be targeted by the Commissioner of Taxation under the proposed rules, the doubt that has been created by such extensive provisions will do nothing to encourage investment in Australia by ordinary Australians and will do a great deal to dissuade it, Madam Deputy Speaker. Because I intend to make further remarks during the detailed stages on, on other schedules, I'll simply finish on the note that, for reasons uh, either already touched on or to be given, given later in the detailed stage, I call on the government to slow down the passage of relevant schedules in this bill, to revisit the concerns of industry about distributions from companies, the tax treatment of franking dividends and the choice of superannuation funds, and to revise this legislation as is subsequently necessary after that re-examination. Order. The question is the bill be now read a second time. To this that the bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition has moved as an amendment that all words after that be admitted with a view to substituting other words, which have been supplemented by leave by the Honourable Member for Wills. The question now is the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like to make uh, a number of comments in regard to the summing up of uh, this uh, important debate. Uh, this bill has a number of important aspects to it. And, uh, first, it implements two key government uh, initiatives, choice of superannuation funds and the savings rebate, which both commence on 1 July 1998. Uh, secondly, it builds on the government's program of reducing compliance costs for small businesses by introducing a CGT assets register and changes to the withholding tax arrangements. Thirdly, it implements two important 97 budget announcements which enhance the integrity of the tax system relating to franking credit trading and dividend streaming and private company loans. The savings rebate will particularly benefit Australians' families, older Australians who have saved for their retirement, and individuals who have built up their businesses and derive a return. The rebate will apply to undeducted superannuation contributions made by employees and the self-employed and net personal income from savings and investment, including net business income, up to an annual cap of $3,000. In the first year, it will apply at a transitional rate of 7.5 per cent and increase to 15 per cent thereafter. This will deliver a tax saving of up to $450 per year. And I do know, uh, in conversation with people within my own electorate on this issue, that uh, there are many people who are welcoming those proposals. The rebate will provide an incentive to save in a way which is fair allowing individuals to choose the form most suited to their needs, recognising that individuals have to save for life cycle needs as well as for retirement. The bill also implements the government's reforms to choice of fund arrangements. They are designed to give employees greater choice and control over their superannuation savings, which in turn give them greater sense of ownership of their savings. The arrangements will increase competition and efficiency in the superannuation industry, leading to improved returns on superannuation savings. I will be moving amendments in the committee stages to make some further minor improvements to the choice of fund arrangements, largely of a technical nature. The bill introduces an asset register for capital gains tax purposes. This will eliminate the need for taxpayers to keep source documents for lengthy periods of time 
and will reduce the compliance costs for all taxpayers with capital gains tax obligations. The new three-tiered system for remittance obligations under reportable payment systems ARPS, pay as you earn and the prescribed payment system PPS, will give small remitters the option to remit these payments on a quarterly basis rather than a monthly basis. <clears throat> this will provide over 300,000 small businesses with the opportunity to defer the remittance of $500 million in withheld amounts in 98-99. Mr Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is certainly a very substantial number of business operators who will benefit from this. The bill also amends the Income Tax Assessment Act 36 to ensure that payments and loans made by a private company to a shareholder or a shareholder's associate are treated as assessable dividends to the extent that there, there are realised or unrealised profits in the company. I will be moving amendments on this measure in the committee stages. This measure, together with the introduction of a general anti-avoidance rule and anti-streaming measures, which form part of the 97 budget me measures to prevent franking credit trading and dividend streaming, are designed to protect the integrity of the tax system. The bill will implement two further budget measures relating to tax deductibility of expenses incurred in contesting election to the Constitutional Convention and donations to the National Nurses Memorial Trust. In addition, the bill gives effect to part of the status of forces agreement between Australia and Malaysia and to allow certain personal effects to be brought into Australia sales tax free by members of a Malaysian visiting force. And finally, of course, the bill makes some technical changes to the income tax law. Now, the opposition speakers, Madam Deputy Speaker, have made really a number of outrageous remarks in their comments on this bill, particularly their comments on savings policy. Labor's record on national savings is really indescribable or is abysmal. And let's just sort of go back over that. Now, Labor speakers. Uh, failed to note, for example, that under Labor, Australia's national savings rate reached, apart from the World Wars and the Great Depression, its lowest level since Federation, since 1901. They, they, did, not, they did not mention the uh, $10.3 billion budget deficit, and they left when they were, that, what they left us when they were thrown out of office. And uh, not only that, of course, uh, many of us uh, are very much aware of the uh, 70 billion of deficits they ran up in the last five years of office. Now, that is a huge amount of money, and for members of the opposition to come in here and to, uh, well, there'd be a dis description which we could use, but let's say to come here and to uh, vigorously debate this issue uh, in regard to savings really doesn't stack up with the history of members of the opposition when they are in government. Nor did they mention that general government net debt ballooned from 4 to 19 per cent of GDP under the last 13 years of the Labor government. And they are now making outrageous unfunding spending commitments which would blow the budget back out of the water. So, to talk about savings really is something which I think the members of the opposition have been doing with uh, hopefully tongue in cheek and not really meaning what they're saving, saying. Now, we say that the savings rebate is fair, it is equitable, unlike the Labor's never delivered law broken promises of co contributions. And I want to uh, underline that. We believe it is fair, that it is equitable and it will be beneficial to the overall uh, structure of this industry in Australia. Now, <clears throat> in regard to the savings rebate and why we say uh, uh, it is equitable, I make the following points. And really, Labor in this area, or the opposition spokespeople in this area, certainly have uh, really no right whatsoever to talk about equity. They oppose the biggest move by a government in recent history to improve the equity of Australia's retirement income system by their opposition to the superannuation charge. And like that superannuation charge was uh, placed on those people of high income earnings, and yet they opposed that. 
Now, the super surcharge vastly improves the equity of our super system. The bulk of the savings rebate will flow to people earning less than 40,000 per annum. Now, that's 70. I think it's 70 per cent of Australian wage earners are under 40,000. So this really is a benefit flowing to the overwhelming bulk of the Australian wage earners. In contrast, not one of these people need to pay the super charge, the super surcharge. The opposition has been highly misleading also in their comments about the benefits that the battlers will get from the rebate. About one third of wage and salary er earners' earnings less than $40,000 make personal super contributions at an average of around $1,300. <coughs> that is, they already passed the test for getting a $195 rebate. And of course, we've given them the opportunity to get an even higher rebate by increasing their contributions. And for those who aren't making personal super contributions, they have a big incentive to do so. Each dollar they put in will give them back 15 cents. Not only that, six million Australians will benefit from this rebate, the vast bulk of whom are low and middle income earners. For a person on the lowest tax bracket, the rebate means that the person pays just 5 per cent tax on their savings income up to the cap. For a person on the highest tax bracket, the rebate drops their tax rate on saving income up to the cap to 32 per cent. Labor never once gave an incentive for personal savings, and the savings rebate is a good measure, a fair measure and a welcome measure by the overwhelming majority of Australians. Now, in regard to choice of funds, Labor's policy on choice of fund are equally poor are equally bad. Labor had 13 years to provide for choice of fund and they never delivered. Again, I guess it was one of these, they're going to do it in the 14th. And I think the Australian people woke up to the fact that they were never going to do some of these things. And that's why there was a change of government in 1996. Now, the opposition, the Labor opposition, want to stop us from delivering our reforms which were election commitments. Uh, make no mistake, that is the real Labor agenda, and uh, people can come in here and wax lyrical about uh, various issues on this matter, but that is uh, the agenda of the Labor opposition. Labor's choice model guarantees no choice to workers at all. Labor's attitude to choice... Labor's attitude to... Con choice continues to be the old Labor model of paternalism where workers can't be allowed to look after their own interests. The government and the unions have to tell them what they can and they can't do. And I can remember back in 1984-86 uh, in that period when uh, many people in Australia were being told there was only one superannuation scheme that they could join and uh, that was dictated to them and they were appalled. They were absolutely appalled that there was no choice. And I can say to the Australian people, the proposals being put by the Labor Party now are no different. They want to corral the Australian people to determine where their superannuation goes. We are a government who wants to give people choice. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are opposed to the amendments moved by uh, the opposition, and I commend the bill to the House. <clears throat> Order. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has moved as an amendment that all words after that be admitted with a view to, to substituting other words. The immediate question is that the words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. I intend to put that. All of those of that opinion say aye, against no. I think the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. I'd ask members to take their seats. The original question was that this bill be now read a second time. To this, the Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition has moved as an amendment. All words after that be admitted with a view to substituting other words. The immediate question is now that words proposed to be admitted stand part of the question. Tell us for the ayes, the member for Karagamite, Fisher and Riverina. Tell us for the noes, Bruce Fowler and Maribyrnong.
Order. The results of the division are ayes 80, noes 38. The question therefore resolves in the affirmative. The question now is, the bill be now read a second time. I intend to put it. All of those of that opinion say aye against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. I understand that it is the wish of the House to take the bill as a whole. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Member for Wills. Committee stage. <coughs> yeah, but I think it will probably be after the question. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. I uh, seek leave of the House to move opposition amendments 1 to 10 as circulated together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Member for Wills. Thank you, Madam uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, these amendments, uh, taken together, set out our uh, concerns regarding the government's choice of fund proposals. Uh, <coughs> I make it clear at the outset that uh, we don't, do not, in, uh, in moving these amendments, uh, I make it clear at the outset that we don't intend to proceed with Amendment Number Seven. But I, I move uh, the other amendments from one to ten. Uh, which have been circulated. And in so moving those amendments, I think the first area that I'd like to speak to is uh, amendment number three, which relates to the issue of timing. Now, the Senate Select Committee, which dealt with this issue, received an extraordinary amount of evidence in support of delaying the start date for choice. And the arguments uh, for delaying the start date include the need to allow additional time for comprehensive education campaign, superannuation providers to prepare administration arrangements, employers to prepare for choice of fund, and the development of adequate and appropriate <coughs> disclosure standards. Now, <coughs> the advantages in the proposal that we put forward for the 1st of July 2000 are that, first, this is what the industry wants. Second, this is what employers want, and third, this is what employees through their representatives want. And what we see is a situation where the government itself has set for existing employees a start date of the 1st of July 2000, and we would say that the confusion of having two separate start dates for new and existing employees is unnecessary and unwanted. Secondly, it ought to be said that the superannuation industry is still reeling from the changes uh, enforced on it when the government uh, rammed through the superannuation surcharge tax. Now, given the importance of choice of fund, it is essential that any teething problems have an adequate lead time to be sorted out before choice of fund takes effect. Third, it would allow the government, in consultation with industry groups, in consultation with consumer groups, to conduct a comprehensive and targeted education campaign. Fourth, a delay would enable appropriate disclosure standards to be settled, a most important area about which we have so far heard precious little. We are also concerned that choice of fund is going to generate a lot of complaints in future from disgruntled employees and, indeed, disgruntled employers. Now, we have had the federal court uh, decision in the Bishop case effectively gutting the powers of the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. Now, it is absolutely vital that the issue of access to a cheap, fast, independent complaints body gets resolved before choice begins. So, <clears throat> for all those reasons, we believe that the government's timing is uh, almost bizarre. The 1st of July this year and that there is a need for a significant change to the proposed start date. And I draw attention to the, Australians, uh, the, the, the editorial in the Australian newspaper of the 2nd of March with, concerning the issue of timing, and it said, if the government remains set on its course, it would provide ammunition for critics who believe the member choice initiatives are motivated more by a desire to water down union-affiliated industry fund involvement in superannuation than by a genuine wish to empower individual savers. Madam Deputy Speaker, I point out that uh, there was a survey conducted by GIO uh, in December of last year which revealed, most disturbingly, 
that the vast majority of employees are blissfully ignorant about the fact that choice of fund is about to be introduced. That survey revealed that 78 per cent of employees and indeed 42 per cent of employers who are going to be forced to uh, participate in this scheme are totally unaware of it. They don't even know it's going to happen. So it is most unsatisfactory for the government to say we are going to be able to introduce this on the 1st of July and expect that it is going to be anything other than a comprehensive debacle. Madam Deputy Speaker, we've seen the industry itself uh, urging delay on the government. Regrettably, the government seems to be taking no notice of them, but the industry itself believes that 1st of July is a completely unrealistic starting date. The uh, Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia has called for uh, the thing to be delayed by at least 12 months, and I know from speaking with them more recently that they believe that 12 months is Order. an absolute minimum in terms Honourable of delay. Member's time has expired. Honourable Member for Wills. <coughs> Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, not, a, not only has the, uh, uh, the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia called for delay, but we've seen the Institute of Actuaries pointing out that more time is needed to agree on disclosure standards and to address what it describes as the asymmetry of information between providers and consumers. And uh, Jock Rankin from the Institute of Actuaries said, and I quote, if choice is not properly exercised, there will be no net benefit to individuals and the nation. If consumers can't make a reasonable comparison of products, choice will fall in a heap. Just so. And even the architect of this government's superannuation policy, uh, former member of this House, David Connolly, now director of Phillips Fox, supported a deferral of the start date to December the 31st this year and also noted the need for a holistic education campaign to encompass broad savings and investment strategies. So even David Connolly, architect of this scheme, says, you can't proceed with this by the 1st of July. It is simply not going to work. Madam Deputy Speaker, that the superannuation industry is saying to the government, July 1st will be a debacle. They are concerned at the level of general knowledge. They note that the government is not uh, showing any signs that it's proposing to use that uh, $16 million it has collected from the industry, that kitty it has in a, uh, in a surplus collected from the industry for supervision purposes. There's no sign of it being used and the indications from the government that uh, this government's contribution to those most important issues of education and consumer protection will be of a very generalised and indeed superficial nature. So against that background, the industry is indeed appalled and alarmed at the uh, government's desire to press ahead with a 1st of July start update. And I note that the uh, chairman of the Society of CPA Superannuation Centre of Excellence, Murray Wyatt, uh, <coughs> summed up the industry's view pretty well before the Select Committee when he said, choice of fund could turn into a disaster, a treasure map without any clues. Similarly, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Credit Union Services Cooperation has also expressed concern about whether the government's fair income about education and consumer protection. And <coughs> their comments have pointed out that it is important for the education campaign to be up and running before choice of fund is implemented. They say access by employees to timely and appropriate information and advice, together with an effective education campaign, will be critical to the success of employee choice of fund. They say a more comprehensive program will be needed than quote, new pamphlets in a question and answer style, the ATO's existing internet facilities and the ATO's existing telephone helplines. Now that's what the government says is going to be provided. Uh, the, the Credit Union Services Corporation, Corporation indicates that's simply not good enough. So uh, to, to add to those calls, Madam Deputy Speaker, we've heard the Australian Retirement Fund say that almost 50 per cent of Australians risk disaster with their superannuation if the government does not launch a public education campaign ahead of changes to super. They have said that the government has to educate people on issues they should consider when they have to choose their own super funds under the approaching member choice legislation. 
And we've also seen evidence from the Australian Bureau of Statistics saying that more than half of Australians have poor literary skills, illiteracy skills and may not be able to cope with the new system. And the ABS figures indicate that uh, many people will have difficulty in understanding uh, these most complex matters. In addition, the Australian Retirement Fund made reference to the experience uh, of the UK, where uh, under Margaret Thatcher we went down the same choice of fund model. And in the UK, some 570,000 people were enticed, lured out of well-performing funds into poor funds. Ultimately, that gave rise to $10 billion in compensation claims. And that scheme was introduced into the United Kingdom in the mid-80s, and we still see a lot of that $10 billion in claims outstanding. So it's been uh, a comprehensive disaster. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was uh, referring uh, earlier to the order. Honourable Member's time has expired. Call the Honourable Member for Wills. Thank you, Madam <coughs> Deputy Speaker. Uh, I was referring earlier to the concerns expressed by the Association of Superannuation Funds as uh, put forward in their submission to the Senate Select Committee. And they are most concerned that the education campaign be conducted before the government rushes to introduce choice. And they say that the funding as proposed in the last budget of between $2 million and $4 million per year will not be sufficient to fund a fully effective public and employer education campaign. Funding of public education programs at the rate of around 50 cents per employee per annum will only achieve at best some ba very basic outcomes. While constraints on budget expenditures are acknowledged, levies currently imposed on superannuation funds raise more revenue than is spent on the regulation and, super and supervision of superannuation funds. And point out that if the current levies on superannuation funds are to continue, then at least part of their proceeds ought to be used to fund public education campaigns on choice of funds and other issues of relevance to fund members. And the other point they make about timing, and I think it's a, a very valid point, is that uh, we are seeing at the moment uh, the demise of the uh, <coughs> ISC and its replacement by two new regulators. Uh, arising out of the Wallace recommendations, the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority and what has been known as the Australian Corporations and Financial Services Commission. I think I heard the Treasurer recently giving that body a change of name. But the ISC has pointed to the prospective impact of a change of regulator in a discussion paper on member choice of fund which it released in December. And what the ISC is saying is that we're not intending to undertake any uh, broad review of the existing disclosure rules, as this could preempt the work of the new bodies. And they say uh, the ISC's stance is not intended to, in any way, preempt how the ACFC, ACFSC might approach the issue. And they've therefore indicated that the new regulator could have a completely different viewpoint in relation to regulation of disclosure documents in a choice regime. And ASFA goes on to say, a change in regulatory policy by regulators during or shortly after choices implementation will only contribute to confusion about compliance for funds and employers and add additional administrative expense for the superannuation industry as it struggles with the new or additional demands of a different regulator. And of course, consumer confidence would be undermined if you were to have a change uh, of uh, regulatory regime. Madam Deputy Speaker, for all these reasons, it seems to us that uh, the government's proposal to proceed with uh, introduction of choice by the 1st of July is completely out of whack. We've, uh, we would like to raise the idea that uh, something similar to the uh, call number display. Uh, requirements uh, be considered concerning uh, the issue of choice. Uh, <coughs> members will be aware that the government has uh, an arrangement whereby they need surveys showing some 80 per cent awareness of the issue of 
calling number displays before these are to be introduced. And it does strike me that uh, perhaps if you were to have a survey by uh, a credible authority such as the ISC, which demonstrated that 80 per cent, for example, of employees have an effective understanding of the issues of choice, are capable of making an informed decision, then that would be a, a legitimate basis on which to, to introduce the model. And that's something that uh, we think the government uh, ought to be thinking about, rather than uh, rushing headfirst into the, uh, the 1st of July arrangement. And frankly, I think that if they were to proceed with this and choice of fund were to become mandatory from the 1st of July for new employees, that it simply wouldn't happen. There'd be all sorts of employees coming into workplaces where the employers were unaware of their uh, responsibilities and uh, uh, the workers were unaware of their rights and responsibilities, and uh, <coughs> choice of fund simply would not occur. So we'd have this uh, period where the government says it's going to happen, but it simply doesn't happen. And even worse, in some cases, that employees would make choices without adequate information, not based on their appropriate risk return profiles for them, and they would end Order. up in years to come. The member's time has expired. I call the honourable member for Wills. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. They would end up with uh, retirement incomes which were less than they would have got without these changes. Now, <coughs> other amendments that we have address issues which go to uh, the definition of industry-based fund, and in particular uh, amendment number one deals with the uh, definition of industry-based fund. And, it, and what we're wanting to do here is to insert the not-for-profit basis for industry-based funds. Now, it is pretty clear that what the government is endeavouring to do with this legislation, because when you say, do employers want it? No. Do employees want it? No. Who is this being done for? It is an attack on the industry-based funds. Now, the industry-based funds have a proud record of performance and achievement, which uh, many workers are aware of, and I think all workers should be aware of. But if we don't define industry-based funds in the way that we are proposing, it will open up the prospect of <coughs> employees being not offered a series of choices which are different, but a series of choices which are in fact identical. And just as an example of this, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I was uh, addressing a conference in, in Sydney last week uh, at which, amongst other presentations, there was a presentation from MLC which set out what they refer to as their four-fund choice. Now, in fact, what they're proposing to offer uh, employers is a thing called the Universal Super Scheme, which they say qualifies under each of the four funds being proposed. So they've got a scheme that is the employer-sponsored fund or default fund. They've got a scheme which is, meets the RSA requirement, meets the, the industry fund requirement, meets the public offer fund requirement. So if employers were to pick up such a scheme and offer it to their employees, and clearly this is what MLC and others would have them do, and clearly this would be attractive to many employers, given that choice of fund is simply going to be for them a pain in the posterior. It is going to be more work and nothing in it for them. They may well be attracted to such a model. But if that's what occurs, then you won't get any genuine employee choice at all. You'll, you will be offered the universal super scheme. That will be your choice. And so we would say that uh, to change the definition of, or, or without change to the definition of industry funds, that is exactly what is going to occur. I also come back to the experience of, uh, of the UK and Chile where uh, <coughs> you had commission-based sales, you have people who, are, who have incentives to lure employees out of those not-for-profit schemes and into personal superannuation schemes, away from the occupational superannuation schemes, even away from schemes that have, in those cases, that had any contribution from the employers. And ultimately, uh, they proved to be very disadvantageous to the employees themselves, and so those schemes have been uh, quite discredited. One of the other things that I think we ought to understand about the operation of uh, the industry-based funds is that 
they have marketed their funds with an insurance policy cover, uh, most of them having death and disability insurance. Now, with a lot of industry funds where an employee joins an employer, they are deemed to become, from the moment they start work, a member of the industry super fund, which means that they get the death and disability insurance cover, regardless of whether they've actually started paying contributions to the fund. Now, what we have under the government's model is the prospect of a gap period of the order of 28 days and so on, where if employees don't choose a fund and something were to happen to them, it, then the death and disability insurance cover would not be there. And the government has acknowledged that this is a problem, or at least there was the Senate Select Committee, the government senators uh, acknowledged that this was a serious problem. But if you look at their, their report, you will see that there is really no answer being proposed for it. They are, they are hoping, in the words of, uh, uh, of one witness who appeared before them, that the market would come up with a solution. Well, we would say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that that's not quite good enough. And we do need to have a situation where the, insurance, uh, the industry funds are there to provide death and disability cover and to give people those sorts of, uh, those sorts of options. <coughs> the honourable member's time has expired. Call the honourable member for Wills. <coughs> so, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, it ought to be said too that the performance of the industry-based funds has been excellent in terms of reducing fees and charges, producing maximum returns, providing things like death and disability cover free of charge, and that their performance, uh, by and large, has been excellent and superior to that of other funds. And, uh, for example, there was an article on master trusts uh, which appeared in the Personal Investment magazine in December of last year. And that survey covers 65 major master trusts and includes one industry fund, SunSuper. It provides uh, a table of projected end benefits after 20 years. Now, of those 65 uh, trusts and funds being surveyed, guess which one was at the top of the list? It was the industry fund, SunSuper, and their projected outcome was over $100,000 better than the average master trust and over $200,000 above the lowest master trust. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is a clear demonstration of the impact that the higher fees charged by these trusts can have on the retirement benefits of members. And the other thing that we're concerned about in the involvement of this area of the for-profit funds and the like is the potential impact of exit penalties on members' benefits. Now, I have uh, with me a number of examples of exit fees and their impact on member fund balances. Uh, for, and I'll just uh, read to the House a couple of the worst of these. Uh, one from involving the life company Australian Eagle, where the account balance was for the member was $4,779 and the exit fee they were charged was $3,801. That is to say 79.5 per cent of their account balance was eaten up by the exit fee. And for legal in general, there was a case where uh, the account balance was $1,054 and $929. That is 89 per cent of that account balance was eaten up in the exit fees. Now, even where the account balances are higher, there are still cases of exit fees eating them up. For example, one with Prudential, $14,503 in account balance, $4,846 uh, or 33 per cent in exit fee. Now, those sorts of situations are outrageous. They relate to personal superannuation policies which are generally unsuitable for occupational superannuation, but which are sold for this purpose nonetheless. And we are concerned that the government's model is going to take us back in that direction, with people being 
uh, penalised and suffering much poorer retirement incomes uh, than those to which uh, they are properly entitled. Uh, Madam Speaker, I don't know whether there are others who wish to speak in the, uh, in the debate on, on this schedule. Perhaps uh, at this point it might be appropriate to provide that opportunity. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Curtin. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, uh, at the invitation of the honourable member for Wills, I will make a few remarks on Schedule 5, although I, I will later hope to have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about Schedules 8 and 9 and, and uh, Schedule 4. Uh, at the outset, I want to say about Schedule 5 that I support in principle the concept of individuals having greater influence over the manner in which their retirement savings are invested, and uh, that is essential, essentially what the measure is all about. However, I'm, uh, I'm not convinced that the July 1, 1998 deadline uh, for new employees is the most appropriate, nor do I believe that the government has adequately dealt with the concern that this measure could in fact be challenged on grounds of constitutionality. If anyone uh, needed convincing that past and current savings investments incentives have uh, failed to bring about reasonable improvements in household savings. They need go no further than a recently published report by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research. And I was pleased to see the parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister Cabinet uh, refer to household savings. What he had to say about uh, Australia's performance in, in domestic savings and private savings uh, under the previous Labor government was essentially correct. But I, perhaps he might be interested in what the, the review to which I refer had to say also. That review was released on, in November of 1997 <coughs> and analysed levels of household debt. It showed uh, that the trend towards indebtedness in Australia is consistently increasing and that debtor households are now paying on average 22.7 per cent of their income in the form of debt repayments. As if uh, that trend is not alarming, uh, alarming enough in its own right, Madam Deputy Speaker, the report all shows that deposits in banks and other financial institutions have declined as a form of savings since the start of 1997 and that the number of households reporting some form of employer-based superannuation has fallen markedly since February 1997. So that's the other side of the coin to which the, uh, the, which the uh, parliamentary secretary flipped in the air, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Institute observed that uh, this uh, latter trend, that is uh, in relation to employer-based superannuation, uh, should in, uh, in particular be of uh, concern to government policy advisers, and indeed it should. Despite the fact that there is now a greater awareness than ever before about, of the benefits, indeed the need for long-term savings, fewer Australians are embracing this behaviour. Neither the introduction of the general savings rebate or the concept of the retirement savings account by this government have as yet done anything to boost national savings. Now, it might be uh, very early days, and uh, I would acknowledge that. Perhaps, uh, perhaps increasing the range of superannuation options available to employees is the answer to this government's prayers. Perhaps not. But one thing certain, Madam Deputy Speaker, and that is, unless the coalition takes heed of industry concerns about the timing and constitutionality of this measure, it will find itself facing a simmer, similar public relations disaster to that of the superannuation surcharge. As Ms Beth Quinlivan, journalist with The Age, suggested it in an article published on 2 March 1998, people attempting to make long-term plans regarding their super have faced an uphill battle. Just as one new set of rules and regulations was announced, another statement would introduce yet more complex variations. Ms Quinlivan goes on to write that, still, even for the change-hardened veterans, the number and scope of the proposed variations in current superannuation legislation are almost eye-watering. Almost eye-watering. The Jacques Martin Superannuation Fund Choice Survey, conducted some five months ago, found that while 74 per cent of employer respondents 
support the move to give employees a greater choice of fund, quote, only 16 per cent believe they are sufficiently expert to deal with all the requirements of fund choice. In other words, Madam Deputy Speaker, up to 84 per cent of employers will most likely have to seek professional advice on how to best meet, meet their Order. impending Honourable obligations Members, under these regulations. Time has expired. The question is, your amendments be agreed to? I call Madam. the Honourable Member for Curtin. Thank you. Well, uh, that will re represent yet another impost on the business sector, Madam Deputy Speaker. However, it's not the additional cost that is, is causing angst uh, amongst employers so much as the timing of the introduction of the new arrangements, the timing of the introduction. The Coalition has made a, a number of substantial amendments to the original Choice of Funds initiative outlined by the Treasurer in, at the time of the 19 1997-98 budget. Despite the fact that these amendments were only made available to industry last December and that we're only now beginning to debate the detail of the bill, the government is resisting all calls for a delay of the July 1, 1998 implementation date for new employees for a further 12 months. The editorial in The Australian of March 28, 1998 predicted that, and I'm quoting, the government will do more harm than good if it rushes the introduction of the scheme, because while member choice will deliver enormous power to some four million employees, it is a power that most of them are not yet equipped to exercise. And with that I agree. Madam Deputy Speaker, the British and American experiences in, in increasing fund choice demonstrates the disaster that lies in wait if consumers are not provided with sufficient information to judge the relative performance of competing superannuation funds. As one submission to the Senate Select Committee on Superannuation makes clear, there is a very real threat that Section 32V of the legislation, that which removes employer liability to compensate an individual for damage or loss as a result of the former complying with uh, this legislation, could be deemed unconstitutional. Put another way, employers could find themselves the subjects of litigation by their staff if a service provider, uh, if a service provider presents employees with inaccurate information about their fund. That law could be interpreted, interpreted in this way. That that law could be interpreted in this way is by no means a certainty, though, Madam Deputy Speaker. But surely, surely it would be prudent to establish that employers will not be held liable for the information provided to their staff by competing at superannuation funds before this legislation is passed in place and not later, the, uh, and not later or after the government has, uh, has learnt nothing about, uh, from its diabolical handling of this, uh, this surcharge legislation. Obviously it hasn't. Member choice is one thing, informed member choice is quite another. All the evidence suggests, Madam Deputy Speaker, that employers will not, will not have implemented the necessary internal procedures by the July 1, 1998 deadline to meet their pending obligations. A huge amount of, uh, of confusion remains amongst employer circles as to whether it will be most practical to stick with the stick with an existing in-house fund to utilise a workplace agreement to determine a superannuation fund or to offer employees a minimum of four superannuation funds. Also, unless the government amends its legislation, employers will be obliged to take out insurance to cover their employees in the event of accident and death during an interim employment changeover period. That's totally unsatisfactory, I suggest, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's also doubtful that employees will have had the time to digest the information afforded to them to be able to judge which fund best suits their needs. If reports that uh, three in four employees are not even aware of the, coming up, uh, of the coming of the choice of fund arrangements are accurate, then the superannuation industry has a long way to go in educating the general community and it is, it, it's nonsensical to rush this legislation through this place. Already there are examples of industry experts offering employers advice on ways in which they can defer offering their staff multiple funds 
until this legislation is well understood. While one can empathise with, uh, with employers, Madam Deputy Speaker, and understand them not wanting to proceed until they have all the facts, surely that potential behaviour totally undermines the purpose of the initiative. Mr Jock Rankin, Executive Director of the Institute of Actuaries, has quoted as saying that, and I'm quoting him, if choice is not properly exercised, Order. there Order. will Order. be no Time benefit to expired. individuals and the nation. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Curtin. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, if, uh, if the coalition is as committed to encouraging individuals to take responsibility for their own economic well-being in retirement, as it says it is, then it will postpone implementation, the implementation date of increased fund choice for at least 12 months. Assuming that the choice of funds initiative is not rushed through this place, there is a very real possibility that the increased competition be fit between funds for employee patronage will see an improvement in the servicing of fund members and the products on offer, as well as more competitive fees. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I now wish to turn briefly to Schedule 4. <coughs> I remind the House that in my contribution to the debate on the Trade Practices Amendment Fair Trading Bill 1997 on the 2nd of December last, I noted that while there was a very good case for the Coalition to proceed with its proposal to protect small business in their dealings with larger corporations, it should not fall into the trap of painting these larger companies as the guys always wearing the black hats. I suggested then that the market was, is too complex for it to be viewed simply as a case of small business versus big business. Well, the same is applicable to Schedule 4 of this bill, Madam Deputy Speaker, where the Coalition is seeking to mandate that all PAYE, PPS, and RPS taxpayers are required to make payments to the Australian Taxation Office by electronic means. Under this proposal, affected taxpayers won't have the choice to remit by way of cheque or any other commercially accepted method of payment, and in ruling out this choice, the government stands to undo an otherwise, an otherwise commendable initiative. The explanatory memorandum states that the impetus behind this proposal is to provide compliance cost relief, uh, relief for small business. The government rightly notes that, and I'm quoting, the burden of managing multiple taxation regimes is particularly onerous, unquote, for the small business sector. But it's difficult to understand, to understand the logic behind this initiative, Madam Deputy Speaker, which simply shifts that burden from one section of the private sector to another. Had the government elected to give private corporations the option of continuing with their current manner of payment or taking up the new electronic method, I suspect there would have been widespread support for the initiative. Instead, it is seeking to enact legislation that will punish remitters because of their size rather than for being late with their payments. Unamended, this bill will impose a minimum penalty of $500 for every remittance paid by a business by any means other than the one outlined in the bill. Given that the 1st of July 1998 marks the date of the new fortnightly schedule of payments for large enterprises, these businesses tend to be, uh, they stand to be hit by a minimum penalty of uh, $13,000 per annum if they don't comply with the new electronic method of payment. For those enterprises which remit on a weekly basis, the maximum pen penalty would double. It's ironic, Mr. Speaker, that, uh, that in another schedule in this bill, the coalition is seeking to give individuals greater choice in the way in which their superannuation contributions are invested. The choice of superannuation uh, funds proposal is underpinned by the belief that better informed consumers will yield greater power in the marketplace and force the superannuation industry to become more competitive. The government appears blind to this dichotomy in policy, Madam Deputy, uh, Mr Speaker, which encourages improved market efficiency by way of increased consumer choice on one hand, but which prevents businesses from remitting by the most efficient method possible for that business. 
It has been suggested to me that the Australian Taxation Office must not be able to dictate how business should be run, and that is a sentiment with which I fully accord. If the bureaucracy is concerned about some businesses forwarding their cheque later than the due date for payment as a means of delaying their payment, then uh, there is a simple solution. It needs only to have the current Act amended to reinstate it being the measure. 2 PM, the debate is interrupted and courts will stand in no, order no, 101A. Right. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Before I call on questions, I have two matters I wish to raise. The first was I have to announce that Kevin Chapman, the doyen of parliamentary broadcasters, died in Canberra on Tuesday. He was 71. Many of us will first remember Kevin's voice, the national newsreader on ABC Radio in the 1950s and 60s, and later, of course, for his parliamentary commentary. When television came to Australia in 1956, Kevin Chapman was on camera on Channel 2, again as a national newsreader in those far-off formal days when rounded tones and meticulous punctuation were absolute minimum requirements. For those of us in Parliament, he was most affectionately remembered for his parliamentary broadcasts and for the fact that he called himself Kevin Chap Person. He, uh, for 29 years, he, uh, on a part-time and full-time basis, was in fact the voice of many of us to the people of Australia. He always spoke in a masterful way. He was well informed. He gave insightful commentary, sometimes covering division after division. He was a fine example of the art of broadcasting. For those of us who had the privilege of sitting in the broadcast booth with him, his off-air comments were no less insightful and, I might add, pithy. On behalf of all the members of the House, we extend our sympathy to his family. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I would like briefly to associate uh, myself and the members of the government with uh, that remark. I remember, along with yourself and the late Mick Young, who was then the Leader of the House, uh, uh, making some remarks uh, on his retirement in 1986. He was, as you rightly say, uh, the voice of parliament to millions of Australians. And for those of us who listened to parliament on uh, the radio before entering this place, uh, he was absolutely synonymous uh, with the institution. And I therefore uh, extend uh, to his family uh, my sympathy and that of the members of the Liberal and National Party. The Honourable Leader of the I Opposition. I could uh, also have indulgence and join with you and the Prime Minister in uh, also expressing my condolences to the to the Chapman uh, family on Kevin Chapman's passing. I was, of course, uh, had only been in Parliament for six years at the time he retired, and as the, the Prime Minister said, at that point of time, both he and, uh, and Mick Young had, uh, had remarks to make on his uh, contribution. I, of course, remember him less in that six-year period than I remember when I, him, him as, the, uh, as the voice constantly intervening to report on progress at points of time when I was trying to listen to my father. Uh, participate in debates in this parliament. I did from time to time uh, turn on the radio to do that. And there's a marvellous sort of um, comfort in the voice and the way in which he expressed himself. Uh, uh, this, um, this parliament, this chamber, never has been a quiet meadow, but it was the sounds of a quiet meadow that was essentially emanating from uh, Kevin Chapman and the quiet way he would introduce what would then become a complete uh, Barney across the, uh, across the chamber. But he was the voice of the parliament for many people for a very lengthy period of time. The other thing about him was uh, his, um, his dress sense, which was, uh, of course, uh, appropriate to uh, the dignified status of the House and the fact that he had a, always had a flower in his lapel, which constantly changed on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. So uh, his, uh, his, uh, his this, this parliament is surrounded by, by great figures and great characters, not necessarily simply on the floor of the chamber, and uh, he is one of those characters, and uh, we very much regret his passing. And uh, uh, I, as I said, I join with the Prime Minister in condolences to the family. The second matter to which I wish to draw members' attention were photographs that have been brought to my attention, which appeared on the front pages of today's Age and Canberra Times, photographs of which I will table at the end of these remarks. Captions accompanying each photograph suggests a reaction by the Prime Minister of the House of Representatives yesterday to the High Court's decision in the Hindmarsh Island matter. A perusal of Hansard of that day does not reveal any reference by the Prime Minister during question time to the decision by the High Court. I propose to refer each photograph and its relevant editorial comment to the House members 
of the Joint Committee on the Broadcasting of Parliamentary Proceedings to consider whether the photographs and editorial comment breach existing guidelines regarding these matters, as well as requesting that those members consider the wider issue of the guidelines themselves. I table those two photostats. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Family Services. Does the Minister now acknowledge that the $1 billion this government has cut from nursing homes, home and community care and disability services has imposed an unfair and heavy burden on families who care for a child with a disability or an older relative? Isn't the Prime Minister's restoration of $270 million an, ad an admission that his savage budge budget cuts went too far? Yeah. Minister, why have you only repaired one quarter of the damage? Yeah. When the House has come to order, can we have a little bit of quiet, please? The Honourable Minister for Family Services. Um. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Mr. The Speaker. The, uh, the question from the opposition is absolutely amazing. The, the billion-dollar figure that she was referring to has no relation to reality at all. Has no relation to reality at all. What, what took place today was the first time was the first time in Australia's governmental history a government has targeted a program to assist elderly Australians stay in their home. It hasn't been done before. It hasn't been done before. And let me refer, let me refer, honourable members, to sheet number five that we issued this morning. Honourable members, the assistance silent. for ageing carers. Do you know? Do you know? There's about three and a half thousand aged carers, parents that have got children that they've Honourable had, Jagger, elderly, Jagger's mature children that have got a disability. They've been looking after them for 30 years, and not one government has ever done anything about a targeted program for them. What hypocrisy to come here! What hypocrisy to come here and say and say that this is a program that ought not to be supported! It's absolute hypocrisy. You you want to look at the figures? You want to look at the figures? Where does your billion dollars come from? It's an absolute nonsense. No, what, what, about, to the what about the money? The Ninety-five, ninety-six, two point four billion dollars was spent on recurrent aged care. The next year, listen to the increase. This is why your figures are wrong. 96, 97, 2.618 billion was spent. 97, 98, 2.76 billion will be spent. A nominal increase of 5.7 per cent. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's an absolute outrage. You are trying to perpetuate a myth that you that you had the opportunity. You had the opportunity to address these issues, and you never did. And all you can do is the first question that you asked today. The first question that you asked today ignores the fundamental good that's been done here today. It's indeed interesting to have a look at the member for Wirriwa's book. He talks about the need to develop social capital, to recognise volunteers and networking into the community, to bind a good community. We have recognised that there are 540,000 principal carers in this Jager, nation, Jager, Jager, and today the first time a government, a government has taken steps to support these people. You talk about social capital, we're doing it. Before I call the honourable member of Quarry, could I ask all members to keep their level of conversation down? The noise in the chamber is such that everybody's flat out hearing what's being said. The honourable member of Macquarie. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Could the Prime Minister inform the House how the government is enhancing the care of older people in the community and providing greater recognition and support for carers? The Honourable Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I, uh, I would like to um, take the opportunity in replying to the uh, Honourable Member for Macquarie in uh, endorsing everything that the Minister for the Family Member Services said silent. about um, the figures being flung around erroneously by the Member for Jagger Jagger. The reality is that the package I announced uh, this Honourable morning of a Jagger, Jagger. to the annual meeting of the Carers Association was an Australia first in terms of encouraging and supporting older Australians to remain in their own homes. Uh, all of my colleagues know, and I think all members of parliament know, that the heartfelt desire of older Australians is to stay in their own homes. That's what they want to do. And whilst governments have responsibilities in relation to residential care. They also have a responsibility, a very strong human responsibility, to provide resources 
to enable as many Australians as possible in their older years to remain in their own homes. And that is why we have decided to put an additional $92 million over a period of four years into community aged care packages. And the effect of this, along with the growth of the existing programs, will be to more than double, more than double to 22,000 the number of elderly Australians who will be cared for in their own home environment. Because Community aged care packages are about providing services in the home to enable Australians to stay in their homes. And there is nothing more important uh, to elderly Australians than the opportunity to remain in their own home, and it is overwhelmingly the preference of older Australians that they remain in their home rather than go into residential care. And I'm also very proud, jagger, Mr jagger. Speaker, that the announcement I made this morning to the Carers Association also broke new ground in recognising the contribution to our community of those who care for people with frailties and disabilities. They are without any doubt the unsung heroes of any civilised and compassionate society. They have for a long time deserved more recognition and uh, it is uh, a real privilege to be at the head of a government that will provide an additional $92 million over a four-year period from the 1st of July 1999, which uh, will bring about the merging of the domiciliary care benefit and the child disability allowance. As a result of this, um, uh, there will be an additional 14,000 carers in the Australian community who will receive the benefit of the new carer allowance. This will include many thousands who are caring for elderly Australians with dementia. It Jager, will also Jager. include people who are looking after um, their relatives and friends with uh, profound intellectual impairment. It is by any measure a compassionate new policy. It is by any measure a recognition that for too long this dedicated band of Australians have been ignored. And one of the, one of the special features of this new package is that we are recognising the particular concerns of elderly Australians who have often been caring for 20, 30 or 40 years for a disabled or impaired adult child. And their greatest worry is what is going to happen to their son or daughter when they themselves are too old to look after them. And this policy, which will provide additional resources to address that particular group, I think some 8,000 uh, very old Australians with a particular need. That uh, particular measure, Mr Speaker, is, uh, I think, uh, at the heart of the compassion which underlines this policy. I thank the Minister for uh, Family Services and I thank the Minister for Social Security. I believe this is an excellent policy. It is the sort of policy which exemplifies a caring, compassionate and civilised society, and it is a policy that the Coalition is proud to present to the Australian community. The only ones you have looked after are the when the Honourable Member for Hotham keeps quiet, if he wants to stay here, the Honourable Member for Dobell. The Honourable Member. The Honourable Member for Dobell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the caring, compassionate and civilised Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister... Let's see if you'll be saying that at the end of this question. When members of the government resume their silence... Is the caring, compassionate and civilised Prime Minister aware that as a direct result of his decision to abolish the Commonwealth Dental Health Program, there has been a dramatic increase in waiting lists from people who are in desperate need? Is the Prime Minister aware of the case of a woman who has been informed that all of her teeth need to be extracted and, despite living in constant pain, it will be 18 months before she can be treated and, even then, she will have to wait for each individual tooth to cause her pain before she will be entitled to have that tooth extracted? Prime Minister, what more evidence do you need that your $400 million reduction in federal funding for dental care is causing real pain? The Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. I ask Speaker, members to resume um, their silence. To say again to the member for Dobell that you know as well as I do, and everybody in this House knows that if you'd have won the last election, you'd have got rid of that program. You know that, and you also know, and you also know that historically, 
uh, this has been a program which has been the responsibility of the states. The you, made, you made no reference in the 1996 election campaign to a continuation of the program. You didn't. You made no commitment to continue well. it over the four-year period, and you are being, you are being uh, quite duplicitous Don't and very hypocritical bell. in continuing to ask these questions. When members resume their silence, the honourable member for Canberra, the honourable member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Family Services. Minister, how is the government ensuring older Australians have a real choice in determining whether they stay at home or choose to enter residential care? How would the government also ensure that elderly Australians receive a higher quality care? Than that which they have received in the past, particularly in my seat of Macon. The Honourable Minister for Family Services. I, um, I thank the uh, member for her question, and indeed, uh, as a one of the very few uh, one of the very few nurses in this chamber, she understands the need for quality quality care for older Australians, and has been has been an advocate for the need for the need for us Bruce. to come up with a policies that gives a Remember continuum Bruce. of care. We have focused on getting right the residential aged care Bruce. arrangements in this country to address the neglect which the Labor Party, which the Labor Party left us with, and today we have taken a focus on the need to provide additional care arrangements for those people that choose to stay in their home. One fact Mr. Speaker, that people should be aware of is this that 93 per cent of older Australians are ageing in their home, and that is their preference. That is where they would rather stay. And what we are doing here today is taking for the first time a concerted, considered approach to providing assistance to those people that would want to make that choice. And that's the key word, it's choice. We want people to have a choice. We want that to be flexibility in the range of opportunities there are to deal with those issues that I've been talking about in this place for so long. And that is the increasing number of Australians that are moving into the age category. They are the ones that are deserving of a good mix of policy, public policy, and ongoing rolling commitment of resources from the broad taxpayer where they have the capacity to contribute to themselves themselves to the cost of their care, we are asking them to do that, and that policy is now in place, Mr. Speaker. I know that the member for Macon, I know that the member for Macon has been a dedicated supporter of these policies, and indeed, as it's her birthday today, I would want to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why not? Why not recognise that fact? Because this this is a package that should be celebrated. Yeah. yeah. Now let me just make mention, Mr. Speaker. Let me make mention. Let me make mention for the benefit of the opposition. We have already the Council of the Aging in Australia has put out a press release this morning, strongly endorsing the statements by the Prime Minister this morning. And they say, altogether, we see the package as a significant advance in government's relationships with those older, frail Australians who wish to continue living in their community. We have from the Carers Association of Australia some 600 people gathered in Canberra today to hear the Prime Minister deliver this package. Total and complete acclamation for what has been achieved here today. Total and complete acclamation. And let's have a look at some of my critics. We had Nora Maguire, someone I well remember from when I appeared on a television show, kicking the tripe out of me. What did she say today? What did she say? She said, after what happened about aged care restructuring, you know, the minister, we knew it's silent. logical that he has to do this because aged care restructuring, it's good to hear something Isaacs. that is positive now. It's good to hear something that is positive. We are addressing these issues. We are addressing these issues because we know there has to be a sustainable age policy Jagger, in this Jagger. country. There has to be a mix of policy to provide choice, real, real support for aged Australians in a meaningful way, whether they choose to go into residential care or whether they choose to stay in their home. This is a policy package that deserves the support of every thinking Australian. And I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I am absolutely amazed, and I will conclude. I am absolutely amazed to see that there is an MPI. The only people in this country who are against this package is the member for Jagger Jagger. I, I want to know why. I want to know why. And I'll be very interested to hear at the end of question time why this ridiculous MPI has been put forward by the Labor Party. Why are you against, Hello, why are you against older Australians? How are you going to pay for it? Where was your policy prescriptions at your convention? Not a word. 
Not a word. There hasn't been a constructive contribution to this debate from the member for Jagger Jagger or the Leader of the Opposition from the day this debate started. When members resume their silence, I'll call the honourable member for Dobell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question again is addressed to the Prime Minister. Did the Prime Minister receive a letter from the member for Gilmore, Joanna Gash, dated 15 November 1996, requesting that, as a matter of urgency, he review the decision to abolish federal funding for dental care? Did the letter state, quote, Prime Minister, as you would understand, people do not stomach cuts to basic health needs particularly well. Indeed, they are outraged at our insensitivity. And I have a lot of trouble defending the decision to abolish the scheme. Right. Did the letter from the member for Gilmore go on to state, and I quote, The Honourable Member resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Parramatta on a point of order. Speaker, I don't doubt the Prime Minister's happy when to respond. When the House come to order, I'll call you. Can I have some silence, please? The Honourable Member Hotham. The Honourable Member. The Speaker, I rely on standing order 142, and in particular House of Representatives practice at page 510, which suggests that questions referring to the attitude, behaviour, or actions of a member of parliament or the staff of members are out of order. The question relies entirely on a question of that nature, and I ask you to rule it out of order. I think the question is in order, but I think the Honourable Member for Deville needs to have in mind the constraints of the standing orders in proposing it. The Honourable Member for Deville. Speaker, did the letter to the Prime Minister also state, quote, people needing tooth extraction are being turned away each morning in agony because they can't be seen? Surely we can't stand back and watch a disaster unfold, unquote. Prime Minister, do you intend to stand back as the disaster unfolds, or will you now concede that your dental cuts are causing real pain? The Mr. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I get, I get a lot of letters, and I'll check uh, whether I got such a letter. Yes, me a the Honourable Member of Banks. Hmm? The, Prime, the Honourable Member of Bradfield. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, uh... when the members of the opposition resume their silence, the honourable members will resume their silence. The honourable member for Denison, the honourable member for Brad. Mr. Speaker, my question, without notice, is addressed to the treasurer. Can the treasurer advise the House of the outcome of the Australian Bureau of Statistics quarterly job prospects survey? The Honourable Member of the Banks remains silent. Would the Honourable Member ask his question again? The noise level in this House makes it impossible to hear. Can the, Treasurer advise, can the Treasurer advise the House of the outcome of the Australian Bureau of Statistics quarterly job vacancies series released earlier today? What does the survey indicate about the job prospects for those seeking work in my electorate of Bradfield and that of my colleagues? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Bradfield for his the honourable question. Honourable member for Bruce, and uh, and Mr. Speaker, I think you'll be interested to know that uh, this morning the Australian Bureau of Statistics released job vacancy figures showing that uh, in February 1998 uh, trend estimates of uh, vacancies were 71,600 in the public and private sectors. Ah. For the quarter of February, job vacancies rose by 4.1%. And over the course of the year, job vacancies rose by 14.6 per cent. And I think all members of the House will welcome the fact that uh, job prospects are growing in Australia. I think everybody on both sides of the House would welcome the fact that uh, job opportunities are growing. The Honourable Member uh, I'm for sure, Prospect. Mr Speaker, uh, certainly on this side of the House, uh, there is a wide oak claim of a 14.6 per cent increase in job opportunities. And isn't that good news? For, uh, for the Honourable Member of Brisbane and the Honourable and, uh, Member of the Prospect. And Mr. Speaker, I... The Honourable the Treasurer will resume his seat. The Honourable Member of the Prospect is one of the Deputy Chairmen of this place. I suggest she should show an example to people in her behaviour. The Honourable Member of Brisbane and the Honourable Member of Granger and others are making a noise. I suggest you remain silent. Those of you who are conducting a ballot, I suggest you do it without making it quite so overt a demonstration of some of the problems that some of those who are casting their votes seem to happen. When the House has come to order, can I call on the Honourable Treasurer, who is giving us a very interesting answer? The Honourable Treasurer. Sorry, the Honourable Member of the Banks will remain silent. The 
The Honourable Member of MacArthur, can I suggest you pick up the ballot papers later? The Honourable Member of MacArthur, will you resume your seat in the Prankabite? Prankabite. Thank you. When the members of the opposition resume their silence, he can sit anywhere, as you know. The honourable, the treasurer. When the honourable members have resumed their silence, the honourable member Karangabite is quite at liberty, providing he's not intervening in debate to speak and sit anywhere in the place. The honourable, the treasurer. The honourable, uh, the member of well, Brisbane. Well, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I can, I can understand the interest of the Australian Labor Party in a trip to Malaysia and Korea, but we on this side of the House are interested about jobs in Australia. And, uh, and the fact that job vacancies in Australia have gone up 14.6 per cent, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister uh, also stop being released today the were side. the Drake International Employment Forecasts, which uh, showed that. There was an improving labour market despite the downturn in Asian economies. Mr Speaker, the Drake survey concluded that employers continue to sidestep any significant jobs fallout from the Asian currency crisis, with just 5 per cent of firms nationwide suffering reduced business opportunities as a result of the Asian financial crisis. Mr Speaker, the ABS job vacancy figures, which were released today, show that private sector job vacancies are at their highest level ever yeah. since June of 1979. Yeah. The highest level that have been taken since, uh, since we've been taking these statistics, Mr Speaker. So what do you see as the picture of the economy that's, uh, that's emerging, Mr Speaker? A low inflation economy with low interest rates and increasing job opportunities. The lowest inflation rate since 1963, that's great news. The lowest interest rate since 1969, that's great news. And the best job vacancy since we started recording in 1979. Mr Speaker, these are the results of policies. You don't produce outcomes like this without policy. And uh, because, it's the government's, uh, because of the government's economic uh, approach to getting the budget back into control, to reducing debt, to getting interest rates down, to getting job opportunities going. These are real policies, Mr Speaker. And it's regrettable that uh, we find an opposition which has been absolutely incapable of coming to grips with policy prescriptions. There could be no greater indictment of the failure of the Leader of the Opposition than that one of his front benches has to write the ALP policy in a book. And, Mr Speaker, there can be no greater indictment of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that his failure to ask a question on economics for the whole course the of the, the parliamentary sitting. Seat. Point of relevance. He's, of asked, he's asked a specific question actually on the job figures, which is giving bogus answers. And uh, well, now he's gone way off the point. Will not reflect on an answer in that way. All right, he's gone to the point of irrelevancy. The Honourable the Treasurer, I think that every, the Honourable Member for Murray, uh, for Mallee, before you call the Treasurer, Mr. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 55, for the benefit of members, reads as follows: When a member is speaking, no member may converse aloud or make any noise or disturbance. Mr. Honourable members of the opposition will remain silent. Mr. The Speaker, there is a, a valid point of order. There is a constant cacophony of noise that makes it impossible for members to hear let alone the public in the gallery. And I ask you to take some action to ask members to retain and stay quiet while contributions are being made to Parliament. The, general, the, the public is watching the behaviour of the opposition. They don't seem to realise what the bad they The resume his seat. The member raises quite a valid point of order. There is a real difficulty in hearing anything in this chamber when there is such a loud level of conversation and a loud level of noise. The Honourable the Treasurer is. Are you another point of order? Yes, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member Dennis. Yes, well, I we're all being so conscientious about standing order. Standing, 50, standing order 58 says that when members enter this house, they should take their seat. Now we've always got a ballot going on, which is distracting the Treasurer. The Honourable the <laughs> Member of Dennis will resume his seat. I don't care about the Honourable the Treasurer. Well, uh, well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I was talking about job vacancies and increased employment opportunities for Australians. 
the, 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 the lowest inflation rate since 1963, since the Beatles sang Twist and Shout. The, the lowest interest rate since 1969, since Neil Armstrong said one small step for man. And the lowest unemployment rate since 1990, since Paul Keating said this was the recession we have to have. <laughs> this was the recession we had to have, Mr Speaker. Job opportunities for Australia. But what do you find from the opposition? No questions about the economy these last two weeks. No interest in inflation or interest rates. Just the, the muckraking of the member for Hotham. We saw the deputy leader of the opposition at it this morning in one of the most disgraceful statements that you'll ever see. He came in this morning and spoke about the Prime Minister and said, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. That's what you said this morning. That's what you said. Disgusting statement about the Prime Minister. Can I, the treasurer, treasurer will resume his seat. The Treasurer is straying away from the question he was asked. I suggest that you return to the question you were asked, whatever the merit of the Speaker, comment you're If that is the best economic statement you can get out of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the so-called economic spokesman, disgusting racial slurs which he's throwing around this place, he ought to be condemned and the Leader should make the him withdraw. The Treasurer resume his seat. When the House resumes its silence, the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Well, my question is to the Treasurer, and it follows the answer that he has just given. Treasurer, isn't it a fact that these are the best uh, job figures only, job vacancy figures only, since February 1996, <laughs> as opposed to what you actually happen to be saying? Since isn't it a fact that since Hotham. you came to power, there has been job vacancy growth of 18 per cent in the last two years, as compared to job vacancy growth of 40 per cent in the two years prior to when you came into office. And isn't it also a fact that the other figures out today show a decline in weekly overtime rates of uh, overtime hours per employee of some 2.4 per cent in the quarter for an annual decline of 7.3 per cent, and that indicates something about where this economy may be going. So instead of boasting bogusly, Mr. Royal Treasurer, start seat. dealing with some the real leader the opposition resume his seat. The Honourable the Treasurer. When he asks a question about the economy. <laughs> don't, don't we absolutely love it when he shows his ignorance in this House about all things economic? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the strongest private sector vacancies, the highest level ever in the history of the series since the June quarter of 1997. Isn't that great news? Don't people, don't people welcome the highest private sector vacancy since the series began in the June quarter of 1979? Read, read the document. It's there, you poor old thing. The Honourable Member Hoffman, the Honourable Member and then, says, and then he says, oh, yeah, but there were good vacancies coming back into 1994. Why? Why? Because we were coming off the worst recession in 60 years. He goes back and he says the Labor Party ought to be congratulated for taking, first of all, unemployment up to 11.3 per cent, and then he says, why don't you congratulate us for getting it down to the nines again? Mr Speaker, this is the lowest unemployment rate since who put Australia into recession? Since you put Australia into recession. Who was the employment minister when unemployment hit 11.3 per cent? The leader of the opposition. Who was the finance minister when Australia went $25 billion into deficit? The Honourable Treasurer resume his seat. Mr. The, Speaker. When the Honourable Member for Granger resumes his silence, the, his colleague, the Honourable Member for Denison, can raise his point of order. Have you a point of order? I do, Mr. Speaker. What is it? Earlier, uh, today, you, <laughs> earlier today, you raised the point that, what is your point of order? that ministers should address their uh, comments to the House through the Chair. So they repeatedly, the they have not. Resume his seat. repeatedly they have not, and the Treasurer the is not now. The Honourable Member for Dennis resume his seat. The Treasurer should direct his answer through the, through the Mr. Chair. Mr Speaker, the I direct my answer through you. and I love getting questions on unemployment from the Leader of the Opposition, who as Employment Minister presided over unemployment rate of 11.3 per cent. Let's, let's have a guess. Who was the employment minister during Australia's worst post-war period of unemployment? He knows all about it, Mr Speaker. He produced the best unemployment rate Australia has ever had, and we don't congratulate you for it.
Before I call the next question, there have been and there are still a few left of some 240 students from around Australia here for a National Student Leadership Forum on Faith and Values. Those who remain and those who have left, we extend a very warm welcome to you. The Honourable Member for Cook. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Minister, members of the Maritime Union of Australia have lifted their industrial action in Sydney. Could you advise the House of the nature of that dispute and how the Workplace Relations Act operated during the course of the industrial action? The Honourable Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Cook uh, for his uh, question. What's happened, uh, Mr Speaker, is that the Wharfies Union have taken their campaign from Sydney and now they're going to Brisbane to wreak as much havoc as they possibly can against the Patrick's company, which, uh, gives, them, which gives them the jobs which they, uh, uh, which they enjoy. And so uh, in Brisbane, uh, we are already starting to see the damage being done by the MUA, by the Wharfies Union. 450 tonnes of export steel are being held up. 26 containers of cotton going to North Asia held up by this vandal action uh, of the MUA. And all along, Mr. Speaker, the Labor Party are basically publicly supporting them. And uh, it is interesting, Mr. Speaker, that when you look at the key elements of this dispute, uh, the fact of the matter is that you can see the Barton. beneficial effects of the government's Workplace Relations Act uh, in operation. <laughs> For example, we're told now that as they've decided to wreak havoc uh, in Brisbane, the Wharfies have decided to go back to work in Sydney. Now, part of their complaint about Sydney was that uh, they weren't going to be paid whilst they were taking industrial action, namely whilst they were running an overtime ban. Well, it's very interesting, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, a reflection on Section 187 of the 187AA of the Workplace Relations Act. The Labor Party complained about that when it was revealed about 10 days ago, but they suddenly went quiet when they realised that the New South Wales Labor Party had the same law. Uh, in state, uh, in state industrial relations law. But further, what's particularly interesting is that as the Wharfies are going back to work in Sydney, they've decided to lift the overtime ban. And I'll tell you why they've lifted the overtime ban, and that is because of the operation of our Workplace Relations Act. And last, uh, what is it, last week or the week before, the latest industrial disputes figures came out. Remember, before the last election, the Labor Party said there'd be mayhem, there'd be economic chaos if we were elected, and that basically it'd be World War III. But when the actual official dispute figures came out, did we have industrial mayhem? No. We had the lowest level of industrial disputes since before World War I, and the actual number of disputes was the lowest since 1940, at the start of World War II. Uh, Mr Speaker, what this shows is that we have policies which we have implemented and which really work and which really are, in the area of workplace relations, getting down the level of disputes. What's Labor's policy? Well, Labor's policy is basically dictated to them by the ACTU, part of which is to repeal the Trade Practices Act, which is the one law which keeps a leash uh, on the uh, industrial thuggery in the trade union movement, supported by the Labor Party. And on the balance of their policies, what are their policies? Well, actually, they don't have any policies other than that which is directed to them uh, by the ACTU. And so, uh, as you watch the doorstops in the morning, Mr. Speaker, and as the questions go to the Labor Party, what are your policies? What do we get? All we get is the muckraking that we've had from the Labor Party, which reached an all-time low, Mr. Speaker, with the sleazy, slimy, racist slur. Uh, from uh, the deputy leader of the opposition, yeah, yeah. this just shows you, just just shows you the low depths to which you people will go. And the leader of the opposition on the yeah. industrial the dispute on the Australian will return world. to the answer to the question, the honourable well, minister, speaker. Uh, this is a demonstration, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the waterfront dispute, that when there is a national interest to condemn the industrial action of these industrial thugs. The Leader of the Opposition fails to publicly condemn their actions and can't even bring his own front bencher to meet reasonable standards of reasonable behaviour. The Honourable Member for Oxley. Mr Speaker, my the question House is... will come to order. The Honourable Member Oxley. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. 
Is the minister aware of reports that people are flying to Australia and, upon arrival, destroying their passports and then attempting to claim refugee status? Can the minister explain what steps are taken to identify people who attempt such illegal entry to our country? In such cases, is fingerprinting used to identify those who may be international criminals? The Honourable Minister of Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Well, I, I do thank the Honourable Member for her question because it does give me the opportunity to uh, say a little about the way in which the asylum system, of which we are very proud here in Australia, is by larger numbers of people than I think desirable being the subject of very considerable abuse. Um, this last year we've received something of the order of 11,000 asylum claims in Australia. Uh, those numbers are very much larger than uh, we have experienced in recent years. I think back in the early 80s it was something of the order of 500 such claims that were received. Um, many of them come from countries where one doesn't ordinarily expect asylum claims to arise. And um, the difficulty is that uh, you have to assess each case, um, case by case. You have to make provision for people to be able to have their circumstances reviewed. There seems to be a desire on the part of some to perpetuate an arrangement where access to the courts uh, is also provided. And we have something of the order, I think, of 900 uh, cases where people are expecting to be able to get judicial review on top of all of the other access that is provided. Um, and this is system is in place to ensure that we don't refoul to any country a person who has a well-founded fear of persecution. But when we uh, get manifestly unfounded claims, they damage irreparably the opportunities of us to be able to deal with quickly the circumstances of people who may have been tortured and traumatised or in need of assistance. Um, and when people who are seeking to do that um, want to often disguise their identity, dispose of documentation that might help us in a proper investigation of their claims, sometimes to be able to put a story that would be inconsistent with whatever documentation they may be carrying, it does make our task very much more difficult. Uh, but I want to assure the member that uh, the approach that we take is one that uh, deals with these matters with integrity. Um, we do seek to ensure that the system, one, is not abused, but that any genuine refugee does receive protection in Australia, um, and we use every avenue available to be able to ensure that uh, people who have been uh, known to uh, authorities in other countries, um, that, they, uh, that those matters are properly checked. The character issues are addressed in the process, um, and, uh, and we use the appropriate means for ensuring that they are properly addressed. Before I call the next member, I'd like to extend a welcome to the Honourable Minister of Education from Samoa, whom I see sitting in a gallery. Welcome. The Honourable uh, Member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. Can the Minister inform the House of the Government's progress towards providing more flexible English language tuition to migrants through the competitive open tendering of adult migrant English programs? The Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs. The Honourable Member for Denison will remain silent. Um, I, I, thank, I thank the Honourable Member for his. I thank the Honourable Member for Dunkley for his question on this matter because it does enable me to uh, tell him what's happening in relation to the area of adult migrant education and also to. Uh, also to brief other members who have spoken on these matters in both uh, grievance debates and in the 30-second statements. Uh, and I might also add, uh, for the benefit of the honourable member for Werriwa, who has expressed some interest in these matters and notes uh, very much the importance of English language competency in ensuring that people are able to settle here effectively in Australia. Um, he looks puzzled. Uh, I, I found a reference on page 250. Um, but uh, let me just. I'll tell the honourable member. I'll tell. I'll tell the honourable member himself if he's interested in that matter. The honourable but let me address his response through the Mr. Chair. Mr. Speaker, let me just say that I want to take the opportunity of addressing this question in a factual way because uh, it's important that we deal with 
it's important that we deal with, uh, with facts rather than myths that are often being created. So the first point that ought to be made is that there have been no reductions at all in the uh, way in which uh, the teaching of English language to new arrivals is resourced. Um, provision is made by law for us to fund appropriate tuition of 510 hours to all new arrivals in Australia. Uh, and on top of that, um, because that's a, that's a requirement by law, on top of that we provided this year an additional $17 million over four years uh, to provide assistance for those who are refugees and humanitarian entrants to address um, their English language needs. But uh, we also need to ensure that the provision of money um, is uh, undertaken to ensure that we can provide the most flexible service, both in time and location, and type of tuition that is received to those new arrivals. And uh, we are endeavouring to ensure that the best service is provided, uh, along with value for money, and we have put the system out for tender. And uh, in relation to that, what we have found is that those in those states, in those states where the bodies that deal with these matters evidence um, a deal of uh, desire to adjust their manner of uh, conducting the contractual arrangements, enter into partnerships with other organisations to put in place more flexible arrangements. In other words, are imaginative in the way in which they deal with these matters. They have been able to win the tenders, and in most states that has happened. In the one area. In the one area in which I think, um, perhaps because of the activities of the New South Wales Teachers Federation, where the organisation itself has proven to be more inflexible, um, they weren't able to win three of the tenders that were offered in five regions in New South Wales. Now, the honourable member Prospect, in some comments that she made, commented in relation to the tenderer, commented in relation to the tenderer, um, the Australian Centre for Languages, the Australian Centre for Languages. Um, that, uh, that they had no experience in providing English as a second language course for poorly educated migrants or humanitarian refugees. Now, I have to tell the honourable member that is untrue. The organisation itself has had considerable experience in relation to those matters. It held a number of contracts for teaching to those very groups of people um, through the programs that were funded previously by DICHA, but also programs that have been funded in New South Wales. They also brought into their consortium partners with very considerable experience as well. Mission Australia, the University of Wollongong, the Macquarie University College, the St George and Sutherland Community College. In other words, uh, they have as partners people who have a wide range and wealth of experience in English language teaching, and those services are related very much to teaching amongst the uh, those migrants who have a poor level of literacy in their own language, and particularly those who have come through the refugee stream. And I want to make it very clear that the government is committed, is committed to maintaining uh, high-quality education for English language migrants here in Australia. Um, and it is important, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is important to talk about these matters in a factual way. We don't need myths. Another area in which there are myths there's been Labor's protestation that it doesn't want a race election. And one of the comments that worried me greatly this morning were the comments of the Honourable Member, Member for Banks, the Honourable Member Banks, who had the audacity to say that there's the only Member one Holden. thing missing from Honourable this debate, Powell. and that's the white sheets the and burning Hill. crosses. The Honourable it does Member the Honourable Member no service, the and it Member brings the whole question of debate the into disrepute. That the Honourable Member Prospect remains silent. Members of the government will remain quiet. The Honourable Member for Dobell. I'd suggest that petulant behaviour on all sides is not really a great tribute to this place. The Honourable Member for Dobell. Set a standard. You found Joanna's letter yet? Have you found the Joanna's Honourable letter Member yet? for Dobell resume his seat. If he hasn't a question, I'll call the next question. question. My question without call notice question. is the Honourable to Member the Prime. for Cowan. Thank you, Mr. You, the Honourable Member for Cowan, you'll resume your seat. <coughs> Thank you, you did not uh, ask Mr. your Speaker. question. You Could do the not... Treasurer inform the, the House what progress has been made by the Government? The Honourable Member for Cowan, resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Cowan, resume his seat. There is not a practice in this place, if you are called on to ask a question, to carry on with an interchange across the House. You did so. You did not. Way by waving a letter across the chair, asking the members of the government 
ask a, a question in the normal way. There are proper ways by which you direct a question. Well, let me just respond to you first. You know the direct way by which you ask a question. Do you want to, I call the member on a point of order. My point of order is, Mr. Speaker, order. you called the member for Cowhan before he stood when I was on my feet seeking your call. That's you correct. had been seated because you had not. How could you call the member for Cowan before the he Honourable stood member up? Resume his seat. How could the honourable member resume his seat. The honourable leader of the opposition. Is this? How about a bit of procedural fairness in this place, Mr. Speaker? We put up in this chamber with repeated abuse of relevance as far as question time is concerned. You sit there smiling, and you know exactly what's going on with that repeated the abuse of question of time. The there is one element, one element of retaliation of here, the and you rule our person silent. out of order. Where is the procedural fairness in that? Members of the government remain silent, and so will the members of the opposition. There is a procedure and a the honourable member will resume his seat. There is a procedure and a proper procedure for asking questions. In the present instance, the honourable member for Dobell was not addressing his question as he should. If the honourable the honourable member Hotham will resume his seat. If the honourable member Do the honourable member for Hotham will behave properly and don't shake your head like that. If you want to, right? I, the, I name the honourable member for Hotham. That he be suspended from the service of the House. The question is: the honourable member for Hotham be removed, be suspended from the service of the House. Those on that paper that say aye, those against no, only the ayes have it. Those have it. The ayes have it. Ring the bells. Ring the bells. I'll deal with the honourable member for Batman after the division. I would suggest that honourable members remember that there is no sanctity within a division and consequently any matters that you might avert to outside a division are not subject to parliamentary privilege. Your behaviour does not enhance your own status in the society. I thought even the honourable the manager of opposition business would realise if he wishes to take a point of order and address the chair during a division, the custom in this place has been to put something on your head. Point of order. When the House resumed at order, the honourable member Hotham has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, you rule the member for Dobell. You asked him to resume his seat. That is a point of order relating to the proceedings. It's not a matter relating to the division. I'll take a point of order relating to the conduct of the division. You have now that point of order does not relate to the proceedings now of the House. That is unfortunately now past that stage. We're now at the stage of the division. You can only take a point of order related to the division itself. Yes, you may take a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are having this division because you warned me oh, and named me orders. when I was attempting to get up and take Chief. a point of order. And the point of order I was taking was that the member for Dobell had prefaced his question properly because the words he used to the Prime Minister were, have you got the letter yet? It clearly flowed from an earlier question that he'd asked. It was in the knowledge of the Prime Minister and it was completely in order. And that's why we have reacted to your ruling. The now, naming, if you're going to give these sorts of inconsistency, you will lose control of this the House. Honourable and member you will, will not, not get threaten our the chair. The honourable, when the House resumes some silence, the honourable member was named because he constantly ignored the chair and abused the privilege and responsibilities it has. 
The Honourable Member knows it wasn't for shaking his head. It was far more than that. It was for disorderly conduct, which is the basis of the standing order. I suggest you look at Standing Order 303. The Honourable Member knows the way in which questions are to be addressed and they should be addressed properly. Lock the doors. I, the question is that the Honourable Member be suspended from the service of this House. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. The Honourable Members, I appoint the Honourable Members for Karangamite, Fisher and Riverina Tellers for the ayes and the Honourable Members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 86, nose 41. The Honourable Member is suspended from the service of this house. Before I call anybody, I ask the Honourable Member for Batman to withdraw that reflection on the chair he made during the division. Mr Speaker, which reflection was that? The Honourable Member will withdraw the reflection about which he knows on the chair. Mr Speaker, 
Is that the question? Will the honourable member withdraw the reflection? I'm asking which, re the which reflection. Will the honourable member withdraw the reflection? I'll withdraw the I reflection the that you made on numerous occasions about the, the member be suspended from the service of the house. The question is that the honourable member be suspended from the service of the house. Those in that favour, please say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is that the honourable member for Batman be suspended from the service of his house. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Karangamite, Fisher and Riverina tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose.
The Honourable Member for La Trobe. His place during the, the division. Honourable Member for Canberra will resume his seat. We are conducting a division. I'm going to go to the hospital. 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 I'm going to go to the hospital.
Total to the division is eyes 87, noes 44. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Honourable Member for Batman is suspended from the service of the House 24 hours. The Honourable Member for Cowan will resume his seat. I call the Honourable Member for Dobell in light of the circumstances to address his question. I believe that My question it needs to be addressed to the Prime Minister. Is My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that his office called the Member for Gilmore? seeking help for a person who needed urgent dental care and, in the member's words, quote, his plight was so bad that the PM's office needed something done urgently, unquote, and that the member for Gilmore prevailed on a local dentist to help out. Prime Minister, are you also aware that she went on to say in a letter to the Health Minister, quote, that is a one-off, which I cannot continue to do. This man's crisis was not isolated, and those who continue to suffer will not be so lucky because they will not know who to turn to. Prime Minister, will you now admit that you have dramatically increased waiting times for dental surgery, or is the only way left for people in need of urgent dental care to call you on 026 277 the Honourable the Prime Minister. And Mr Speaker, I am not uh, personally aware of the circumstances to which the Honourable Member has referred. I will naturally investigate them. Can I, say in relation to, uh, can I say in relation to the issue generally that it remains the case that uh, if you had been re-elected you, you would not have continued this program. Honourable you made Member no commitment silent. to a four-year continuation of the program during your campaign. Honourable Members will remain silent. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cowan. Oh, sorry, the Honourable Member for Lindsay. Oh, sorry. The Honourable Member resumes the seat. The Honourable Member Adabel has a point of order. I seek leave to table the two letters I've referred to. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Not? The Honourable Member for Lindsay. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Has the Department established a unit called Images of Australia to ensure the tolerant, culturally diverse and decent values of most Australians are transmitted to the international community? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for Lindsay for her question. I know she and many other members of the House would appreciate the efforts that are made by my department internationally to put uh, the best, Australia's best step forward and ensure that our country is understood for what it really is, which is a culturally diverse, very tolerant and very decent country. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Images of Australia unit, I have to say, has been a very great success in promoting those images of Australia, and uh, I think um, you know, they are values in this country which we have great pride in. It's a, a great thing for us to be able to go around the world and say in Australia people, people from 130 different countries of the world have come together and live on, on the whole very harmoniously together. It's a great thing to be able to say that we're one of the world's oldest continuously operating democracies, but that our democracy works on the basis of un some unwritten rules, unwritten rules of public debate and unwritten rules of decency. And, Mr Speaker, most Australians uphold those unwritten rules of public debate. But, Mr Speaker, there are the occasional exceptions. There are the exceptions who undermine the image and reputation of this country, and we said, saw a very the good example of it Denison. this morning. We saw an example of it this morning when somebody in the senior position of deputy leader of the opposition, one of the significant people in the political spectrum of this country, has made a statement saying of the prime minister, "This bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas." Now, Mr. Speaker. For the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, the alternative Deputy Prime Minister of this country, to be reducing public debate in this country to that level is not only shameful, but it does indeed damage the image of decency and tolerance in this country. 
And coming from a man who was once the Foreign Minister, I say I regard that as particularly surprising. But, Mr Speaker, it would serve the House well if the Deputy Leader of the Opposition did the honourable and decent thing and apologised to the Prime Minister and apologised to this House for what he has done. Because if he did that, he would uphold at last the standards of decency and tolerance which this country promotes internationally so strongly. But to leave a statement like that on the record without the apology is damaging to this country the and, of course, very damaging to seat. the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. There's nothing in that question which provokes or legitimises a peace, an outburst like this from the Foreign Minister, Mr Speaker. The Foreign Minister was asked a question regarding the general status of Australia, and I believe the answer to agree was relevant. But I suggest the Foreign Minister is now moving as far from the question, I suggest he returned to, specific, to specifically answering the question. Mr Speaker, at the Belisi. end of the day, behaviour in this parliament is relevant to the images of Australia. It is relevant to the way the world sees Australia. This parliament is shown on Australian television into many countries of South East and even North, East, uh, North Asia. And some of the things that are said in this parliament and some the of the Honourable things that are said in public seat, debate. The Honourable Member for, for Newcastle on a point of order. Yeah, well, for, the, for the Minister to, to address the issue, Please, to what's address, your point of not, order? That he, what, he, what he is doing exceeds the forms of the House for taking exception to behaviour of a Honourable member of this House. The Honourable resume his seat. The question was regarding standards in behaviour. I have asked the Foreign Minister to return to answering the question. The Honourable Foreign Minister. And Mr Speaker, Denson. indeed I will, because this is about the image of the country. It's about what's transmitted to our region through news services, through Australian television. It's about what's read and understood about this country. And one of the things that's understood about this Honourable country today is that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition accuses our Prime Minister of somebody who's happy when he's bashing blackfellas. Yeah. He, should, he should withdraw that statement. He should apologise. And, Mr Speaker, if he doesn't apologise, the Leader of the Opposition should make him do so. Because to the integrity of the Labor Party, the, the integrity of the Parliament and the, the integrity of public debate. The Honourable Member for Denison on a the, This I'm House sorry, and the I public will see. believe the process is to be partisan if a minister can repeatedly defy your ruling the and continue Honourable this Member personal attack. His seat. He's the Honourable Member for Chifley on a point of order. Well, Mr. I'm Mr. sorry, I did not see you. Mr. Speaker, you, twice you've asked the minister to return to the point of the question, and he is neglecting to heed your advice and guidance. The I'd, ask member, you, I'd ask you to rule that he return to the point of the question. The Honourable uh, Member for Chifley, I thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister, in answer to a previous question, persists in this myth that uh, the Labor Party intended to shut down the dental care program. My question is this. Were that the case, Prime Minister, why in these budget papers of your first budget statement, 1996-97, there appears this item, cessation of the Commonwealth Dental Program, savings in, uh, it, savings in the budget, minus 55.6 million, savings 97-98, minus 112 million, savings 98-99, minus 114.5 million, 99-2000, minus 116.5 million. Were you misleading the House or was your Treasurer on that occasion? The Honourable well, Prime Minister. Not misleading the House. The situation remains that you had no indication during the campaign of your intention to continue the program. The Honourable when the House has come to order, the Honourable Member for Adelaide. No. Much, Mr. Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the Prime Minister. What, Prime Minister, what is the government's response to the High Court's decision on the High Marsh Island issue? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, can I say uh, in reply to the uh, to the Honourable Member? The Honourable that, Deputy um, Leader, as uh, as expressed by the, the Member Dennison. by the Special Minister for State yesterday, the government welcomes the decision of the High Court of Australia in the High Marsh Bridge case. It uh, brings, I hope, to an end 
uh, a very sorry chapter in which there was an enormous amount of money expended. I think there was ill will generated in the community uh, between uh, Australians of different backgrounds. But I want, in the course of commenting upon the government's reaction to the decision of the High Court, Mr. Speaker, I want to draw attention to some remarks that were made in the press this morning, and in particular some remarks that were made at the doorstop this morning by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I, want to, I will put them in context. I will certainly put them in context. And the first context that I should put it in, Mr Speaker, is, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition well knows, I made no reference at all, no reference at all, in the parliament yesterday to the Hindmarsh Bridge case. Absolutely no reference. And, 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 and the jig to which... The, 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 jig, the jig to which the Deputy Leader of the Opposition refers... Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, the jig... The jig to which the honourable member, the honourable uh, deputy leader of the o opposition, refers as a the perusal of both the video of question time yesterday and also the transcript of Hansard will record that the jig to which he refers, which is this, was a reference I made to the treasurer when he interjected, "Why did you give tax deductibility to the Evatt Foundation?" That's what it was about. And that's what it was about. And absolutely what nothing, whatever to do, nothing, whatever to do with the Hindmarsh Bridge. And, and what is appalling? What is appalling about the behaviour? The Mr. Speaker, of Brisbane will remain What silent. is appalling about the behaviour of the deputy leader of the opposition is that, unlike the, unlike, the honourable prime minister, oh. resume his seat. I had a point the of order on the, the opposition on a point of order. Yes, it goes to a point of order by uh, members of the government will remain that deals silent. with the point of the validity of this question and whether it's within the framework of standing orders. And I draw your attention to page 509 on questions. The underlying principle is that ministers uh, are required to answer questions only on matters for which they are responsible to the parliament. Consequently, speakers have ruled out of order questions to ministers which include, for example, here we are. Statements by people outside the House, including other members, notably opposition members. I would have thought under that, Mr Speaker, the given it wasn't a statement made inside here, given that it's absolutely not within any portfolio responsibility the of his, the question's out of order. The Leader of the Opposition knows that as far as on the same point of order? The Honourable Member O'Connor on the point of order. Mr Speaker, I, on, on that point of order, I draw your attention to two factors. One, the Leader of the Opposition is referring to constraints placed by the standing orders on questions. The time for him to take such a point of order is at the end of the question, the not Honourable halfway Member, through the answer, which is not so constrained. The Honourable Member resume his seat. There is no doubt that the question from the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh related specifically to a matter pertaining to a decision of the High Court yesterday. And while I take note of what the Leader of the Opposition has said, the answer being given by the Prime Minister relates directly to reporting in today's media on that question. And I therefore call the Honourable the Prime Minister to continue his answer. Mr Speaker, as I was saying, the, the, truth, the truth of the matter is that I made no reference yesterday to the Hindmarsh Bridge decision. The photograph to which the honourable member refers, the jigging one as he calls it, uh, that one was, was in fact in the course of an answer I was giving, an answer I was giving to a question asked of me by the member for Hotham. And any kind of decent any kind of decent person would have perused that and, and, and look, but you have the deputy leader Honourable of the opposition has no excuse. The deputy leader of the opposition, unlike the uh, the leader writer of the Melbourne Age was present when the incident took place. The deputy leader of the opposition knew that I didn't mention Hindmarsh. The deputy leader of the opposition knew that he knew that he was being deceitful at the doorstop. But, Mr. Speaker, that is only that is only Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that is only that is only the half of it. What we have seen here is 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 very much of a kind with the remarks that were made by the member for Banks. The marks to which the Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs, Affairs drew attention. Some remarks that were made some months ago that likened the attitude of members of my party on the native title issue to the behaviour and the attitudes of the Ku Klux Klan. And that was something that the Leader of the Opposition had neither the power nor the intestinal fortitude to do anything about. The Leader of the Opposition failed to discipline the member for Banks. And once again, the Leader of the Opposition has failed to discipline 
the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, because what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said at the doorstop this morning— This is irrelevant to the question on Hindmarsh, Mr Speaker. How could it be relevant to it if he's referring now, though he, though he got Raddock to talk about this as though it was something that happened member, today? The Honourable Member of the Opposition will resume his the Minister for Immigration. The the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition knows that this matter has been canvassed extensively in today's media. The question was raised by the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh pertaining to a decision by the High Court. The Prime Minister is identifying comment in today's media regarding what was said to be reactions against what he said on that subject. The Honourable the Prime Mr. Minister. Mr Speaker, let me, let me for the benefit of the House say again, this is what and I want the House to listen very carefully to this, and particularly uh, uh, members of the public in the gallery. I want to repeat what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said. This bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. Now, let me say that again. This bloke never seems to be so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. Mr Speaker, you should apologise. Well, the Prime Minister resume his seat. When the members of the government resume their silence, the honourable members of the government will remain the silent. The honourable member for Bacon remains silent. The honourable the deputy leader. Conceivable of the relevance. It has to relate what I said. It has to relate what I said to the circumstance that occurred in this place yesterday, and that relationship is evident when you read the whole sentence of which that was the tailpiece. Read the whole sentence. The if you're going to be fair, leader will resume I'll give it to you if you want it. Read the whole. The honourable deputy leader will resume his seat. The House will come to order before I call the Prime Minister. The Honourable the Prime if Minister. If you are to have any relevance to decency in politics, you should apologise. You should have, you should have the courage to apologise. Because what you and your leader are doing, you are both deliberately the inflaming the, the temperature of this debate. Silence. Prime Minister resume his seat. I haven't called you yet. Just remain when the House is the Honourable Member Correa remains silent. The Honourable Member for Denison on a point, a point on, of order. I take a point on relevance. We are having a personal attack from a man who doesn't even have the decency the to apologise on the seat. stolen generation. The Honourable Member for Denison decent... will resume his seat. The Honourable the Prime Minister needs to respond to the question put, and I believe he's now doing so. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, uh, I have to say that I find myself. Um, uh, in, uh, in agreement with Father Brennan when he said a few weeks ago that there are people in the Labor Party who are hell-bent on having an election on this particular issue. You are the people who want an election on WIC, and by the Leader of the Opposition's failure to restrain the Deputy Leader, he's giving evidence of that. The Honourable Prime Minister resume his seat. Take a point of order on the relevance. Leader of the Opposition. This is a question about Hindmarsh Bridge. It was a specific question directed to him. He has canvassed everything except that particular judgment here in this place, and it is massively irrelevant and massively disorderly. The Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. As the Leader of the Opposition would know, having been a minister in this place for many years, that a ministerial response can relate to the breadth of a question put, and the Prime Minister is entirely in order in responding to the question of the Honourable Member for Hindmarsh. The Honourable the Prime it, Minister. Mr Speaker, not only was the, uh, were the motives imputed the to Member me Blackson. by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in relation to my alleged response to the Hindmarsh Bridge decision, not only were those uh, motives absolutely baseless, not only were those allegations wrong in fact, not only were those allegations completely without foundation, but the manner in which they were made, the particular language used, the was Denison. deliberately calculated to inflame the temperature of this whole debate. And you, you in the Labor Party, you run around in your self-righteous fashion. You say those terrible people over there on the, the government side, for you want to have a race election. Yet you dare to use words like, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. I not only find that offensive to Indigenous people, I find it personally very offensive. I find it highly offensive to the motives of, of, of millions of people in Australia who happen to agree that we have taken a principled stand, not only on the Hindmarsh Bridge issue, but we've also taken a principled stand on the native title issue. But, Mr Speaker, when the judgment is made on this issue by the Australian people, 
the person who will have failed the test of leadership will be the Leader of the Opposition. It is the Leader of the Opposition who has failed to discipline the member for banks. It is the Leader of the Opposition who has failed to discipline the, member, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. It is the Leader of the Opposition that has allowed others in his party to run the agenda on the native title issue. And it is the Leader of the Opposition who is now allowing members of his own party to run amok, to make inflammatory comments, to turn up the temperature of this debate. Honourable well, the Prime Minister resume his seat when the yes, members of the a, government resume their side. Very Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. I mean, this is, apart from being about a ten-minute answer in which he goes round and round his polling, the which honourable. he goes round and round his polling is absolutely way off anything that conceivably relates to the high The Honourable judgment. Leader of the Opposition knows that the answer of a minister can range fairly widely in the, and the Prime Minister is in order. The Honourable the Prime Minister. Speaker, bogus points of order won't relieve the Leader of the Opposition from his responsibility to lead on this issue. Bogus points of order won't absolve the responsibility that he carries along with the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the Member for Banks for tainting the character of this debate. It is a difficult issue, it is a sensitive issue, and when the final chapter is written on this debate, three remarks will stand like stone and they will condemn the people out of whose mouths they were uttered. The first of those was the reference to racist scum by Noel Pearson. The second remark was the reference to the Ku Klux Klan by the member for Banks. And the third remark was that made this morning by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. If he had any sense of decency and courage, he Banks. would apologise and withdraw. But obviously he's not going to do so, Mr Speaker. So I ask that further questions be placed on the notice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Are there any? I call the honourable member for Banks, who I understand has both a personal explanation and a question to make. Mr. Honourable Se member, Mr. Speaker, has the honourable I member seek leave been to make misrepresented? A Just before I call the honourable member for Banks, has the honourable member been misrepresented? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I claim to be misrepresented most grievously by the minister. For multicultural affairs, the honourable member for Banks, and also from the Prime Minister, the honourable Mr. Member Speaker, Banks. earlier in question time today, the minister qu uh, quoted the following: "One of the comments that worried me greatly this morning were the comments of the honourable member for Banks, the honourable member for Banks, who had the audacity to say that there's only one thing missing from this debate, and that's the white sheets and burning crosses." It does the honourable member no service, and it brings the whole question of debate into disrepute. And, Mr. Speaker, just a moment ago, the Prime Minister said that those remarks were made in the structure of the native title debate, and some months ago, Mr. Speaker, uh, any person listening to that answer would have believed that I said the statements this morning. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the minister was selectively quoting from a document given to him by well, Mr Tony Nutt, the, the Prime out. Minister's members Chief of, the of Staff. Mr Speaker, in fact, the document is a media monitor's document that the minister handed to me, and it is dated the 29th of May 1997 in the following terms. Channel 2, Honourable subject, 7.30 report, Stolen Generations. Interview Daryl Mellum, Opposition Aboriginal Affairs Spokesman. Sarah Henderson, Reporter. Today, no one in the government was talking off the record, but the opposition was. Daryl Mellum, and this is the full quote. In terms no, of stolen right generations. Right. The Honourable Member, resume his seat. The Honourable Member wrote Connor on a point of order. Requirements for any member on a personal explanation uh, to quickly state where they were misrepresented and deny it if that is the case. They the are not to go the through lengthy member debate on the seat. issue. The Honourable Member for Banks, the Honourable Member for Prospect will remain silent. The Honourable Member for Banks is dealing in a very sensitive area and I think all members should allow him some latitude in explaining the circumstances of his alleged misrepresentation. Yeah. I would suggest, however, that the honourable member for Banks has in mind the constraints on personal explanations and, and restrains his remarks entirely to them. Thank you, the honourable member for Banks. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I again say the comments on the document are, Mr. Ruddock, for your use, Tony Nutt, Daryl Mellon, in terms and dated 29th of May 97. 
media monitors yet confidential the written honourable members are remain silent. Darrell Mellum, in terms of stolen generations, this is the, the exact member. quote. Darrell Mellum, in terms of stolen generations, what we have to do is have a considered response, and it's about time the Prime Minister showed leadership. There's only one thing missing from this debate, and that's the white sheets and the burning crosses. And that's been the undercurrent in this debate. Honourable members will remain silent. Honourable members of the government will remain silent. Mr Speaker, those comments were made in relation to the stolen children. There was no reference in relation to the Ku Klux Klan. They were made on the 29th of May 1997. There was no statement made by me this morning. There was no statement Honourable made by me in recent months. And I ask that the Minister and the Prime Minister apologise to the House. The Honourable Member has finished his personal explanation. I understand you had a question. Oh. Members of the government will remain silent. They are not helping in maintaining some decorum in this place. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I claim to be misrepresented and I seek leave to make the a personal explanation. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, among the various bits of free character analysis I received today at question time were a number of statements to the effect that in what I said about the Prime Minister this morning I had been guilty of a racist slur. May I make the point, may I make the point at the outset, Mr Speaker, that it is not racist to suggest that someone has behaved offensively on a racist matter. As to the substance of what I actually the said— The Deputy resume his seat. The Honourable Member for O'Connor on a point of order. I again, would you sit down, please? The Honourable Hon Deputy Leader resume his seat. Down, the Honourable Member O'Connor on a point of order. Mr Speaker, Standing Order 64 says, having obtained leave from the chair, a member may explain matters of a per personal nature, although there be no question before the House. But such matters must not be debated. The, Every word that the, the Deputy Member Leader of the Opposition is debating the issue. The Honourable Member O'Connor will resume his face. What the Deputy Leader, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition remains silent. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition is explaining the context of the matters where he alleges he was being misrepresented. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition may needs I continue to have in by, mind the restrictions of the standing orders. May I continue the Honourable by saying Deputy Leader. that the words I used immediately preceding those that have been quoted are these. What I said was this. I do find it somewhat tacky, however, that the Prime Minister reacted with the exuberance that he so obviously did when he was given the news of the 5-1 decision against the Aboriginal women. And then I went on to make the expression that you have quoted in that Honourable particular Member context. I was suggesting, I was suggesting, I was simply suggesting that the Prime Minister was behaving offensively on a racially sensitive the matter. Honourable and Member has it. now finished his personal no, explanation. No, I also wish there's one further well, point, Mr. Restricted Speaker. Restricted or personal explanation. I have been not asked to apologise. Can I respond yes, to that request for an apology? It is obviously a matter of contest between us as to what precise form the Prime Minister's exuberance took yesterday. I accept the Prime Minister's explanation. The Honourable Member will resume his I accept the Prime Minister's explanation. I'll just say that I accept his explanation because he's made it in this House, and I would not presume that he would mislead the House. That, that this particular photograph was not. The Honourable Deputy Leader has the call, oh, but I suggest he finishes his personal explanation. I'm responding to a request for well, an apology. I, what I'm saying is, mark. if the Prime Minister says that photograph was not the occasion that he was expressing his delight at the news, I accept that. However, he was given a bit of paper the in his Honourable place yesterday. As I seat. understand, you are laughing your head Deputy off at that leader stage will resume when you're given seat. that bit of paper. The Deputy Leader will resume his seat. Honourable members will remain, resume their silence. The Honourable Member for Newcastle, do you wish to make a personal explanation? A question to you, Mr Speaker. A question to you. The Honourable I, Member for I Newcastle. I raised a point of, uh, point of order earlier. If I draw your attention to Standing Order 76, and it would seem to me that a request for an apology by, by a member of this place imputes another member. Question, standing Order 76, rule such imputations out of order. And I would ask if you would consider that. 
As if the Honourable Member would low, know, you are allowed to direct questions on matters of administration, and frankly, I don't see how that's a matter of administration. In terms of the phrases used and expressions made inside and outside this place, the Honourable Member, better than most, will know that many people say things which they don't necessarily mean, and the procedures are intended to allow for some flexibility in uh, considering them. The Honourable Member for Banks wished to ask a question of me. Thanks, first. Mr. Speaker, my question to you relates to your rulings that ministers are not required to table doc confidential documents from which they, uh, they are quoting when we request so under the standing orders. Earlier today, the, uh, the Minister <coughs> for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs gave me a copy of the Media Monitor's report that had been given to him. And on the back it says, Mr Ruddock, for your use, Tony Nutt. It's a media monitor's extract, and on the top it says confidential. The media monitor's is a public document. Mr Speaker, it was a partial quote from the transcript. My question to you is, in terms of, does he have to table the whole document when asked? He selectively quotes, if anything has it, if, if confidential is put on a media monitor's document, does that preclude the tabling of that whole document by the minister, or does the minister have to table the whole the of the Honourable public Member document? Because seat. what we've got the here Honourable is, Banks is cut and paste. Seat. As the Honourable Member for Banks would know, the Speaker has no control over determining what documents are claimed to be confidential and those which are not. What I have a responsibility to do is to ask a minister whether or not the document is confidential, and that I do. In this instance, the Honourable Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs was not asked to table the document, and therefore I don't see the relevance of the question. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, I move that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would allow the member for Holt and the member for Banks to apologise to the Prime Minister for attempting to slur him with racism. Mr Speaker. Mr. Honourable... Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we all know that in this debate, uh, when one is debating uh, issues of land rights and native title, we all know that passions can be inflamed. The Honourable Mr. Member for Speaker, Calgary, and it has always been the intention the of this will government. His seat. I'm afraid I've got a point of order. The Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie. Mr. Mr. President, uh, Speaker, I, I was actually well on my feet before the member, uh, the treasurer, was called. I actually had a question to you. And it's, it, go, it goes to this. Well, I'm sorry. We're now into the motion. I will ask you to direct your question after we've finished the motion before the House. I'm sorry I did not see you. Members rise in this place, and frankly, it's very difficult at times to work out whether they, the purpose of their rising. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr. The Mr. Call. Speaker, because we all know that passions can be inflamed in a debate like this. We all know, Mr. Speaker, that it is very easy for people to come along and inflame passions for their own political advantage in relation to this. And Mr Speaker, at all times on this issue, the Prime Minister has shown absolute leadership, absolute leadership in securing justice between the rights of uh, native title claimants and securing justice between those who have pastoral lease. And Mr Speaker, I want to say for my own part and for the part of this government and for the part of this party, the, the joint the parties, that he leads, the, the Prime Minister has Newcastle done that with distinction. What is your point of order? Mr Speaker, uh, earlier in the day I, I raised with you a question about, what is your point of order? about a substantive motion being on, on the matter we're discussing now. You ruled there, it out of order. There is a motion for suspension of standing orders to allow the motion to be considered. The Treasurer has moved a motion and the House is considering it as the procedures require it. The Honourable the Prime Minister. When he made the allegations earlier in the, earlier in the afternoon, you ruled him in order. The Honourable the Prime Minister responded to questions entirely in accord with the standing orders. We are now dealing with a substantive motion moved by the Treasurer. The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, I want to say it again. I want to say it uh, on behalf of this government, on behalf of the members of the parties which he led. The Prime Minister has served and led Australia in relation to this issue with distinction, yeah. with utter distinction. And Mr Speaker, the despicable attempts, the despicable and premeditated attempts by the Australian Labor Party to try and put racial slurs into this debate 
to put racial slurs into this debate and to try and inflame passions ought to be absolutely condemned. And we condemn them. And we want to give those members that have injected those racial slurs into this debate the opportunity to come into this parliament and to come in and apologise. Mr Speaker, this is the apology squad. These are the people that love apologies. They, they ought to come down Honourable here, Mr Wills. Speaker, and they ought to apologise for the things for which they are Honourable responsible. Banks. Mr Speaker, this morning, this morning the Deputy Leader Honourable of the Opposition, Banks. in one of the most tacky performances you will ever see a parliamentarian engage in, walked Reed. up to a doorstop. He walked up to a doorstop this morning and he said, in a quote which he has now confirmed, he said this. I do find it somewhat tacky, however, that the Prime Minister reacted with the exuberance that he so obviously did when he was given the news of the five-to-one decision against the Aboriginal woman. women. The first point to make uh, about this, Mr Speaker, is he says, oh, he was running off the front page of the age, he says. You were actually in the parliament yesterday. You were here. You know that the Prime Minister made no reference yesterday to the High Court decision. You also know yesterday that the Prime Minister stood here and, and, in response to an interjection from me when I complained he'd given tax deductibility to the Ebbett Foundation, he turned around and that picture was taken. The picture on the front page of The Age this morning was false and you knew it. And you took the opportunity to walk in, and this is your now defence, and say I was misled by The Age. You were not misled by The Age. You very deliberately and in a premeditated way came in this morning and you had determined to try and put a racial slur on the Prime Minister. And this is what you went on to say. These are the despicable words that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition went on to say. He said these words, this bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing black fellas. Now, Mr Speaker, what, what, were people, what were people expected to understand by that comment? They were expected to understand one thing. They were expected to understand that the Prime Minister was pleased or would be happy about bashing blackfellas. That's the imputation you were trying to put on the Prime Minister. There is no other explanation as to those comments. It was not a discussion about the rights of native title. It was not a discussion about the High Court decision. It was not about pastoral lease. It was a racial slur, pure and simple, and you did it in a premeditated way. And Mr Speaker, if you had any decency, if the Leader of the Opposition had any decency, and I say to him now, before this debate finishes, he would walk to that dispatch box and he would say to the Prime Minister, I apologise. That's all you've got to say. I apologise. I withdraw. That's all you've got to say. And what are you being asked to withdraw? You are being asked to withdraw a statement which is so palpably false and despicable that a decent person would do it. You are being asked to withdraw these words. The bloke seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing black fellas. You are being asked to withdraw a racist slur which is despicable. Mr Speaker. And then we find the member for Banks. The member for Banks comes into this parliament and essentially confirms and confirms the statement that he made on Channel 2 on the 7.30 report on the 29th of May 1997. He confirms it. He confirms this quote. It's about time the Prime Minister showed leadership. Again, do you see the way in which they try and sneak the Prime Minister into these debates? It's about the time the Prime Minister showed leadership, and here is the quote, and he confirms it. There's only one thing missing from this debate, and that's the white sheets and the burning crosses, and that has been the undercurrent in this debate. I'll tell you what the undercurrent in this debate has been. The undercurrent in this debate has been a premeditated, conscious, subconscious campaign by the Australian Labor Party to try and put slurs on members of the government. That has been the real undercurrent of this debate. You can see it from the deputy leader. You can see it from the member for Banks. I'll tell you what the undercurrent is, Mr Speaker. They are trying to put into the subconscious, into the minds of decent Australian people, a despicable slur on the character of the Prime Minister. And if you had decency, you would withdraw it. You know that when you talked about white sheets and burning crosses, there was only one image which you were trying to conjure up. You were trying to conjure up the image of the Ku Klux Klan, one of the most notoriously racist groups that this century has ever seen. 
You know that you were trying to conjure up that image and you were trying to project it onto the Prime Minister. You know that. That is why you made that statement, Mr Speaker. It was a despicable allegation and a despicable statement, and you ought to withdraw it. Mr Speaker, this is a time-honoured tactic of the Australian Labor Party. I know that the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, when a recent appointment was made to the ABC board, got up and said it was like Louis Farrakhan being put in charge of the Holocaust Museum, didn't you? Again, trying to put the racist smear out. The Australian Jewish community came out and condemned you, and they were right. They were absolutely The Honourable right. Treasurer resume his seat. The member oh, for uh, there's no the reference in the order. motion of the matter. The, 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 the Treasurer is now the addressing. The Honourable Member Werra will make his I point of order. Well, I'm making my point of order. There's no reference in the motion of the matters to which he's now the referring. Honourable the Honourable Member resume his seat. On there's no order point of order. The Honourable and fairly Treasurer. In the, Parliament. the Honourable Sir, Member for Werra should know it's suspension of standing orders for the Treasurer's entirety in order. This is a sleazy pattern of behaviour. That's right. It is a pattern of behaviour which has been repeated on numbers of occasions. It is a pattern of behaviour which now draws in numbers of the front bench. It is a pattern of behaviour which has been put together to try and blacken the Prime Minister's name and to try and poison race relations in this country. And this is a pattern of behaviour which ought to be repudiated. It ought to be repudiated by those that started it. But if it can't be repudiated by those that started it, it ought to be repudiated by one person. It ought to be repudiated by the person who claims to be the leader of this little outfit. The person who claims to lead the member for banks, the person who claims to lead the deputy leader of the opposition, the person who would be a prime minister, the person who ought to have some decency and some leadership, the person who is too weak to turn to his own deputy and too weak to turn to his shadow minister and too weak to stand up to the racist slur. Why, Mr Speaker? Because he condones it. He condones this kind of behaviour while he refuses to make them apologise. We do not condone this kind of behaviour. This is dangerous behaviour in Australia, and those members ought to come in and apologise. And until they do, Mr. Speaker, they stand absolutely condemned. I ask members of the government to remain silent. The honourable leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, we of course oppose this motion. We oppose this motion, and we do so because. For many reasons, but not least, we do not accept strictures from a man who has no code of ethics as far as his ministers are concerned, no code, no moral ground to stand on, who has sat here in this place over the course of the last two weeks and defended the absolutely indefensible in his Minister for, Minister for Mines, the absolutely indefensible, has allowed a person in this place, a, a minister in this place, to Members operate and continue quietly. to operate with a massive breach in a conflict the of interest. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Can I ask those members on the government who are leaving the House to do so and to remain silent? The Honourable Member of North Sydney on a point of order. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Following on from the point of order from the Member for Werriwa, the Leader of the Opposition the is Honourable not addressing the substantive issue the before the House, member will the totally unrelated seat. The issue. Of the he should come back to the, the issue. The Honourable Member of North Sydney will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will have the same licence as the Honourable the Treasurer exercises. The thank, Honourable, you, thank you the very much, Mr Speaker. That, that licence would the allow me to roam very far and wide silent. as far as this matter is concerned. This is a Prime Minister who claims weakness on this side of the House when he cannot stand up. He cannot stand up his own flatmate and assure a level of standard Patterson, in this community. A sure level Patterson. of standard in this community. That uh, level Patterson of standard in this silent. community. That anybody, anybody who has been able to enforce this in the past, any other leader has been able to enforce in the past. Now let me just go through the facts of this particular set of propositions and paint a picture, Mr. Speaker, of where the government is coming from on this matter. It is often the pattern, I am afraid to say, in politics that those who intend to victimise claim themselves to be victims. This is not a particular attribute unique to this government. It is, a, in fact, a very old-fashioned piece of right-wing information and right-wing tactical determination as to how you operate. When you wish to victimise somebody, claim you are a victim. When you wish to victimise a community, claim you are a victim. And we have seen that pattern from this Prime Minister as he's clothed himself in unction on these issues repeatedly. We, re we remember well back to the time when there was an invitation by this Prime Minister to freedom of speech. 
He said something new to the Australian population on that freedom of speech speech. That uh, he said something new to them that they had thought that that thought that they'd had in their minds for years past that freedom of speech was a feature of Australian society had in fact unbeknownst to them been a situation repeatedly violated. And indeed they had no freedom of speech until he liberated them. Everybody on this side of the House and everybody out there in Australian Gordon, politics, no. and I suspect everybody on your side of the House knew precisely what code the Prime Minister was talking in. And the Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs tried to come into this place and claim damage done to our society on these matters. Nothing compares with the damage that was done our society and our international reputation by the view that had widespread acceptance overseas that the Prime Minister deliberately coddled the member for Oxley, deliberately coddled the member for Oxley and her position. All members of the government were made and as a result of that, and as a result of that, serious damage was done to our society. Honourable but Foreign this Minister, Prime Minister, this Prime Minister, Minister felt silent. nevertheless that he was well served domestically, no matter what might Deputy be happening Leader of the Opposition. internationally. He was well served domestically, no matter what might be happening internationally. That's another reason why we don't accept any don't strictures from, uh, from this uh, particular Prime Minister. And we well remember also, <coughs> it's very difficult to get passion from this Prime Minister, genuine passion, but when he was up in front of the Aboriginal Reconciliation Conference a year or two ago, and he had a set of victims in front of him. He was up there, ebullient, ranting, hectoring, creating an environment in which he was saying to the rest of the Australian population, here I stand with you against them. Here I stand with you against them. That was the precise intention of the Prime Minister. And if anybody in their right mind Anybody who is a political analyst who in their right mind assumes that the Labor Party wants an election on WIC, after we've seen Borbidge out there wandering all over the back blocks of Queensland trying to drum up an opportunity in that regard, after we've seen, after we've seen the Prime Minister out there repeatedly giving assurances to those who don't need assurance on these matters, what we know from this Prime Minister is, and he's been touting it for 12 months now. What do you think we've got? 24-hour memories on these matters for 12 months now. Everybody who knows anything about politics in Australia knows that this Prime Minister has been trawling for a weak election. That is why he is not seriously negotiated with all parties. He has been trawling for it. Therefore, we must interpret the events of today within the context of what is intended by the Prime Minister. And I can ask, I can ask for no further, uh, no further evidence to be provided than this. Here we have rehaim monitors. Here we have confidential stamped across the top. And here we have marked the quote that the person is supposed to use, in this case Ruddock is supposed to use, the white sheets and the burning crosses. And what we have had from the, a repeat is, is a repeated effort. And so that if we ask, and the reason my friends while confidential is stamped there, and I do accept you back benches are a bit naive and innocent, but those on front benches understand these things. Those on front benches understand these things. The reason why confidential is up there was so if the member for Banks were to get up and say in his defence, read the whole quote, Mr Ruddock, or table a document from which you are quoting, he would be able to say to the Speaker, no, it's confidential. <laughs> and, Mr. Ruddock, and Mr Ruddock was a fool. The Minister for Immigration was a fool. All members of the government will remain silent. He had properly prepared for him a document. Deacon. Properly prepared for him a document by the Prime Minister's office. I'll remember the Prime Minister. And he was, uh, indeed, and here it is, Mr. Ruddock, for your use, Tony Nutt. He had a document given him by the Prime Minister's office, and he was dopey enough to give it to us. So we go on with, these, uh, with this set of uh, propositions. There it is underlined, Daryl Mellon, go to the white sheets and the burning crosses. So innocent was Mr. Ruddock of the content of this matter. So innocent was he that Mr Ruddock assumed that it had been made today. 
which is why, and I now quote well, from what we've uh, managed. Well, I'm afraid I'm about to quote you, old son, so you can get up and give a personal explanation in due course. And he says here, run it. One of the Your comments. The member for Patterson will remain silent. One of the comments that worried me greatly this morning were the comments of the honourable member for Banks. The honourable member for Banks, who had the audacity to say, "There's only one thing missing from this debate." And that's the white sheets and burning crosses. Two mistakes, Mr. Ruddock. Two the mistakes, the Minister for Immigration. Side. Firstly, was to hand it to Mr. Mellon, and secondly, was not to, to be so unoffended by the comments the that you hadn't been aware that they were made warned. a year ago. And then there was, and then what we go through was the actual comments. In the terms of the stolen generations, what we have to do is have so a I've considered response. And it is about time the Prime Minister showed leadership. There's only one thing missing from this debate. He's gone on to the general debate. Because if you actually go through more than just simply this, and I'm just using your paper, you'll see there are a lengthy set of comments by the member for Banks on the totality of the issue related to the stolen generation. And in continuing in, reflect, in reflection of that particular debate, he said there is only one thing, and that's the white sheets and burning crosses. I do think that the member for Banks was excessive in this, in this regard, which is why at the time I said for the member to the member for Banks, don't you introduce that topic into these, uh, these debates again. But of course I knew thoroughly that the member for Banks was not in fact referring to the Prime Minister. He was referring to the generality of the debate, and that is consistent with what is here. It's consistent with what is here, but not consistent, not consistent with what was given to Mr Ruddick to underline. <coughs> because what the Prime Minister wanted out of this was the exercise. I intend to victimise, therefore let me don't deal Second. with the victim. I intend to have a race election, therefore Dennison. blame the other side for the race election. Well, there's still a few of us with our teeth in our head and a few friends Holy downtown. Cow. We know your tactics. We know your tactics, friends, and we are not the least bit impressed by them. The Honourable Foreign Minister, can I ask members on both sides to remain silent? It's extraordinarily hard to hear what's going on. The Foreign Minister. Speaker, the truly interesting Don't thing about the Leader of the Opposition's speech was that not once in his speech did he in any way criticise the comments made by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition or the member for banks. Not once. And as the member, the member uh, for Denison makes the point the on behalf of the opposition, he's from the front bench, he makes the point, he says, why should he? In other words, Mr Speaker, it's all right for the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, not for a backbencher, wayward backbencher, but the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to say that, it's the, that this bloke, meaning the Prime Minister, seems to be never so happy as when he's bashing blackfellas. The, the Leader of the Opposition thinks that is all right. You think that is a satisfactory thing for your deputy to say. You are quite happy with that. That is a standard that you will now bear right up until the election. That is your standard. But, Mr Speaker, what is so hypocritical about the Australian Labor Party and, indeed, the Leader of the Opposition is that when anybody on this side says something inappropriate, the he, the leader of the he holds the door stop, he runs to the television the the cameras opposition. and says the Prime Minister should make that person apologise. Make him apologise. Now, if, I'm sure the member for Sw Swan will excuse me for raising this again, but the member for Swan did make inappropriate remarks about Cheryl Curnow. The Leader of the Opposition, leaders, uh, figures in the Opposition all rushed to the television cameras. Mon, of course, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was one of them. And, you know what a shameful thing this was to say. Cheryl Curnow was suggesting the Prime Minister had written the speech for the member for Swan, and oh, an apology had to be given, and the Prime this was a test to the Prime Minister's leadership. Well, the point is the Prime Minister demanded an apology, and he got an apology. And that is the standard that this Prime Minister has set. But with the Leader of the Opposition, the he, won't make, he won't make his deputy apologise and he won't make the, de the member for, ba for Banks apologise. That Senator Lightfoot made some very inappropriate remarks in the Senate when he, was first, uh, when he first took up his seat in the Senate. The Prime Minister rang him and told him to apologise. And he did. 
and he withdrew those remarks. But the Leader of the Opposition, without any leadership, without any courage, and frankly, dare I say it, of, a man, of the man without any decency, without any decency at all, will not ask the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to apologise. Why? Why? There are two reasons why. There are two reasons why. One of them is that you agree Deputy with him. Leader of the opposition One of them is silent. that you agree with him. You think it's all right for him to say this bloke seems to be never so happy when he's bashing blackfellas. You think that's all right, do you? You think that's all right? Let's just get this straight. Do you think that's all right? No, you see, he says nothing. He says nothing. Why does he say nothing? Why doesn't he say, yes, I think that's all right? Because the in the back of his mind, Minister he knows it's seat. all the wrong. Honourable Member for Newcastle you know it's board. all wrong. The, the Minister appears to be asking seat. you a question again, Mr Speaker, and I suggest you, put uh, him, I suggest you answer it. Honourable Member will resume his seat. The Foreign Minister Won't has the save the Leader of the Opposition. He knows what the Deputy Leader of the Opposition said was wrong. He, he knows it. But what he won't do is make him apologise. Why not? Because you're weak. Because Prime you're Minister a weak Ricky's man. You have chair. no authority over your deputy. And I mean, a junior shadow minister for Aboriginal, the, your minister for Aboriginal, shadow minister for Aboriginal affairs. You have as a junior shadow minister sitting down there. Of course, what he said was appalling. Anybody knows that what he said was appalling to talk about the white sheets and the burning crosses. I mean, of course, it's appalling. When? When is your big argument? When? Well, it's all right, is it, if you said it last year? Last year was free range. You can accuse people of being members of the Ku Klux Klan, but this year it's not all right. Is that your standard? Well, I must say, Mr. Speaker, I've been here for, for 13 years, for, uh, for 13 years, and I've heard a lot of arguments. But the argument that I heard today from the leader of the opposition was not only the weakest that I've heard in all the time I've been here, but frankly was of very questionable morality. The, the question is that so much of the standing on essential orders be suspended, so as to allow the honourable deputy leader, so as to allow the member for Holt and the member for Banks to apologise for trying to slur the prime minister with racism. Those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. Is the division required? Division required. The ayes have it. The ring the bells. Suggest that although we might be in a vision, it's a good idea to desist from this name calling across the chamber. The Honourable Foreign Minister.
That's what the motion is. What about you and the League of Rights? Lock the doors. The question is that standing orders be suspended. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fisher and Riverina tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the noes.
<laughs> Members on both sides will desist from name calling across the House. Result of the division is ayes 84, noes 38. The question is therefore resolved by an absolute majority in the affirmative. As the motion has been agreed to, I will allow the members identified to approach the dispatch box if they so wish the purpose stated in the motion. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. No, I'm, happy to leave. I'm happy to approach seek the dispatch. Seek leave to address the House on the you motion. Seek leave? Seek leave. Is leave granted? No. I seek, I seek, I seek oh, well, leave to respond to the motion. Point of order. Is leave order. granted? What? No, Mr Speaker. Point of leave order. Leave is not granted. Point of order. Do you have a point of order? The Leader of the House on a point of order. Uh, the motion allows them to apologise and only to apologise. I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for Jagger Jagger proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted. Honourable Members will resume their seats. Honourable Members on both sides will resume their seats. Proposing that a definite matter of public importance, the Honourable Members will resume their seats, be submitted to the House for discussion. Including the Honourable Member for both of you, Charlton, and the member behind you for Maribyrnong, be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the heavy and unfair burden imposed by the Howard government's policies upon families caring for older relatives and children with disabilities. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed motion to rise in their places. Speaker, I move that business of the, the day House. be called on. The question is the business of the day be called on. Those in favour of the motion, please say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is the business of the day be called on. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fish and Riverina tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and what and Bruce Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong tell us for the nose. Result of the division is eyes 84, nose 35. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that the House at its rising adjourn until Monday the 6th of April 1998 at 12.30 p.m. unless the Speaker fixes an alternative day or hour of meeting. The question is the most to be agreed to. Those in favour, please say aye against no. The Honourable Leader of the House. I move that order of the day number two, government business, be postponed until a later hour this day. The question is that uh, notice number two be postponed until a later hour this day. Clark. Notice number three, Aboriginal and Torres Islander Heritage Protection Bill. The Honourable. Is the the Honourable Minister. It's introducing the bill. The Torres Minister. The Honourable Member for Leichhardt, I believe. Torres Strait Islander Heritage Bill. Yes. The Honourable Minister. Minister. On behalf of the Attorney General, I present the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Heritage Protection Bill 1998. The Clerk. First reading a bill for an act for the protection of areas and objects of particular significance to Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islanders and for related purposes. The min Minister, on behalf um, of the Mr. General. Acting Speaker, I move that this uh, bill be now read a second time. 
The introduction of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Heritage Protection Bill 1998 comes after a long process of consideration and review of the current regime for protecting Indigenous heritage areas and objects in this country and will replace the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Heritage Protection Act 1984. While the 1984 Act was intended to be an interim legislation which would operate as a forum for the last resort when the states or territories' processes were inadequate, this aim has not been realised and considerable difficulties have been experienced with the Act as illustrated in the long-running dispute over the proposed Hind Hindmarsh Bridge Bill. Apart from the repeal of the Sunset Clause in 1986 and the insertion of the Part 2A in 1987, which applies only to Victoria, the 1984 Act has not changed in the last 14 years, and reform of this legislation is now long overdue. Indeed, a review commissioned by the previous government was already underway when this government came to office in 1996 with an election pledge to reform the Act. There is common agreement on the need for reform. Indigenous Australians are often in a situation where places that hold particular cultural significance for them are located on land that is either private or state-owned. Sometimes these places are in remote or relatively underdeveloped areas where they are safe from disturbance or no specific protection for them is required. Nor indeed does the location of the significant areas necessarily need to be revealed to anyone. However, there are times when new activities can pose a threat to a particularly significant area. Indigenous people require that when the integrity of such areas is under threat, there is a means available by which they can seek protection for that area. For the parties who are proposing to undertake an activity that may disturb a heritage area or object, it is necessary that any claims for protection are dealt with in a fair, transparent and timely manner. In order to achieve a fair and effective process for Indigenous heritage protection, a number of important changes are being introduced in this bill. In particular, the Commonwealth Heritage Protection Regime will be reformed to address a number of difficulties in the operation of the 1984 Act and clarify the respective roles of the Commonwealth and the States. One of the major problems for the 1984 Act was the requirement that the Minister personally satisfy himself about the significance of the areas or objects of the Indigenous people. And the Bill establishes a Director of Indigenous Heritage Protection, a statutory office holder, who will advise the Minister on heritage protection. In particular, the Director, rather than the Minister, will make assessments of the importance of the area or objects to the Indigenous people. Another, important, another improvement to the operation of the Commonwealth regime arises from our recognition that most heritage protection clauses have more than one solution and that with goodwill and a spirit of compromise on all sides, Problems can often be resolved by the parties sitting down together and negotiating through the details of the case. The Commonwealth will therefore attempt to resolve cases through negotiation and mediation wherever possible. Furthermore, to meet a concern expressed by Indigenous people, all activities undertaken by the Commonwealth under the Bill will be subject to an improved process of protection, protecting culturally sensitive information. A significant objective of the Bill is to strengthen state and territory heritage protection regimes and to reduce the potential for confusion between the roles of the Commonwealth and the state and the territories. State and territory regimes will meet a set of specific minimal standards will be accredited by the Commonwealth. While some state and territory regimes may already come near to meeting the minimum standards, in others the move to accelerate will bring with it a significant improvement in those regimes. Let me now turn to the detail of key aspects of the legislation. Mr Deputy Speaker, the 1984 Act was reviewed by the Honourable Elizabeth Evatt, AC, who reported to the Government in 1996. Her report recommended a number of changes to the current heritage protection regime. One important recommendation was that the role of assessing the significance of an area for which protection was being sought should not be undertaken by the same person or body that would make the final decision about whether protection should be afforded or not. In order to implement this recommendation, the Director of Indigenous Heritage Protection will be the primary administrator of the Act, 
and will undertake a wide range of tasks in support of the Minister, who will be the final decision maker in relation to long-term protection of areas or objects. The bill applies in the same way to both significant Indigenous areas and objects. However, for, simply, for simplicity, I will just refer to areas. The scheme of protection where a state or territory has not achieved accreditation is as follows. If an Indigenous person has unsuccessfully pursued all possible remedies under an unaccredited state or territory regime for protection of a significant area, then that person will be able to apply to the Commonwealth for protection of that area. The Commonwealth may provide emergency protection if the area is under immediate threat and interim protection while the application has been considered. The Minister or the Director of Indigenous Heritage Protection will be able to reject an application that is judged to be frivolous or vexatious. To ensure that all other potential applicants are aware of the application and to preclude related applications once an issue to be resolved, the Director will adversely, advisedly seek further applications as an earlier, sta an earlier stage in the process. Once all applications have been received, the first step the Commonwealth will take is to facilitate negotiation and or medi mediation and try to resolve the situation. Where an agreement is reached, the parties will be able to register the agreement under the new Act. If mediation or negotiation is unsuccessful, the Director will prepare a report for the Minister that includes a finding about whether the area under dispute is significant in accordance with the Indigenous tradition or whether it is under threat. The Director will have at his or her disposal the means to investigate the veracity of the claims, including through the engagement of expert consultants. In addition, the Director will seek submissions from other parties on the likely effects of protecting the area. The findings in the Director's report on significance and threat will be binding on the Minister and will not require the Minister to view any information that is culturally sensitive. Mr Deputy Speaker, this process will rectify a significant flaw in the 1984 Act, namely the need for the Minister to be personally satisfied as to the significance and the threat. These issues will no longer matter be matters for the Minister's determination. Accordingly, any judicial review of the Minister's decision on whether or not to protect an area will not require the Indigenous people to prove the issue of significance in public. If the Minister has grounds to believe that the Director's findings are flawed through an inadequate process having been undertaken or through new information that has subsequently emerged, then the Minister may appoint an independent reviewer to make further findings, which in turn will find by the Minister. In the interest of efficiency, the Minister will be able to delegate many of the operational powers of the Act to the Director, but the Minister will always retain the final decision in relation to making long-term protection orders and the decision to accredit a state or territory regime. The power to issue a seven-day emergency protection order is an unaccredited regime will be able to be delegated to Pacific officers not only the director. This will allow people on the spot to assess a possible emergency situation with the benefit of local knowledge. However, as a check on this delegated power, extension of the seven-day emergency protection will have to be approved by the minister. Consistent with the 1984 Act, the discovery of indigenous human remains is an under, in an unaccredited regime will be required to be reported to the director. Where remains are delivered to the director, he or she will consult with the relevant Indigenous community about their appropriate handling. In order to ensure that any of the processes undertaken under the bill do not require Indigenous people to unnecessarily reveal confidential Indigenous information, such information will be exempted from demands for public release under both the Freedom of Information Act 1982 and the Archives Act 1983. So, Deputy Speaker, Given that states and territories are generally responsible for planning and developing its decisions in relation to land management, we are prepared to accredit state and territory regimes that meet the minimum standards in the bill. The incentive for state and territories to achieve accreditation will come from the Commonwealth absenting itself from involving in state or territory decision making once a state or territory is accredited, except in cases where protection may be in the national interest. Honourable Members should take note that these standards are a minimum and they will not 
in no way prevent states or territories from going further if they wish, or retaining their existing legislation if it is already represents best practice. In recognition of the importance of the decision to accredit state and territories, it will be subject to disallowance by the parliament. In addition, when a accredited state or territory changes its legislation in such a way that it no longer meets the standards, the Commonwealth Minister will consult with that state or territory and may then revoke the accreditation. In order for a state or territory to achieve accreditation, it will need to include a number of features in heritage protection legislation. Firstly, the state or territory will need to provide protection of significant indigenous areas and objects, and that protection must be backed up by adequate penalties. Indigenous people must be recognised as the main source of information about the significance of these areas and objects. Secondly, to ensure that the Indigenous people can speak freely and, if necessary, in confidence under the state and territory legislation, it must be provided protection for confidential Indigenous information and prevent it from being publicly revealed if such revelation wouldn't cause harm or distress. However, while these restrictions are necessary, other parties must still be treated fairly and be given an opportunity to put their views and to be told the reasons for decisions to protect areas or objects. In relation to Indigenous human remains, the minimum standards will require states or territory legislation not only to protect their remains, but where they are significant to Indigenous people, but also to ensure that any remains that are found must be reported to the relevant state minister so that he can deal with it appropriately. Alongside the process of protection of heritage areas and objects, there must be a system whereby other parties can seek approval to undertake the activities in relation to such acts or objects. This will ensure that unnecessary delays or court battles, such as we have seen on the Hindmarsh Island, can be avoided. Therefore, the minimum standards require that a state or territory promote the ne negotiated outcomes between those who want to undertake an activity and the Indigenous people concerned to protect an area. In addition, minimum standards require the provision of a process whereby a developer can seek early approval for a proposed activity. This may include relevant Indigenous people and an appropriate state authority assessing the proposal and determining whether there is any heritage site at risk. Once a state or territory has a legislative system in place reflecting the minimum standards, the Commonwealth Minister will be able to accredit the state or territory regime for the purpose of the Commonwealth Act. Where a state or territory has achieved accreditation, all Indigenous heritage protection will be dealt with by the state or territory. However, in rare cases there may be a need for the Commonwealth to step in where at state level a decision not to protect an area reflects the local interest in the case, but does not recognise the area as one that should be protected in the national interest. Given the significance of such a case, it will be handled by the minister who may facilitate negotiation and require a report to be made by the director. However, these processes will not be mandatory, given that an accredited state or territory regime will already have undertaken thorough assessment of the case. The only requirement on the minister will be that he or she consult the relevant state or territory minister about the case and the consequences of protecting the area in question. Transitional provisions are included in the bill in relation to Part 2A of 1984 Act, which applies only in the state of Victoria. The Victorian Government plans to pass new state Indigenous heritage leg protection legislation and to ensure that that legislation will be able to operate Part 2A will be repealed simultaneously with the enactment of the state legislation. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to say the reforms of the Indigenous Heritage Protection legislation is long overdue. The 1984 Act was introduced as a temporary measure and has presented many difficulties for Indigenous people, other interests and government administration, governments administering the Act. I'm pleased that we've been able to address these problems through the new and comprehensive legislation. The bill will ensure that a fair and transparent process is established for the protection of Indigenous heritage at both the Commonwealth and state levels, and the duplication overlap is diminished and that the nationally significant areas can be protected. Order the 
Minister presents so I present the explanatory memorandum. Order the debate must now be adjourned. The Honourable Member for Melbourne. I move the debate be adjourned, Mr De Order. The question is that the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move motion suspending so much of standing orders and session orders as to prevent me from moving a motion to refer the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Bill 1998 to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Land Fund for consideration and an advisory report by the 22nd of May 1988. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I move that so much of standing and session orders be suspended as to prevent the Minister moving a motion to refer the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders Heritage Protection Bill 1998 to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land Fund for consideration and an advisory report by the 22nd of May 1998. Order the questions of the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Heritage Protection Bill 1998 be referred to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Land Fund for consideration and advisory report by the 22nd of May 1998, and, the and that the terms of this resolution, as far as they are inconsistent with the standing and session orders, have effect notwithstanding anything contained in the standing and session orders and that a message be sent to the Senate acquainting it of this reference to this committee. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. The Speaker has received messages from the Senate returning the following bills without amendment. Child Care Legislation Amendment Bill 1998 and International Monetary Agreements Amendments Bill 1998. Order. The Speaker has received a message from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to the Customs and Excise Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 1998. The Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Telstra, Transition to Full Private Ownership Bill 1998, Presumption of Debate on the Second Reading. The question is this bill be read a second time. I call the Honourable Member for Rich uh, Bund. Richmond. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise tonight to speak on the Telstra Transition to Full Private Ownership Bill 1998. And this is a very important bill, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak on it. And there are three issues I would like to address. Firstly, I want to highlight the considerable benefits to the nation, and particularly to the people of the far north coast of New South Wales, which, der which will derive from further privatisation of Telstra. Secondly, I must respond to some of the outrageous claims made by the Labor Party in its desperate attempt in this debate. And if these claims go unanswered, there is a chance someone outside the ALP may actually believe them. And finally, and most importantly, I would like to discuss what privatisation means for rural and regional Australia generally, and in particular the electorate of Richmond, which I represent. The benefits of privatisation. The partial privatisation was extremely popular, with the float being significantly oversubscribed, and the benefits went well beyond ordinary, allowing ordinary Australians the opportunity to share in our largest company. In particular was the Natural Heritage Trust. Over $1 billion was poured into the Natural Heritage Trust, Australia's largest ever environmental package. And this has been a huge benefit to rural and regional Australia. Community groups and local councils in Richmond put in excellent bids for the Natural Heritage Trust grants and were rewarded accordingly. Natural Heritage funding has flowed into projects all over the electorate of Richmond, in particular the area of Byron, Tweed Valley, also Lennox Head and Wallingbar. Regional Telecommunication Infrastructure Fund has also been a major beneficiary. With the partial, partial privatisation, $250 million in regional telecommunication infrastructure fund networking in the nation has been air tagged. An early beneficiaries in Richmond was the Regional Internet Marketing Cooperative, which aims to market our primary produce directly to our overseas customers with a new internet service. The independent network 
the Nation Board has just announced another 49 projects which are receiving networking the Nation funding, totalling $21 million. In particular, over a quarter of a million dollars has been allocated to two North Coast projects. The Northern Rivers Social Development Council will get 105,000 of its community service and access project, which covers areas from the Tweed down to Almara. And this project will allow the disadvantaged to get online and discover the internet. Likewise, Norlink has been allocated $150,000 for its networking the Northern Rivers project, which also runs from Tweed down to Almara. And this ambitious project aims to develop an integrated regional telecommunication strategy for the Northern Rivers region. So $49 million has now been approved by Networking the Nation. And this obviously means that there's another $200 million remaining over a five-year period, and I'd certainly like to encourage communities in my electorate of Richmond to continue applying for funding. Of course, the remainder of the funds raised by the first sale are being used to repay the national debt, Mr Speaker. $90 billion worth of debt, including the disgraceful $10.5 billion in the last 12 months, which was accumulated by the member of Brand in his last stand. And Mr Speaker, paying off government debt benefits all Australians whether they choose to participate in the float or not. The $8 billion we spend each year servicing Labor's debt, but instead putting it into the benefit of the nation. The full privatisation of Telstra will allow us to move more than half the debt levels of two years ago and still leave over, the, still leave over some money for a new fund, which of course the Prime Minister has labelled called a social bonus. And my view is that this bonus should primarily be directed towards looking after older Australians and those who care. May I remind the House that when the ALP was in government, they ran down capital stock in nursing homes by 75 per cent in their last three years. And by contrast, this government, which was announced yesterday, over $270 million staying at home care and support for older Australian package. Telstra needs to raise money to expand and to compete with the private sector phone companies like Optus, AAPT, Primus, Norgate and others. And that's why taxpayers should not have to bear the burden or risk any of this extra debt in its further capitalisation. But let's look at why Labor can't support privatisation. And Mr Speaker, there are seven reasons why Labor opposes this bill, and all of them, quite frankly, are bogus. The Leader of the Opposition wants to privatise Telstra. He has said as much. You could privatise Telecom if you put your mind to it. He said, meet the press as Treasurer on 5 June 1994. Kim didn't put his mind to it, even for the seven reasons I will reveal. Four of these reasons are public, what they are telling the electorates, and three are reasons which they keep private to themselves. The ALP's overt reasons for opposing privatisation. Let me go through them, Mr Speaker. First of all, Telstra is a monopoly. The first public reason is that we shouldn't tell, sell Telstra because it's a monopoly. What a load of rubbish. It was the current leader of the opposition, as Minister for Bankruptcy, uh, Finance, I beg your pardon, who brought competition into telecommunication industry with Optus and Vodafone. And this government enhanced the competition with the introduction of new players last year. And the results have been spectacular, with international calls falling by up to mu as much as 75 per cent and domestic STD calls falling by almost a commensurate amount. The second argument is the government will lose money on the deal. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's in Australia's financial interest to sell Telstra and not to forego, and that we shouldn't forego the annual dividends from the company. That's the Labor Party line. Well, I can understand their, their thinking because when Labor embarked on their selling spree in the last eight years, they paid all the money from privatisation into day-to-day -day expending. And I should remind the House, it was not just the Commonwealth Bank that the member for Brand promised employees he would never sell. It was the Commonwealth Accommodation and Catering Service the Defence Service House Corporation Loan Portfolio, there was Andal, there was the Australian Defence Force Home Loan Franchise, there was the Commonwealth Housing Loan Assistance Scheme in the ACT, there was of course Australian Airlines and Qantas, there was the Snowy Mountains Engineering Corporation, there was the Commonwealth Serum Laboratory, there was the Murmur to Sydney Pipeline, there were the uranium stockpiles, there was Qantas and there was uh, Aerospace Technology and on and on the list went. By contrast, we do not use the proceeds of privatisation to fund recurrent expenditure. In fact, most of the proceeds from the first part of the Telstra privatisation went back to paying back the family farm, paying back Labor's debt, which alone was costing us $8 billion a year in interest payments. Part two of the Telstra sale will allow us to pay off over 40 per cent 
of the Beasley debt, giving us an immediate massive savings on interest payments. We will be able to reduce ongoing interest payments on the government debt by more than the government receives in the dividends from Telstra, around $1.5 billion. That is, of course, according to Access Economics. Another argument is that the bush would suffer. Labor's uh, against the privatisation is that Telstra would not look after regional Australia in private hands. I am one of 40 coalition members to represent a rural seat, and of course Labor holds three. The ALP has never really cared about regional Australia, and they're not going to start today. In, in many ways, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a shameless scare campaign by a cynical and desperate opposition. Rural and regional Australia suffered from their 13 years, neglect by Labor, and particularly in the areas of telecommunications. But while the coalition government has addressed many of these problems, my constituents naturally still have some concerns, which I will address shortly. Another argument is that um, uh, the public argument that it will all go to foreign interests, that it will be gobbled up by foreign, foreign, foreign shareholders. This is both hip hypocritical and untrue. In Labor's 13 miserable years, net foreign debt rose from $24 billion to $87 billion, a threefold increase. In that 13 years period, interest took over a plethora of Australian icons, including Tui's, Castlemaine, Swan, King G, Brashes, Arnott's, National Mutual, BDR Nilex, Peter's Ice Cream, just to name a few. In the same period, of course, foreign investors also gained large chunks of Qantas, Fairfax and the Tetnet 10 Network, just to name a few. And speaking of foreign interests, under Labor's plan, there would be two publicly owned telecommunications companies in the world which would, be, which would remain in public hands. That would be in the People's Republic of Korea, telecom under, under President Kim Lo Sung, and Australia's Telstra under perhaps President Kim, probably Prime Minister Kim Beasley. As the AOP well knows, there are stringent restrictions on the ownership of Telstra. By law, Telstra will have at least 65 per cent Australian owned. The chairman of the board will have to be an Australian citizen, as well as most of the directors. Telstra's headquarters will have to remain in Australia. Telstra will be exempt from restrictions emerging from the multilateral agreement on investment. That's if we choose to sign it or not, and many people have reservations. And Telstra will remain Australian, and Labor knows that, and of course they hate us to say that. Now let's look at some of the covert reasons for opposing prioritisation. I know the member for Watson will listen to this carefully. More interesting are their private or the real reasons for attempting to block this piece of legislation. First of all, it wasn't, I, wasn't our idea. Uh, and, and the first of these covert reasons that the coalition thought about it first. Mr Speaker, do you remember, of course, the ALP talk fest in Tasmania only a few months ago? Then again, I mean, maybe you don't. Most Australians don't. It's a while ago. Uh, let me remind you that, of course, there were two things that happened. There was, of course, Labor's lady in waiting, which was the Cheryl, uh, well, perhaps now Scarlett Kernow, and, uh, and of course the situation uh, there, and of course there was member, the, uh, uh, the member for Richmond Room resume his seat. Point of order from the member for Watson. You know, I've been intrigued by the member's speech. He's swayed off and on, hasn't said much about uh, the sale of Telstra, which is what this bill before us is. It's the Telstra transition to full private ownership bill, 1998. Now, I'm, I'm, what's, the, what's your point of order? My point of order is, Mr Deputy Speaker, while many of the things he said had nothing to do with the bill, What's what he's, your point what he's of saying order? now has absolutely nothing whatsoever Relevant. to do with the bill, and I draw your attention to that and ask you to bring him back to the matter before the House. Um, it's not a valid point of order. I'm satisfied the member for Richmond is within the context of legislation, uh, but I would well, remind I'll him of his need to... That briefly, they decided to sell, to advocate selling 16.5 per cent of Telstra. Now, of course, at that conference, well, Cheryl did apologise, and uh, of course, in many ways, the, the unions ordered Kim to do a backflip, and that was the end of their proposition of selling Telstra. And of course, uh, also part of that, and one must must one wonder about the member for Holt about relevance deprivation syndrome. In other words, they see their duty as opposing anything the government does, good or bad, rather than presenting themselves as a the government in waiting. Another argument is that perhaps it was too popular. It perhaps it's too popular to sell Telstra. That's the second covert reason because uh, privatisation mark two will probably be just as popular, if not more, than privatisation mark one. And they can't have been too happy when they read in the Australian Stock Exchange Share Ownership Survey released on the 2nd of March 1998. Total share ownership now stands at 40.4 per cent of the Australian adult population. And I might add there is very little variation between metropolitan and regional areas. Metropolitan, 41.1 per cent. 
versus 39.4 per cent in, uh, in regional Australia. And actually, around 1.1 million Australians have now entered the share market for the first time in the last nine months. But it does get worse, Mr Deputy Speaker. 96.2 per cent of the people who actually purchased Telstra shares have kept their holdings intact, have not sold any Telstra because they believe in this company, our company. And they realise that they won't get any of the credit because they are opposed to the initiatives every step of the way. La Labor, Mr Deputy Speaker, ran an ambush privatisation campaign. And who were all the beneficiaries? As I mentioned, all those icons that were sold off. In many ways, they were the previous, member, previous government's mates and, of course, the big end of town. By contrast, it's the mums and dads who benefit from the coalition privatisation of Telstra. Australians now enjoy the second highest share ownership ratio in the world after the United States. Another reason is that the unions won't let us. This perhaps is the most important and perhaps the most embarrassing uh, of the ALP's opposition to this bill that they have been told by their union paymasters that they're not allowed to. And ALP members of this House, in many ways, they do have a high record of, uh, of union bosses who didn't quite make it. And some of those uh, left this House a little bit unceremoniously uh, in question time. The member for Batman is a case in point. He has been rewarded with the shadow ministry in spite of his extraordinary performance as the Pied Piper of the ACTU. In his six years at the helm, and there are some elements of the right wing of the Labor Party which would probably agree with me on this, over 300 workers resigned from their union every day. That's a total of 665,000 Australians. Uh, member for Richmond resume his seat on point of order. But again, raise uh, relevance. This clearly has got absolutely nothing to do with the legislation before the House today, and I'd ask you to call the member to order. Uh, the member is in order, though I do remind him of his need to be relevant to the legislation before us. Two per cent of Telstra employees took up the government's share offer in spite of the opposition. Now let's look at rural Australia. And this is the third and perhaps the most important part of my address. What privatisation means to rural areas and particularly the people I represent on the north coast of New South Wales. My position the position of the people of Richmond is simple. Service to rural Australia must not just be maintained but improved. And let me say again telecommunication services to rural Australia must not just be maintained but improved. However, the issue of untimed local calls and service levels in the bush have nothing to do with the ownership of a particular carrier. Let's look at untimed local calls. Untimed local calls are a legislative right. Indeed, this government has strengthened the law to include data as well as voice for residential cu cu customers. Business customers can also now get untimed local calls. In addition, from the end of this year, 17,000 telephone users in remote Australia who do not have access to untimed local calls will be rebated up to $160 against pastoral call charges, a good initiative. And this interim arrangement, as Telstra does not have the capacity to cope with the anticipated increase in demand with untimed local calls in remote Australia. Let's look at customer service guarantee. Customer service guarantee, which we will introduce, will continue to apply for a fully privatised Telstra. This guarantee ensures customers get the compensation for inadequate service if that's, if that's what happens. The compensation will be paid by the telephone service providers. Under the legislation, this is not only a penalty they will face if they do not, if not up to the task, and the bill gives the Australian Communication Authority power to order charges to, to, the, to a way a provider operates if necessary. Universal service obligation. It was the coalition government which introduced the universal service obligation. Telstra and other carriers will continue to be subject to the USO. This USO is a law which compels Telstra to provide a standard telephone service and pay phones to all Australians, no matter where they live or they work. Let's look at the cost of service. Competition is likely to develop more slowly in some country areas, perhaps to capital cities, but the government has recognised this and established price control mechanisms. What this means is that when prices are forced down by competition in metropolitan areas, they must also decrease in rural areas, regardless of the effect of competition there. Let's look at the area of mobile phones. The previous Labor government decided on an arbitrary phase-out of analogue phones by the 1st of January year 2000. And this government is concerned that regional mobile users, whether they're using Telstra or the other two carriers, will not lose out. The government has introduced a package of measures to ensure that all areas of regional Australia that currently receive mobile coverage will continue to have equivalent coverage. And this certainly was a significant win for the member for Hume, other National Party members and, of course, members in regional Liberal Party seats. And certainly the digital service is not, is not anywhere near as good as it should be as the analogue system, but certainly in, parts of, uh, in, in my electorate of Richmond there is some difficulty, but obviously 
uh, those services will not be diminished until we do have adequate digital coverage. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, bagging Telstra certainly suits the political purposes of the Australian Labor Party and, of course, some of their soulmates in the, in the Democrats. The fact is that Telstra is and will remain a great Australian icon which we can all be proud of. Telstra spent over $1.5 billion on capital telecommunications equipment Australia in the last six months of 1997, and of that $587 million was spent in rural Australia. Mr Deputy Speaker, the benefits of privatisation are obvious, and those benefits go to all Australians, not just the many who participate in the float. And I am, and certainly this government, has provided the guarantees to ensure that areas of regional Australia will be catered for. The government has clearly enhanced consumer protection for telecommunication users over the last two years. However, being better than Labor is not exactly an ambitious benchmark, is it, Mr Deputy Speaker? I want to continually see improvements in telecommunication services for the people that I represent on the North Coast, and I certainly will continue to stand up in this place to ensure that's precisely what the people of Richmond and precisely what the people of Australia get. Thank you. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. I call the honourable member for Watson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, we've just heard another unfortunate sellout of the people of the bush by the National Party. The previous speaker, Mr Anthony, the member for Richmond, and the National Party Deputy Whip. What Mr Anthony and the National Party don't understand is that the people who will suffer the most from the sale of Telstra will be people who live in regional Australia and, more particularly, those people who live in the far reaches of our country. The people who most need telecommunication services will, the one, will be the ones who will be most likely receiving less of them after this company is sold. And what we have seen uh, from the government in recent days is them stepping back again from an election promise that they made to people in the country about telecommunications. The Prime Minister said in the last election campaign that they'd provide internet services to the country. Well, we find out that they'll provide internet services to you in the country if you live less than seven kilometres from a telephone exchange. And uh, a lot of people from the other side might not realise might not realise that there are a lot of people in the bush who live more than seven kilometres from a telephone exchange and, and they don't want to pay the extra money that the, the Telstra will charge you to have this put on in a hurry. And the government is certainly not doing anything to ensure that those people in the far reaches of Australia will have any access to the telecommunications services that would give them parity with people who live in the cities. Now, Mr Speaker, I've got to say it gives me no satisfaction to acknowledge that the opposition's worst fears about the government's real agenda are now being realised. When the government introduced the original Telstra Dissolution of Public Ownership Bill in 1996, almost two years ago, we said that it was the start of a process leading to the full privatisation of Telstra. I said in that debate on the 9th of May 1996, this is just the first shot across the bows. It will be a salami slice job where one third goes now, one third later and one third after that. Well, Mr Speaker, it would seem that the government was even more greedy than we thought then. It's turned out to be far worse than that. The government's now proposing to sell off the remaining two thirds of Telstra in one lot. The reason they've given for that is a response to the 1997 one-third share office, and they say that indicates that the public approves the full privatisation of the company. And they have this bizarre sort of mantra that somehow or other selling a business that all Australians own to a select group of Australians who buy shares is somehow or other making this business more Australian. That if you sell something that they already own, that the people of Australia own the shares in Telstra and all of a sudden to sell it makes it more Australian. And the minister says, what did we do with Qantas and what did we do with the Commonwealth Bank? Well, if the minister doesn't understand the difference in the 1990s 
between a monopoly telephone company and a bank of which there were a number and an airline of which there are even more, then the minister, the, the, the uh, parliamentary secretary at the table, has lost the plot. Because what the Commonwealth Bank does, what the Commonwealth Bank did was provide banking services to some Australians what, who, who, use their, who put their money into that bank. What Qantas does is provide airline services for very fewer Australians, those who choose to fly internally or overseas. But what Telstra does is provide telephone services to 99 per cent of Australians. And there's a big difference, a big, big difference. Qantas doesn't come and land out in your property out in the back of Burke. The Commonwealth Bank, in fact, are taking all their, all their uh, branches out of small, company, or small country towns. So they never were doing those things. But Telstra, they put a telephone on for you if you live out at the back of Burke or up at Quilpie or out on one of the islands off the coast. They provide a service. And if the government doesn't understand that, then the government's missed the plot. And the, and the parliamentary secretary at the table says they'll still do it in the future. And that's the nub of the government's argument. We'll sell this off and they'll still do it in the future. But of course, of course, he might then just go back to the little argument he had a few minutes ago when he told me we privatised the Commonwealth Bank. But I see all these, all these people from the National Party and Liberal members who represent small country towns in here whinging all the time. They've set up an inquiry about the private banks who are closing down branches in country towns. They've got the banking committee looking at that. So private enterprise isn't fulfilling the job that you thought it should do, but all of a sudden you say it doesn't matter. The private banks are closing down. They're closing down branches in the bush, but you can trust the private telephone company to keep looking after the bush. Well, if country voters believe that, they're sillier than I think they are. And that's the truth of it, because the people who are going to have their service reduced are going to be those people who live out of the metropolitan areas of Australia, where it costs thousands of dollars to repair a fault compared to ten or twenty dollars when you can get a serviceman to repair a fault and do twenty in a day in the city, but in the country can sometimes only get to do one every two days because of the distances and the intricacies involved. So the government needs to have a close look and the voters need to have a close look at what the government's up to in this. And particularly the voters outside of the metropolitan area should have a look at what the government is going to do with this great Australian company that is owned currently, the two thirds of its ownership is owned by all Australians, not just some Australians. But the, gov the government, I think, uh, has used some very spurious claims in this. They've said that, as I said earlier, that uh, the argument of the take-up rate from so-called ordinary Australians in shares in Telstra, they say, indicates broad public approval for full privatisation. But I'd say to the government that just because people, including a large number of Telstra employees, availed themselves of the opportunity to acquire shares, many for the first time, is drawing a long bow to say that all Australia, that many, that a majority of Australians are in favour of full privatisation. For example, Telstra employees were offered strong and, in sometimes, you might say, irresistible inducements to invest in the Telstra shares. The situation now is very different, and the, gov and the government does the Australian people a great disservice when it takes for granted for people's views about the provision of telecommunications services. Telstra provides almost all of Australia's telecommunications services. It's the, the largest company in the country and it's an asset that's owned essentially by all Australians and is an essential part of Australia's infrastructure. And it's a universal service obligation that Telstra is required to apply to, to, to provide for those people who live in the furthest reaches and nooks and crannies of our country to provide them with the same basic telephone service as people who live in the main capitals, I think is a very, very important part of Telstra's role. But I believe no matter how the government uh, 
legislates that we'll see some difficulty with that. That universality of service, I think, is one of the most important things that Telstra does. What profit-making organisation is going to be interested in providing potentially unprofitable services in an equitable way throughout Australia? Private companies, like the banks, are about making profits for their shareholders first and foremost. In fact, the law requires them to do that. The government can claim that there will be safeguards, service guarantees, or whatever they like to dress them up as, but we all know how difficult it is once the government has no direct control or responsibility for a function to make that function work in the way that we would like. The government can try to insist on guarantees, but who is going to insist that they work? How is the average person supposed to know all that they will need to know in order to ensure they get the appropriate level of service? Most people aren't experts in telecommunications, nor do they always fully appreciate their rights or how to seek redress when they have justifiable complaints. The government can say it's up to people themselves to find out these things, but it is often difficult, particularly for those who are disadvantaged in some way or otherwise isolated. Guarantees are worthless if customers don't know what they are. And that, of course, brings me back to the dilemma for those who live outside the cities, those who live in the bush, where already services differ from those available in many densely populated areas where the provision of telef telephony services is more extensive. What profit-making company is going to be interested in investing in potential loss-making businesses? It's bad enough that the government's totally selling off Telstra, but it's also going to allow foreign ownership of up to 35 per cent of the company. One of Australia's success stories, Telstra, an organisation which all Australians are familiar with, will no longer be totally Australian. And we saw yesterday how the government allowed Vodafone to become a non-Australian owned property. And we saw how the government a few weeks ago had the Treasurer remove the foreign ownership provisions in Optus's articles of association. So what we, will, what we are seeing here, Mr Deputy Speaker, is an absolute movement away from government own, from Australian ownership of these companies to, pri to foreign ownership. And the member for Richmond talked about buying back the farm. Well, what's being done with this legislation and the, and the regulation changes yesterday was to allow the farm to be sold off. Vodafone and Optus were required by the Labor government when we gave them telecommunications licences. They were required by us to become majority Australian owned by 2003, I think it was, majority Australian owned. Telstra, which is currently totally Australian owned, under this government will now be allowed to be 35 per cent foreign owned. Optus and Vodafone can be 100 per cent foreign owned. What the government's doing is using the government's position with a majority in this House to implement a mad ideological view on telecommunications in this country. And that's all it is, ideology. I'm sure, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government would corporatise the Commonwealth of Australia if they thought they could get away with it. It's all about money, but their views are short-sighted and flawed. For a short-term apparent financial gain to help the government in its election campaign, the government is prepared to destroy an Australian icon, and the Australian people, particularly those in the bush, I fear will suffer the inevitable consequences of this privatisation of the telecommunications industry and will suffer a double loss in the fact that the two private telephone companies will be able to be foreign owned in, in total and over, and, up, and over a third of Telstra will be able to be owned by foreigners. This isn't buying back the farm, this is selling it off to foreign hands. The question is that this bill now be read a second time. I call the honourable member for Herbert. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't think the opposition has any sincerity about this debate whatsoever. And it's interesting that last week, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was reviewing some of the uh, advertising that occurred at the time of the last election, and particularly the television advertising. And wasn't it interesting to see uh, the opposition's commercials uh, indicating that if you elected a hard government, then you could expect timed local calls? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, it just hasn't happened. And it's not going to happen. The, uh, the government has made a guarantee uh, in that relation, 
and uh, the, uh, the fear and the scare campaign from the opposition on what might happen in selling Telstra uh, and certainly won't be substantiated. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was uh, having a look through my records and uh, I had some photographs of uh, polling booths at the last election and there were kilometres of plastic put out by the Labor Party and the message was, keep Telstra Australian. Well, that's what the government's done and that's what the government uh, will continue to do. Uh, Telstra will not be uh, majority owned by foreign ownership. It will have its, uh, an Australian board, a majority Australian board. It will have Australian management. The management will be located in Australia. And uh, I think that we will keep faith with everything that we've said that we would do. We've been honest, we've been direct, we've uh, indicated to the electorate, they've voted, and uh, I think that we have a clear mandate to do uh, what the government has intended that it will, will do. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we seem to have come the full circle with the Labor Party on this debate. Uh, we've come to the full circle in terms of what the former Labor member for Herbert has been saying in relation to the sale of public assets. We've gone from the early 80s rhetoric of Bob Hawke when he was saying that uh, there was no way institutions like Qantas and the Commonwealth Bank uh, would be privatised, the point the parliamentary secretary was making earlier in the debate. In the late 80s, uh, pressure was mounting and Labor began to waver on this issue, except that uh, whenever an election loomed. And by the time Keating finally knocked off Bob Hawke for the top spot, Labor were proudly announcing that the 100 per cent sale of Australian Airlines uh, and Qantas. Now Labor is out of office and in opposition and once again they're opposing the sales of uh, public organisations. In the former mem uh, member for Herbert's case it's, uh, it's like he's forgotten altogether because uh, the Townsville public were treated to this little gem of a quote in the Townsville Bulletin on October the 30th last year. In relation to the sale of Townsville Airport, a sale which incidentally Labor initiated, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the former Labor member said the following, and I quote, I deplore the sale of a publicly owned asset, end of quote. In reality, uh, it really bears repeating, uh, after selling, the government, uh, selling in government over 13 years, the Commonwealth Bank, Qantas, uh, Williamstown Dockyards, Aerospace Technologies of Australia, Garden Island Dockyard, the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories, the Moomba to Sydney Gas Pipeline and the Snowy Mountains Engineering Corporation, Ted Lindsay suddenly gets struck by lightning and says, I deplore the sale of publicly owned asset. And he voted for the lot. He voted for it. Ted Lindsay should enter the springboard uh, diving on uh, uh, or the gym gymnastics after performing a backflip as good as that. The point which needs to be noted is, uh, from this is that Labor will say one thing in opposition and do another in government. And this certainly appears to be the case uh, with Labor's candidate for the seat of Herbert. He'll do anything, say anything and support anyone in order to get back into office. I thought that the Prime Minister's warning yesterday during question time was quite apt, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can be applied just as easily to Ted Lindsay as the Prime Minister applied it to the Leader of the Opposition, and I quote, this is the man that no doubt the new Labor candidate for Dixon had in mind when she said, I think Labor in opposition won't sell Telstra, but I'm more worried about Labor in government. I think that's a pretty uh, a quote that uh, deserves some attention. On the contrary, the coalition has always been upfront and honest about its position uh, and uh, on public assets in a modern economy. And we've always been upfront about where we stand on the sale of Telstra. Unlike the Labor approach to privatisation, the coalition in opposition before March 1996 went to the people and said, if we win office, we'll sell one third of Telstra and, and use the proceeds to fund uh, Australia's greatest ever environmental package. But we also said uh, that uh, if we were going to sell any more, we would, we would go to the people and let the people decide. And that's in fact uh, the purpose of this. Uh, this. That, no, they said they weren't selling the Commonwealth Bank. And Order. what did they do, Mr Order. Parliamentary Secretary? I couldn't help but laugh at the uh, Leader of the Opposition's claim that uh, uh, taking the question of the full sale of Telstra to the Australian people in a national federal election does not constitute adequately consulting the public. I don't know how else you do it. Mr Deputy Speaker, I can think of no better way of involving the Australian people in, uh, in this decision. Contrast this with the Labor way of doing things in the following example. The Hon. John Moore, a great Queenslander and then in opposition, made an interesting po uh, point in question time back in October 1990 when he asked the former Prime Minister Hawke, and I quote, 
No doubt he, Mr Hawke, will recall writing a letter to the Federal Secretary of the Commonwealth Bank Officers Association on the 21st of February this year. And among other things, it said the following, my government is not contemplating the privatisation of the Commonwealth Bank. We oppose not only the proposal put forward by the opposition to sell the bank, but also question the economic and financial rationale on uh, which they base the short-sighted propositions. So that's the Prime Minister uh, of the, uh, uh, the Australian Labor Party Prime Minister saying that we won't be selling the Commonwealth Bank. And of course, we know what happened shortly thereafter. Contrary to the opposition's claims, Mr Deputy Speaker, the government is not engaged in the full sale of Telstra purely for the sake of privatisation. The Liberal Party and the Prime Minister have always been consistent and have always applied standards in the sale of public assets. Just as the Prime Minister said at the Liberal Party National Convention in Brisbane earlier this year in relation to the full sale, good economic policies, sound and prudent fiscal management always return good and useful social bonuses. So he said in opposition on the 24th of November 1987, more than 10 years ago, this is what Howard said, we have always said that we have to run the test of public and consumer benefit over the proposed sale before making an affirmative decision. A very consistent policy. What are the public benefits tests? For a start, taxpayers will directly benefit from the wiping out of 40 per cent of Australia's public debt. Last year, $8,000 million of taxpayers' money went just paying interest on the public debt that the Labor Party ran up in the last 13 years. This is $8,000 million which is not available to spend on things like education, health, aged care, defence and addressing unemployment. Access Economics' uh, Chris Richardson said on this point, if we pay off government debt, then we're saving money forever. And the net balance is in favour of the Telstra sale to the tune of $1,500 million a year. And that's, sa uh, that's the saving in interest versus the loss of income from Telstra. By tackling Australia's debt problem, we free up funds to spend on things that matter, and this directly benefits all Australians. The first one-third sale of Telstra provided over $1,000 million to fund Australia's largest ever environmental protection and restoration projects right throughout Australia. It wasn't pork barrelling. It just so happens that the people of rural and regional Australia voted for the coalition. And I don't think that you can have desalination projects in Melbourne. In Townsville, the Natural Heritage Trust is funding grassroots land care and coast care projects. And I've always said that the environmental awareness needs to begin in our very backyards. With the money being provided through this government's Natural Heritage Trust, this is precisely what we're achieving. If in the full sale of Telstra we can guarantee services and quality of service to regional and rural Australia and at the same time address public debt and generate capital for projects of national significance, then we should. An extra $8,000 million a year targeted at improved health, education and regional development. Are you against that? That's, uh, what, we should be, that's what we should be spending. That's uh, what we'll be able to spend if we don't have to service the debt that you people gave us. But as the coalition government recognised from day to one, we simply can't sell Telstra for the sake of privatisation. Being a representative from a major regional Queensland centre, I recognise that there are genuine and serious concerns with this proposal. The Leader for the Opposition argued that by selling Telstra we're losing a great, if not the greatest, Australian company. I'd be interested in knowing who here in this parliament would argue that the Commonwealth Bank is no longer a great Australian business. I'd be interested in knowing here who'd be willing to uh, argue that Qantas is no longer highly respected uh, as an Australian uh, flagship company. Commonwealth Bank and, and Qantas are both companies which were privatised by the former Labor government, uh, but that did not make them any the less great. Indeed, over the years, they've gone from strength to strength. In a truly de uh, democratic society like uh, Australia, government should not be in business against business. As the Finance Minister noted in the second reading speech of this bill, the business of government is to set the framework within which business operates. It's for government to set the conditions under which companies operate to establish and police safeguards for consumers 
and to place service obligations on those companies. This bill sets out the regulatory safeguards in no uncertain terms. A clear universal service obligation, continued access to unlimited untimed local calls, a customer service guarantee, special benefits for rural and regional customers, a price cap regime, and a flexible regulatory structure designed to stimulate competition in the telecommunications market, one of the fastest growing areas of the Australian economy. If the government has the will and commitment to enforce the regulations and safeguards it lays down, and I believe that it does, then I can find no reason to oppose this bill. I noted the comment from a uh, member for Boothby earlier, Mr uh, Speaker, that communist countries around the world are divesting themselves of state-run or controlled organisations. So why can't the ALP? In reply to the member, I believe, in the lack of other sound evidence, that it has everything to do with the ALP's belief deep down that nobody can do it better than the government. It is a paternalistic feeling they cannot help expressing, and it's showing through a range of policy and other issues. I was initially going to say uh, credit where credit is due, Mr Speaker, in relation to the recent sale of the Townsville Airport, a sale of so -called, a so-called so public asset in Townsville, which has been widely welcomed by the local community. It's also a sale which Labor first initiated. initiated. I was going to congratulate Labor for this the other week at the announcement of the successful tender, but I was reminded of a, comment, uh, of a comment made again by the former member for Herbert, and this goes back to what I was saying in reply to the member for Boothby about the paternalistic nature of Labor. Not only was the former member, Ted Lindsay, quoted as saying he deplored the sale of publicly uh, owned assets, he said this. The government is the only party with the capacity to ensure international services are attracted to Townsville. Townsville Airport once used to be uh, a, uh, a, a caterer for international services in and out of the city uh, when it was government owned. But the very fact it was this government uh, owned meant that it couldn't keep up with when Cairns emerged as a commercial rival. Today Cairns has all the international flights and Townsville, Townsville has none under government ownership. And what's going, to happen, what's going to happen is the new operator who's bought uh, the 99-year lease of that uh, asset has uh, said now that they're going to reintroduce international flights to Townsville. That's what uh, competition and the privatisation can do. Mr Speaker, I have no hesitation in supporting uh, the, uh, the bill before the parliament tonight. And I know that uh, when the next election comes along, I believe the majority of the Australian people will also be in support of the government. It being almost 5.30, I propose the question of the House to now adjourn. The Honourable Member for Grainler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. You would recall that today you acknowledged the presence in the gallery of some 240 student leaders at a conference entitled Student Leadership National Forum on Faith and Values. So I went and had a look this afternoon to see exactly what that Student Leadership National Forum on Faith and Values was all about. And uh, it makes interesting reading, Mr Speaker, because here you have a, uh, an itinerary which has a number of seminar topics over the next few days that's been organised primarily by the federal member for Parramatta and other people across the parties, but particularly dominated by members of the Lions Forum. The names of Abbott, Abetz, Andrews, Bradford, Cadman, Cameron, Chapman, Miles, Slipper, Tambling. They all roll off the tongue. And what is it? What is it that the Lions Forum see as the leadership which should be put in tomorrow's Leaders of Australia? What is it that they're training them in? Well, tonight there's a dinner at this parliament. And tonight in this parliament, this fine democratic institution, the person who will be lecturing Australia's future leaders on faith and values and one would assume on democratic faith and values is none other, other than the on Major General Sidavini Rambuka. And I just think I just think it's a bit hypocritical for the Lions Forum who lecture us about morals and they lecture us about values to bring someone to this parliament, this democratic Order parliament, time. to lecture Australia's future young leaders and to present him as a role model. Because, Mr Speaker, I'm sure that you would agree 
that role models for Australian democracy do not come in the form of people who enter parliaments with guns and gas masks. Because I well recall a few years ago those horrific, those horrific scenes in the Fijian parliament where, where the, after losing a democratic election, General Rambuka staged and led a military coup in 1987. Since, as a result of that coup, there are a number of constituents in my electorate who are refugees of that, that uh, military takeover of that country, who were forced to flee that country due to the oppression which took place, particularly against the Fiji Labor Party, after that coup in 1987. And when you look, when you look at, uh, when you look at the speaker profile that uh, one would assume the member for Parramatta has put out, it says, Prime Minister Rambuka has been an integral part of the most fundamental and political constitutional reform Fiji has ever experienced. Well, that's true. You lose an election, so you come into parliament with a gun. And I just think, I just I think, think the honourable member needs to be careful. I know he's treading on a fine line, but I think you need to be careful in what you're saying. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But I'm sure you would agree. I'm sure you would agree that it is important the role models that we present to for young Australians. And I just think that in terms of the role models that should be presented, particularly in a country which embodies democratic values like we do, it's important who we pick. And I think that I wonder if when the member for Mitchell presents his seminar topic, which is called Leadership Motivation, Case Studies in Overcoming Disappointment. Well, General Ram Booker overcame disappointment of losing an election. He found a very unique way of overcoming that disappointment. And, and I really think, I really think it's inappropriate. I came into this parliament on the 2nd of March 1996 after 13 years of Labor government and there was a majority across the other side. That's democracy. And I think that it's very important, it's very important that we provide appropriate role models for young Australians and in particular important that in this parliament we have a consistent view of democratic values. Democratic values and opposed breaches of them, whether they be of the left or of the, of the extreme left or of the extreme right, is particularly important. And I express my concern, my concern, because I'm sure that the students who have come to this conference have come with goodwill. I certainly wish them all the best and hope that they enjoy the experience that they have here. And I think that it's a very good thing to happen to have students coming here and learning off our processes. But I certainly hope that they learn and go away having a great commitment to democracy and the, the values which Australia holds dear. The Honourable Member for Kingston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, today the Prime Minister announced a package that will provide further assistance to some of Australia's most needy people and to those who assist them. The package announced by the Prime Minister will provide an extra $270 million over four years to assist frail and elderly Australians, people with disabilities and their carers. The package will provide an extra $92 million over four years for community aged care packages to assist around 3,900 more frail and elderly Australians with high levels of dependency to stay in their homes, something we as members are so often told by them that they want. The package will also provide an extra $15 million for continence assistance, an extra $30 million for 15 more carer respite centres, an extra $10 million for additional respite care places for people with dementia an extra $15 million on accommodation services for the adult children with profound disabilities of elderly carers, an extra $91 million for expanded eligibility for the domiciliary nursing care benefit and an extra $13.7 million for aged care assessment. The frail and elderly, those with disabilities and the people who care for them really are some of our most outstanding people. It is often easy to become disheartened by the people you come across in this job who think that the world owes them something, who hate it when someone gets something that they don't and therefore deem it to be wrong. They often fail to see the needs of others and to accept that the best person who can help them is indeed themselves. But the carers and the people they care for are so often the people who restore one's faith in human nature. The carers work tirelessly and selflessly to care for those they love because they have to. One of the aspects of the Prime Minister's announcement today that particularly delights me is the extra money for community aged care packages. In my electorate, a number of organisations receive money from the government to manage these packages for frail and elderly people to assist them stay in their homes. 
One such organisation is the Aged Care and Housing Group, Incorporated, who arranged for me to visit families receiving help from the packages. On one visit, Jolene Thomas took me to meet Dorothy and Dennis of Morfitt Vale, who have been married for 58 years. Their story is a great story of a lifetime of commitment and love. Dorothy is very frail. She has dementia, but after 58 years of living together, Dennis couldn't bear to have her leave him. So the Aged Care and Housing Group Incorporated and a number of other organisations provide assistance to help Dennis ma manage Dorothy's needs. The services, in fact, feel that Dennis and Dorothy have taught them a lot in terms of how to improve their service delivery and how to deal with clients who better than anyone else know just what they need. One of the organisations which also provide help to Dennis and Dorothy and to many other families in Adelaide's southern suburbs is the City of Onkapringa's Respite Service for the Frail and Elderly People and Younger People with Moderate to Severe Disabilities, run by Community Development Support Officer Pauline Smith. Pauline and her staff are tireless workers and advocates for the people they assist, and they have deeply impressed upon me the need for the government to invest further in assisting their families, as we have done today. There are two people in particular that I would like to pay tribute to at this point. Jean Lee Tamblin and Jocelyn Gibson. Not only do they have their hands full with their own children who have disabilities, they provide great support to each other and to other parents in the southern suburbs of Adelaide through their group Parents of the Disabled or PODS. Jean and Jocelyn will never let me forget their situations, and today's announcement is a great tribute to people like them who not only deal with their own situations but who help others deal with theirs. People with disabilities and those who care with them are some of the most fatigued, some of the most forgotten people in Australia. And it's worth noting why it is difficult for them to gain acknowledgement of their needs. The elderly, the frail and the disabled are often disenfranchised because of their difficulties in communicating their needs, <clears throat> and their carers are disenfranchised because they have little time or energy to do anything else to provide care. There are many programs that provide assistance across the health and family services and social security portfolios, and the government has built further on its commitment to frail and elderly Australians, Australians with disabilities and their carers today. Mr Speaker, the government has had a difficult task over the past two years in dealing with the budget deficit. The aim of the, economic, of the government's economic management has been to reduce its deficit and thus the amount of taxpayers' money to going to pay interest bills, to reduce interest rates and inflation, to provide an attractive destination for investment and thus provide employment. And to do this, it has had to reduce its own spending. But in spite of this aim, the government has recognised the need to boost spending on services for the most needy people, the frail and elderly, the disabled and their carers. Mr Speaker, today's announcement will go a long way to fill the gaps in services entitlements for some of Australia's most vulnerable and tired Australians. I'm pleased to be part of a government that recognises their needs, and I am most proud of the people in my area who have helped me understand these needs. The Honourable Member for Barton. Uh, yes, uh, I wonder if members of the government are proud, uh, proud of the government's uh, treatment of ordinary wage and salary earners. This government uh, is to be condemned for its complete incompetence in the industrial relations field. I note that the government is opposing any pay rise in proceedings currently before the Australian Industrial Relations Commission for, anything, uh, for any wage in excess of $451.20 a week. That's uh, uh, poverty level wages or $23,400 per year. Uh, and even for those people, they're only agreeing to a 2 per cent increase when uh, executive salaries over the past 12 months have uh, risen by around about 6 per cent. So that uh, shows the priorities of the government in terms of being against the interests of ordinary wage and salary earners. But even more insidious is uh, what's happening in, on the 1st of July. And what will happen on the 1st of July is the gutting of industrial awards back to 20 core conditions. And we've already seen an example in respect to one hospitality award where the uh, Australian Industrial Relations Commission uh, applied the government's legislation. And I should note from the government's own explanatory memorandum what this is going to mean for job security. Uh, while, the award, uh, while the Act allows redundancy pay to be included, the explanatory memorandum prepared by the minister explicitly states uh, that that paragraph will not operate to allow the inclusion in awards of provisions which will affect the capacity of an employer to determine the number or identity of a person who may be, may be made redundant. Equally, uh, the provisions won't allow uh, the inclusion in awards of procedures that must be followed before notice of termination in, is given. So let's look at how that has been applied in a specific incident, uh, and that is in respect to the hospitality award. The uh, Commission gutted from that award 
these provisions. They've, they've gone. They've been taken out of the award and will no longer be available to workers in that industry from the 1st of July. These provisions won't be available to any worker under an industrial award. Uh, these, these provisions are the employer no longer has a notification uh, obligation to notify and consult about the introduction of change. Gone. No longer a requirement for discussions to take place prior to redundancies. Gone. No longer provisions requiring the employer to notify the C Commonwealth Employment Service in respect of Im impending redundancies. Gone. Uh, the employer is no longer um, um, uh, the employee is no longer protected from receiving notice of termination of his employment or her employment while they're on authorised leave. So the uh, employer, employee can get the bullet uh, while they're at home uh, sick. Um, uh, no longer is, a, is the employer required to provide employees with a statement of employment on termination. Gone. These provisions have been around since 1984. On the 1st of July, for all Australian workers, they've gone out of their awards. Gone, dead, kaput. Provisions, uh, the, the, the uh, provision that termination of employment shall not be harsh, unjust or unreasonable has gone. Overnight, that's been taken out of awards. There's a number of other provisions, uh, uh, a number of other significant provisions that have been taken from uh, um, uh, awards, such as, for instance, uh, um, uh, provisions for the employer to provide items of clothing, tools, equipment, laundering and accommodation, gone. Uh, provisions relating to sexual harassment, gone. Uh, provisions uh, uh, re regarding the provision of a first aid kit, gone. Now, the honourable member, I think, on the other side said, well, they're all up for negotiation. Well, that's all right if you have some industrial strength or might behind you. And those uh, workers who were in unionised establishments might be okay, but the minister, but the member might have a look at the fact that the government has taken out <coughs> section 170 QK from the Act, which enabled the commission to make an order that the parties bargain in good faith. <coughs> so no longer do we have a situation where the outcomes were determined on the basis of reasoned argument. What's going to happen under this government is institutionalised anarchy. And the victor out of this institutionalised anarchy is going to be the one with the economic might or the one with the industrial might. Reason and logic won't prevail, and those workers who are without industrial strength are going to be the ones who, who suffer. Paradoxically, paradoxically, this government has hit non-unionised workers because from the 1st of July their fundamental well, employment security provisions have gone. Member Page. Mr Speaker, I wish to raise an issue this evening about uh, an abattoir in my electorate where are some very serious concerns for the employees and also for creditors in the city of Grafton. In about uh, September last year, the, the abattoir went into uh, an administrator's hands, appointed by the, the company itself, a company called RJ Gilbertson. And the administrator, of course, had to settle the affairs of, of the company, which found that it, it couldn't continue to trade. Uh, apparently, there were, there were debts to the uh, ANZ Bank of some $3.2 million, and there were debts to the employees themselves for entitlements. And might I say some of these entitlements go back 30 years, so people had had entitlements uh, owing to them for 30 years, uh, some $3 million. And creditors around the town, which included many small businesses, uh, some cattle producers, of course, who uh, find it very difficult at the present time, let alone lose their money and agents, of course, who dealt with the cattle producers, some $3 million owing there. Uh, this uh, caused some great consternation in the, in the uh, community, uh, particularly with people who uh, were unaware that there were troubles with the, the abattoir and, of course, had uh, uh, managed their affairs in such a way that they believed that their, their employment would continue. And there were some consternation, of course, when the company said that uh, even though there was a valuation on the abattoir of some $8 million, which would have gone a long way to paying the, the creditors, uh, it seemed as if the, a sale of the abattoir would not realise much more than $3 million, uh, which would only pay out the secured creditor, which was the ANZ Bank. Mr Speaker, I became involved with this because of the concern of the, the workers and the creditors uh, to this company. And I, uh, also had some support from Senator Bill O'Chee, the, the National Party Senator in another place, who has had experience in, in this particular area of, of company law. We found some very interesting uh, 
things had taken place. For instance, uh, on the 27th of June 1997, two cheques were drawn on the company and paid to other companies in the ownership of these particular, these particular people. Uh, cheques which uh, came to something like $5.845 million had been transferred. This in itself seemed uh, quite strange, and I immediately contacted the Australian Securities Commission to see if they would have a close look at the operations of this company and the performance of the directors. And I also uh, got in contact with the administrator to ask some questions about these payments. The administrator, who was uh, S.L. Horn, uh, S. L. Horn uh, of uh, Melbourne, accountants of Melbourne, said that they hadn't, uh, hadn't realised these payments until I draw the, drew them to their attention. Uh, they did speak to me subsequently some weeks later and said that, uh, that the uh, directors acknowledged the fact that there were some concerns here and that there would be some more guarantees forthcoming from the directors of the company. In the last two days I've received a couple of more letters from the, the accounting firm and one that came uh, yesterday uh, I dare say gives me some concern. In fact, what it says, uh, if you read it carefully, is that uh, the guarantee that's being given may be of little value at all to the, to the creditors. The letter from Clark and Company referred uh, to the company's assets, and, may, and they say uh, clearly that they may not yield any funds available for distribution for some two and a half years, and that they are fully encumbered. Moreover, it would appear that, to have escaped Clark and Company's attention that, uh, in the interim, these companies may well incur other liabilities, over which the creditors of the two companies currently under administration will have no priority. The only way in which existing unsecured creditors of the meatworks could possibly be protected from this is if a charge or charges are created in their favour. This has not been offered, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the, the letter from Clark and Company indicates their intention to only call a meeting of creditors in the event that Messrs Ferrier and Hodgson fail to confirm the director's representations, whatever that may mean. I do believe this matter, which is within the discretion of Clark and Company, to be a very serious matter. Uh, the creditors have a right to have all the facts. They have a right to have a meeting. And Messrs Clark and Company have no right to execute a legal document to the preclusion of the opportunity of the creditors to decide the futures of these companies. Mr Speaker, I have been in touch with the Australian Securities Commission. They share the worries that I have about some of the, the actions of the, dire the directors in this company. They believe that the creditors should be given a chance of another meeting, and they believe that the, the creditors should retain their own advisers the Honourable to, to protect them. Expired. The Honourable Member for Scullin. Mr Speaker, one of the most insidious isms that has ever been created must be economic rationalism, especially as it has been practised during the 1990s. Throughout both the private sector and public sector, there have been decisions under the guise of economic rationalism that have dehumanised society at the community level. Take, for example, the wholesale closure of bank branches throughout Australia. The effect of this has been to see, in the last 12 months, uh, a shedding of 10,000 full-time jobs and a further promised cuts of 10 per cent. This comes after the big four had cut 6,300 uh, positions already in 1997. And, the, and figures to show that between 1990 and 1996 the employment in the, of the big four banks reduced by 26 per cent. Also it sees the closure of uh, something like uh, 20 per cent of branches over similar periods. In my own electorate, if you take some of the experiences that are happening, we see the ANZ Bank to close a branch in the suburb of South Morang on May the 15th, a branch that the that ANZ only opened in 1991, South Morang being a developing suburb of the electorate. Although the population is only 2,500 at the moment, it's predicted to be by 2010 a thriving suburb of 23,900. But some of the other suburbs in the western side of the electorate of Skull and Fair, little better. In the Mill Park suburb, with a population of 26,500 and still growing, only two of the big four are, are present. In a suburb like Thomastown, with a population of 22,200, the ANZ is to merge its uh, branch in, in High Street, Thomastown, with its Lawler branch. Uh, the National Bank uh, closed its Thomastown branch and uh, has told people living in uh, the residential areas of uh, Thomastown that they should bank at its business centre in the uh, industrialised areas of that suburb. 
One has to ask what it is that the banks are setting out to achieve. At a time that there are record profits, we see this wholesale reduction of the number of uh, employees that the banks have. We see this in the guise that this is a service industry. Anybody that would visit uh, local branches would know that there are long queues, that when people approach and finally get to do their business, that, they are, that the employees of banks are, are forced to badger customers into uh, considering new products, when all they want to simply do is to go into the bank, do their business and get out. Now, this is a phenomenon that we see right throughout Australia. Right throughout Australia, uh, not only in the, the urban fringe fringes like the electorate of Scullin, but of course in rural, rural areas of Australia. And of course this is, gets a, a lot of coverage in this place and a lot of uh, government members uh, shed crocodile tears about bank closures. But we also consider that, that the basis of these decisions, as I said earlier, is the economic rationalism theory of downsizing and greater efficiency. And what have we seen in the public sector under the Howard government? Downsizing and closures. So if we look at uh, rural Australia, we see the closures of tax offices. If we look throughout Australia, we see the, the closures of Medicare offices, of course predominantly in Labor electorates, but that's another argument. In the electorate of Scullin, there's never been a Medicare office. The, the nearest Medicare office is in the suburb of Reservoir in the seat of Batman. That, of course, closed last month. And now people that want to do business direct face-to-face, -face, particularly uh, people such as the elderly and migrants prefer, to, of course, to do that, they have to go an extra five to ten kilometres to centres like uh, Northland in Preston or to, to Greensboro. Of course, under this government, we see the closure of CES offices. Some continue uh, in the under the label of Employment National, but in my electorate, the CES office in Epping is to be closed on the 1st of May. Didn't get a tender under this new, uh, brave new world of labour market programs. So another public service to be denied uh, the people of, of Scullin. We look at post offices. Presently, the post offices at both Thomastown and Bundura are under investigation because it's claimed that their activity is not enough to make them profitable. So what we see is, the, Mr. Speaker, is this continuing phenomena where people are feeling remote from their communities because the things that they used to think were part of a community, banks, post offices and so on, are being denied them. And where the postmaster and the local branch manager, of course, were, were part of the, the local community, now everything is so remote. And this causes and leads, to, of course, to that dehumanisation of communities where people feel less secure. They feel remote from the processes. They feel uncomfortable that all this is going on and they're helpless to do anything about it. Hopefully at some stage we will see the counter to economic rationalism. We will see that people will want to put back that human factor. We will see that people aren't satisfied just with dealing with machines. They want to be counted as people. They want to be provided services direct face to face. The These Honourable are the things members, that both the public and the private sector need. I call the Honourable Member for Macon, and even though it's a bit late in the day, I wish her a very happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Macon. Thank you for the birthday wishes. I rise tonight to speak on the $270 million staying home, at home care and support for older Australians package, which was announced by the Prime Minister today. Once again, Mr Speaker, the government has shown its commitment and support for older Australians and their right to age with independence, choice and dignity. The government's aim is to ensure that older Australians have a real choice in determining whether they stay at home or choose to enter residential care. This new package has been welcomed across the board and I'm sure that the Australian community will be delighted and in particular I'm delighted on behalf of my constituents in Macon. The government's new package will demonstrate the underlying commitment in respecting the rights of elderly Australians and providing the support they need where they want it and when they want it. The staying at home care and support for older Australians pack includes Mr Speaker, $92 million to more, to more than double the number of people who receive support through community aged care packages. The number of community aged care packages will be expanded by 3,900 over the next four years. Together with the growth of under existing programs, this will be more than double the number of people assisted to 22,000. The packages will also be able to cater for people with more complex care needs, including nursing care. $131 million has been allocated to secure increased eligibility for a carer's allowance and the expansion of the carer respite centres 
and additional respite care places for people with dementia. The, success, the su Successful Care Respite Centres initiative will be expanded from 58 to 73. Funding for aged care assessment will be indexed to growth in the older population to enable people to access care appropriate to their needs. $15 million for the development of alternative accommodation options for ageing carers of an adult with a disability, and about 8,000 people aged 65 years or more currently care for adult children with a profound disability. Many of these have been carer for four, carers for 40 years or more. We will spend an extra $15 million over four years on the accommodation services for this group through the Commonwealth State Disability Agreement. $15 million will be spent to improve information and training about continence management, a major factor leading to entry into residential care. Continence assistance will make it easier for older people to manage at home and avoid unwanted ad admission to residential care. The Prime Minister's announcement has shown that the government is listening, and I have spent a lot of my time here in Canberra, Mr Speaker, discussing these issues both with the Prime Minister, Treasurer and Minister for Family Services on behalf of my constituents. And I'm delighted that the government has undergone extensive consultation processes with the carers and other community groups to ensure support for people who generously provide an important service to the community as carers for the elderly or the disabled. Mr Speaker, the new package will ensure that the aged care sector will be strong and viable. This includes ensuring that staying at home and receiving community care is a real option for those older Australians who choose to do so. Our government is committed to fostering a sense of pride in the achievement of older Australians and recognising their continuing contribution to the community. As Australia's population ages, we need to take up the challenge of making the most of this invaluable resource, our aged. The Honourable Member for Petrie. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yes, the Honourable Member for Banks. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm concerned at uh, the practice that's crept into the House of selective quoting of uh, public documents and public records, and that occurred today in question time when the minister only selectively quoted a selective quote that was used in, on the 29th of May 1997 in terms of something that I said in relation to the stolen generations. The other thing that concerns me, Mr Speaker, is that there might be a, a, a practice that comes into this House where public documents that have been circulated by ministers are marked confidential are, and an intent to selectively quote and use the marking of confidential on a public document that was circulated by the Attorney General in an attempt not to have that document tabled so that it's, that it's uh, not taken in full context. Mr Speaker, I would implore you to look at this practice so that what we don't have is a repeat of today's situation. It is a situation where if this House is to be held in standing, there are certain rules. And, and what is happening here is we are all being brought into disrepute. And I was ashamed also to be sitting in the High Court during the Hindmarsh Island Bridge case, the challenge to that case, to hear the Commonwealth Government's legal representatives say to the court and submit to the court that the Constitution was an inherently racist document and that the 1967 referendum meant that the Constitution, the whole of the Constitution, now has the value system of 1901. I was disturbed and I am pleased that the High Court didn't buy that argument, that there were two judges of the High Court yesterday who ruled that the racist power couldn't be used to the detriment of Aboriginal people. There were two judges who said that it could be used to the positive or negative, but that it was qualified and that it might be an abuse of the power and reserved uh, the definition of what abuse of power was. And there were two judges who didn't comment. So that, fortunately, the government's submission wasn't picked up by any of the judges of the High Court. But I do implore you, Mr Speaker, to look at what happened in question time today and probably come back to the House to improve the standard being so it can't the be repeated. Interrupted. Standard. The Honourable Member for Warringah and Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I uh, really begin by taking the point that the Member for Banks made, that uh, there is far too much cheap point scoring in this House. Uh, if there is one thing which demeans the dignity of the parliament and which destroys our reputation in the eyes of the public, 
it is the eagerness of some of us to rush into the fray, uh, not well armed with the facts. Uh, earlier tonight, uh, uh, the member for Graindler uh, came into this House and declared that the National Student Leadership Forum on Faith and Values currently taking place was some kind of a front for the Lions Forum, uh, a Liberal Party and National Party organisation or, or internal uh, discussion group, uh, which has been uh, uh, demonised far too often. Uh, in this place. Uh, for the information of the member for Graindler, I should point out that there are about 40 parliamentary hosts uh, for the National Student Leadership Forum on Faith and Values. They include Senator Andrew Bartlett of the Democrats, Ms Annette Ellis of the ALP, Mr Joel Fitzgibbon of the ALP, Mr Mark Latham of the ALP, the Hon. Michael Lee of the ALP, Senator Kate Lundy of the ALP, Mr Robert McClelland of the ALP, Mr Darrell Mellum of the ALP, Mr Frank Mossfield of the ALP, Mr Harry Quick of the ALP, Senator Natasha, Natasha Stott Despoyer of the Democrats and Senator John Woodley of the Democrats. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm quite happy to admit that I've been to quite a few Lions Forum meetings, but I've never seen any of them at any of the meetings. And I'm quite happy, Mr Speaker, to point accept— Point of order from the Hon. the member for Grainler. Point of order. My point earlier on tonight, as the member would know, was not, in fact, as John he suggests, not making a point of order. As he suggests to that it was organised by the Lions presumed. Forum, it was on the basis of, of the fact that the Lions Forum dominate the list the of the parliamentary people who have been invited. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I have not known anyone to dominate the member for Werriwa. Uh, not even the Leader for the Opposition can dominate the member for Werriwa. Uh, so I certainly don't think that the member for Werriwa is going to be dominated by any members uh, on, this list, on this list who might also happen to be members of the Lions Forum. In fact, Mr Speaker, uh, this forum is one of those all too rare occasions for members of parliament to come together uh, in a leadership context and to celebrate with other young Australians uh, those things that we have in common rather than the things uh, which divide us. Now, the member for Grandler mentions General Rambuka, and it's true that General Rambuka, and now Prime Minister Rambuka of Fiji, will be the guest of honour and principal speaker at a dinner tonight. The Honourable Member Grandler remains now, silent. Like the member for Grandler, like I dare say all members of this House, I was appalled by the coup that took place in Fiji in 1987. Last night, in fact, a number of members of this House, Liberal, Labor and Independent, had a dinner with General Rambuka. Uh, where these matters were discussed, and it turns out that he was appalled by what happened in 1987. He judged uh, that it was necessary, uh, uh, given the exigencies of the situation in Fiji Granger. at the time. My judgment is that he was wrong. My judgment is that uh, nothing short of the direst civil strife can ever justify uh, the sort of thing that was done. Uh, I judge General Rambuka to have been wrong. I judge what he did. Uh, to be appalling, and I think that what General Rambuga has been trying to do since that time is to bind up the wounds of the nation. And I'm pleased to see that under his uh, sponsorship, a, a non-racial constitution uh, is about to, to be implemented again in Fiji. Uh, but the simple truth is, uh, Mr. Speaker, that there are many speakers uh, who will be gracing the Forum for uh, Student Leadership on Faith and Values. Uh, the purpose of the forum is, and I quote, to inspire young people to a life of leadership based on a commitment to serve others. And that's why I'm delighted uh, that people like the member for Banks, people like the member for Werriwa, will be amongst the many people uh, who, will, who, who will speak to the forum and will share and will share their insights with the youngsters who are attending it. Mr Speaker, uh, the leaders uh, who are talking to the forum include John Howard. John Howard. Now, no doubt the member for Grandler will say, well, there you go. There you go. John Howard addressing this forum. But uh, I've just come uh, from part of that forum and who has been speaking? None other than Kim Beasley himself. None other than Kim Beasley himself. Now, it gives me no pleasure, Mr Speaker, uh, to come into this House uh, and, and and take issue with the member for Graindler on something which really should be a unifying feature of this parliament. Uh, I think it's a, a great thing that so many members of this parliament are prepared to come together and co-sponsor this forum. There I think no that the minister or secretary rising, if the honourable parliamentary secretary wishes, he may continue. I, I'm, I'm concluding, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that uh, the member for Graindler uh, uh, has perhaps. Uh, allowed his exuberance to get the better of him. 
I think that the member for Grindler's understandable desire uh, to, uh, to attack uh, his political enemies uh, has, in this case, uh, uh, caused him to uh, take several steps too far. And I really think, uh, and I say this uh, not in any desire to embarrass the member for Grindler, but I really think uh, uh, he would be doing himself a favour. He would be, uh, I think, honouring uh, his colleagues, his Labor colleagues who are participating in this forum. He would be honouring his fellow members of parliament who are participating in this forum. Uh, he would be paying uh, due respect uh, to the Prime Minister and to the Leader of the Opposition who are participating in this forum if he was to offer some kind of explanation and perhaps even some small apology here for what he said. Um, before I conclude the House, I should just remind the House that uh, General Rambuka is in fact at present an elected uh, Prime Minister of Fiji. The debate having concluded, the House stands adjourned until Monday the 6th of April 1998 at 12.30 pm in accordance with resolution agreed to the setting. Unfortunately, there's no procedure whereby I can now hear you. Not because of that, but because it's only available for ministers after the adjournment. Thank you.